Part One, Chapter One of the Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Epigraph what have we to do with thee thou jesus of nazareth author's preface my most cordial thanks are due to the many persons who helped me to collect in italy the materials for this story i am especially indebted to the officials of the marucciliana library of florence and of the state archives and civic museum of bologna for their courtesy and kindness chapter one arthur sat in the library of the theological seminary at pisa looking through a pile of manuscript sermons it was a hot evening in june and the windows stood wide open with the shutters half closed for coolness the father director canon montanelli paused a moment in his writing to glance lovingly at the black head bent over the papers can't you find it carino never mind i must rewrite the passage possibly it has got torn up and i have kept you all this time for nothing montanelli's voice was rather low but full and resonant with a silvery purity of tone that gave to his speech a peculiar charm it was the voice of a born orator rich in possible modulations when he spoke to arthur its note was always that of a caress no padre i must find it i'm sure you put it here you will never make it the same by rewriting montanelli went on with his work a sleepy cockchafer hummed drowsily outside the window and the long melancholy call of a fruit seller echoed down the street frajola frajola on the healing of the leper here it is arthur came across the room with the velvet tread that always exasperated the good folk at home he was a slender little creature more like an italian in a sixteenth-century portrait than a middle-class english lad of the thirties from the long eyebrows and sensitive mouth to the small hands and feet everything about him was too much chiselled over delicate sitting still he might have been taken for a very pretty girl masquerading in male attire but when he moved his lithe agility suggested a tame panther without the claws is that really it what should i do without you arthur i should always be losing my things no i am not going to write any more now come out into the garden and i will help you with your work what is the bit you couldn't understand they went out into the still shadowy cloister garden the seminary occupied the buildings of an old dominican monastery and two hundred years ago the square courtyard had been stiff and trim and the rosemary and lavender had grown in close-cut bushes between the straight box edgings now the white-robed monks who had tended them were laid away and forgotten but the scented herbs flowered still in the gracious midsummer evening though no man gathered their blossoms for simples any more tufts of wild parsley and columbine filled the cracks between the flagged footways and the well in the middle of the courtyard was given up to ferns and matted stone crop the roses had run wild and their straggling suckers trailed across the paths in the box borders flared great red poppies tall foxgloves drooped above the tangled grasses and the old vine untrained and barren of fruit swayed from the branches of the neglected medlar tree shaking a leafy head with slow and sad persistence in one corner stood a huge summer flowering magnolia a tower of dark foliage splashed here and there with milk-white blossoms 
a rough wooden bench had been placed against the trunk and on this montanelli sat down arthur was studying philosophy at the university and coming to a difficulty with a book had applied to the padre for an explanation of the point montanelli was a universal encyclopedia to him though he had never been a pupil of the seminary i had better go now he said when the passage had been cleared up unless you want me for anything i don't want to work any more but i should like you to stay a bit if you have time oh yes he leaned back against the tree trunk and looked up through the dusky branches at the first faint stars glimmering in a quiet sky the dreamy mystical eyes deep blue under black lashes were an inheritance from his cornish mother and montanelli turned his head away that he might not see them you are looking tired carino he said i can't help it there was a weary sound in arthur's voice and the padre noticed it at once you should not have gone up to college so soon you were tired out with sick nursing and being up at night i ought to have insisted on your taking a thorough rest before you left leghorn oh padre what's the use of that i couldn't stop in that miserable house after mother died julia would have driven me mad julia was his eldest stepbrother's wife and a thorn in his side i should not have wished you to stay with your relatives montanelli answered gently i am sure it would have been the worst possible thing for you but i wish you could have accepted the invitation of your english doctor friend if you had spent a month in his house you would have been more fit to study no padre i shouldn't indeed the warrens are very good and kind but they don't understand and then they are sorry for me i can see it in all their faces and they would try to console me and talk about mother gemma wouldn't of course she always knew what not to say even when we were babies but the others would and it isn't only that what is it then my son arthur pulled off some blossoms from a drooping foxglove stem and crushed them nervously in his hand i can't bear the town he began after a moment's pause there are the shops where she used to buy me toys when i was a little thing and the walk along the shore where i used to take her until she got too ill wherever i go it's the same thing every market girl comes up to me with bunches of flowers as if i wanted them now and there's the churchyard i had to get away it made me sick to see the place he broke off and sat tearing the foxglove bells to pieces the silence was so long and deep that he looked up wondering why the padre did not speak it was growing dark under the branches of the magnolia and everything seemed dim and indistinct but there was light enough to show the ghastly paleness of montanelli's face he was bending his head down his right hand tightly clenched upon the edge of the bench arthur looked away with a sense of awestruck wonder it was as though he had stepped unwittingly on to holy ground my god he thought how small and selfish i am beside him if my trouble were his own he couldn't feel it more presently montanelli raised his head and looked round i won't press you to go back there at all events just now he said in his most caressing tone but you must promise me to take a thorough rest when your vacation begins this summer i think you had better get a holiday right away from the neighborhood of leghorn i can't have you breaking down in health where shall you go when the seminary closes padre i shall have to take the pupils into the hills as usual and see them settled there but by the middle of august the sub-director will be back from his holiday i shall try to get up into the alps for a little change will you come with me i could take you for some long mountain rambles 
and you would like to study the alpine mosses and lichens but perhaps it would be rather dull for you alone with me padre arthur clasped his hands in what julia called his demonstrative foreign way i would give anything on earth to go away with you only i am not sure he stopped you don't think mr burton would allow it he wouldn't like it of course but he could hardly interfere i am eighteen now and can do what i choose after all he's only my stepbrother i don't see that i owe him obedience he was always unkind to mother but if he seriously objects i think you had better not defy his wishes you may find your position at home made much harder if not a bit harder arthur broke in passionately they always did hate me and always will it doesn't matter what i do besides how can james seriously object to my going away with you with my father confessor he is a protestant remember however you had better write to him and we will wait to hear what he thinks but you must not be impatient my son it matters just as much what you do whether people hate you or love you the rebuke was so gently given that arthur hardly colored under it yes i know he answered sighing but it is so difficult i was sorry you could not come to me on tuesday evening montanelli said abruptly introducing a new subject the bishop of arezzo was here and i should have liked you to meet him i had promised one of the students to go to a meeting at his lodgings and they would have been expecting me what sort of meeting arthur seemed embarrassed by the question it it was n not a regular meeting he said with a nervous little stammer a student had come from genoa and he made a speech to us uh, a sort of lecture what did he lecture about arthur hesitated you won't ask me his name padre will you because i promised i will ask you no questions at all and if you have promised secrecy of course you must not tell me but i think you can almost trust me by this time padre of course i can he spoke about us and our duty to the people and to our own selves and about what we might do to help to help whom the contadini and and italy there was a long silence tell me arthur said montanelli turning to him and speaking very gravely how long have you been thinking about this since last winter before your mother's death and did she know of it N no i i didn't care about it then and now you care about it arthur pulled another handful of bells off the foxglove it was this way padre he began with his eyes on the ground when i was preparing for the entrance examination last autumn i got to know a good many of the students you remember well some of them began to talk to me about all these things and lent me books but i didn't care much about it i always wanted to get home quick to mother you see she was quite alone among them all in that dungeon of a house and julia's tongue was enough to kill her then in the winter when she got so ill i forgot all about the students and their books and then you know i left off coming to pisa altogether i should have talked to mother if i had thought of it but it went right out of my head then i found out that she was going to die you know i was almost constantly with her towards the end often i would sit up at the night and Gemma warren would come in the day to let me get to sleep well it was in those long nights i got thinking about the books and about what the students had said and wondering whether they were right and what our lord would have said about it all did you ask him 
montanelli's voice was not quite steady often padre sometimes i have prayed to him to tell me what i must do or to let me die with mother but i couldn't find any answer and you never said a word to me arthur i hoped you could have trusted me padre you know i trust you but there are some things you can't talk about to anyone i it seemed to me that no one could help me not even you or mother i must have my own answer straight from god you see it is for all my life and all my soul montanelli turned away and stared into the dusky gloom of the magnolia branches the twilight was so dim that his figure had a shadowy look like a dark ghost among the darker boughs and then he asked slowly and then she died you know i had been up the last three nights with her he broke off and paused a moment but montanelli did not move all those two days before they buried her arthur went on in a lower voice i couldn't think about anything then after the funeral i was ill you remember i couldn't come to confession yes i remember well in the night i got up and went into mother's room it was all empty there was only the great crucifix in the alcove and i thought perhaps god would help me i knelt down and waited all night and in the morning when i came to my senses padre i can't explain i can't tell you what i saw i hardly know myself but i know that god has answered me and that i dare not disobey him for a moment they sat quite silent in the darkness then montanelli turned and laid his hand on arthur's shoulder my son he said god forbid that i should say he has not spoken to your soul but remember your condition when this thing happened and do not take the fancies of grief or illness for his solemn call and if indeed it has been his will to answer you out of the shadow of death be sure that you put no false construction on his word what is this thing you have it in your heart to do arthur stood up and answered slowly as though repeating a catechism to give up my life to italy to help in freeing her from all this slavery and wretchedness and in driving out the austrians that she may be a free republic with no king but christ arthur think a moment what you are saying you are not even an italian that makes no difference i am myself i have seen this thing and i belong to it there was silence again you spoke just now of what christ would have said montanelli began slowly but arthur interrupted him christ said he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it montanelli leaned his arm against a branch and shaded his eyes with one hand sit down a moment my son he said at last arthur sat down and the padre took both his hands in a strong and steady clasp i cannot argue with you to-night he said this has come upon me so suddenly i had not thought i must have time to think it over later on we will talk more definitely but for just now i want you to remember one thing if you get into trouble over this if you die you will break my heart padre no let me finish what i have to say i told you once that i have no one in the world but you i think you do not fully understand what that means it is difficult when one is so young at your age i should not have understood arthur you are as my as my own son to me do you see you are the light of my eyes and the desire of my heart i would die to keep you from making a false step and ruining your life but there is nothing i can do i don't ask you to make any promises to me 
i only ask you to remember this and to be careful think well before you take an irrevocable step for my sake if not for the sake of your mother in heaven i will think and padre pray for me and for italy he knelt down in silence and in silence montanelli laid his hand on the bent head a moment later arthur rose kissed the hand and went softly away across the dewy grass montanelli sat alone under the magnolia tree looking straight before him into the blackness it is the vengeance of god that has fallen upon me he thought as it fell upon david i that have defiled his sanctuary and taken the body of the lord into polluted hands he has been very patient with me and now it is come for thou didst it secretly but i will do this thing before all israel and before the sun the child that is born unto thee shall surely die end of chapter one part one chapter two of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the gadfly by ethel lillian voynich part one chapter two mr james burton did not at all like the idea of his young stepbrother careering about switzerland with montanelli but positively to forbid a harmless botanizing tour with an early professor of theology would seem to arthur who knew nothing of the reason for the prohibition absurdly tyrannical he would immediately attribute it to religious or racial prejudice and burton's prided themselves on their enlightened tolerance the whole family had been staunch protestants and conservatives ever since burton and sons ship owners of london and leghorn had first set up in business more than a century back but they held that english gentlemen must deal fairly even with papists and when the head of the house finding it dull to remain a widower had married the pretty catholic governess of his younger children the two elder sons james and thomas much as they resented the presence of a stepmother hardly older than themselves had submitted with sulky resignation to the will of providence since the father's death the eldest brother's marriage had further complicated an already difficult position but both brothers had honestly tried to protect gladys as long as she lived from julia's merciless tongue and to do their duty as they understood it by arthur they did not even pretend to like the lad and their generosity towards him showed itself chiefly in providing him with lavish supplies of pocket money and allowing him to go his own way in answer to his letter accordingly arthur received a check to cover his expenses and a cold permission to do as he pleased about his holidays he expended half his spare cash on botanical books and pressing cases and started off with the padre for his first alpine rumble montanelli was in lighter spirits than arthur had seen him in for a long while after the first shock of the conversation in the garden he had gradually recovered his mental balance and now looked upon the case more calmly arthur was very young and inexperienced his decision could hardly be as yet irrevocable surely there was still time to win him back by gentle persuasion and reasoning from the dangerous path upon which he had barely entered they had intended to stay a few days at geneva but at the first sight of the glaring white streets and dusty tourist crammed promenades a little frown appeared on arthur's face montanelli watched him with quiet amusement you don't like it carino i hardly know it is so different from what i expected yes the lake is beautiful and i like the shape of those hills they were standing on the rousseau's island and he pointed to the long severe outlines of the savoy side but the town looks so stiff and tidy somehow so protestant 
It has a self-satisfied air. No, I don't like it. It reminds me of Julia. Montanelli laughed. Poor boy, what a misfortune. Well, we are here for our own amusement, so there is no reason why we should stop. Suppose we take a sail on the lake today and go upon into the mountains tomorrow morning. But, Padre, you wanted to stay here. My dear boy, I have seen all these places a dozen times. My holiday is to see your pleasure. Where would you like to go? If it is really the same to you, I should like to follow the river back to its source. The Rhone? No, the Arve. It runs so fast. Then we will go to Chamonix. They spend the afternoon drifting about in a little sailing boat. The beautiful lake produced far less impression upon Arthur than the grey and muddy Arve. He had grown up beside the Mediterranean and was accustomed to the blue ripples but he had a positive passion for swiftly moving water, and the hurried rushing of the glacier stream delighted him beyond measure. It is so much in earnest, he said. Early on the following morning, they started for Chamonix. Arthur was in very high spirits while driving through the fertile valley country, but when they entered upon the winding road near Cluses and the great jagged hills closed in around them, he became serious and silent. From St. Martin, they walked slowly up the valley, stopping to sleep at wayside chalets or tiny mountain villages, and wandering on again as their fancy directed. Arthur was peculiarly sensitive to the influence of scenery, and the first waterfall that they passed threw him into an ecstasy, which was delightful to see. But as they drew nearer to the snow peaks, he passed out of disruptious mood, into one of dreamy exaltations that Montanelli had not seen before. There seemed to be a kind of mystical relationship between him and the mountains. He would lie for hours motionless in the dark, secret, echoing pine forest, looking out between the straight, tall trunks into the sunlit outer world of the flashing peaks and barren cliffs. Montanelli watched him with a kind of a sad envy. I wish you could show me what you see, Carino, he said one day as he looked up from his book and saw Arthur stretched beside him on the moss in the same attitude as an hour before, gazing out with wide, dilated eyes into the glittering expanse of a blue and white. They had turned aside from the high road to sleep at a quiet village near the falls of Duzaz, and the sun being already low in a cloudless sky, had mounted a point of pine-clad rock to wait for the alpine glow over the dome and needless of the Mont Blanc chain. Arthur raised his head with eyes full of wonder and mystery. What I see, Padre? I see a great white being in a blue void that has no beginning and no end. I see it waiting, age after age, for the coming of the Spirit of God. I see it through a glass darkly. Montanelli sighed. I used to see those things once. Do you never see them now? Never. I shall not see them any more. They are there, I know, but I have not the eyes to see them. I see quite other things. What do you see? I, Carino? I see a blue sky and a snow mountain. That is all. When I look up into the heights, but down there it is different. He pointed to the valley below them. Arthur knelt down and bent over the sheer edge of the precipice. The great pine trees, dusky in the gathering, shades of evening, stood like sentinels along the narrow banks confining the river. Presently the sun, red as a glowing coal, dipped behind a jagged mountain peak, and all the life and light deserted the face of nature. Straightway there came upon the valley, something dark and threatening, sullen, terrible, full of spectral weapons. The perpendicular cliffs of the barren western mountains seemed like the teeth of a monster lurking to snatch a victim and drag him down into the mow of the deep valley, black with its morning forests. The pine trees were rows of knife blades whispering, fall upon us, and in the gathering darkness the torrent roared and howled beating against its rocky prison walls with the frenzy of an everlasting despair. 
padre arthur rose shuddering and drew back from the precipice it is like hell no my son montanelli answered softly it is only like a human soul the souls of them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death the souls of them that pass you day by day in the street arthur shivered looking down into the shadows a dim white mist was hovering among the pine trees clinging faintly about the desperate agony of the torrent like a miserable ghost that has no consolation to give look arthur said suddenly the people that walked in darkness had seen a great light eastwards the snow peaks burn in the afterglow when the red light had faded from the summits montanelli turned and rose arthur with a touch on the shoulder come in carino all the light is gone we shall lose our way in the dark if we stay any longer it is like a corpse arthur said as he turned away from the spectral face of the great snow peak glimmering through the twilight they descended cautiously among the black trees to the chalet where they were to sleep as montanelli entered the room where arthur was waiting for him at the supper table he saw that the lad seemed to have shaken off the ghostly fences of the dark and to have changed into quite another creature oh padre do come and look at this absurd dog it can dance on its hind legs he was as much absorbed in the dog and its accomplishments as he had been in the afterglow the woman of the chalet red face and white apron with sturdy arms akimbo stood by smiling while he put the animals through its tricks one can see there is not much on his mind if he can carry on that way she said in patois to her daughter and what a handsome lad arthur colored like a schoolgirl and the woman seeing that he had understood went away laughing at his confusion at supper he talked of nothing but plans for excursions mountain ascents and botanizing expeditions evidently his dreamy fancies had not interfered with either his spirits or his appetite when montanelli awoke the next morning arthur had disappeared he had started before daybreak for the higher pastures to help gaspard drive up the goats breakfast had not long been on the table however when he came cheering into the room hatless with a tiny peasant girl of three years old pierced on his shoulder and a great bunch of wild flowers in his hand montanelli looked up smiling this was a curious contrast to the grave and silent arthur of pisa or leghorn where have you been you madcap scrambling all over the mountains without any breakfast oh padre it was so jolly the mountains look perfectly glorious at sunrise and the dew is so thick just look he lifted for an inspection a wet and muddy boot we took some bread and cheese with us and got some goat's milk up there on the pasture oh it was nasty but i'm hungry again now and i want something for this little person too annette won't you have some honey he had sat down with the child on his knee and was helping her to put the flowers in order no no montanelli interposed i can't have you catching cold run and change your wet things come to me annette where did you pick her up at the top of the village she belongs to the man we saw yesterday the one that cobbles the commune's boots hasn't she lovely eyes she has got a tortoise in her pocket and she calls it caroline when arthur had changed his wet socks and came down to breakfast he found the child seated on the padre's knee chattering volubly to him about her tortoise which she was holding upside down in a shabby hand that monsieur might admire the ringling legs look monsieur she was saying gravely in her half intelligible patois look at caroline's boots montanelli sat playing with a child stroking her hair admiring her darling tortures and telling her wonderful stories the woman of the chalet coming in to clear the table stared in amazement at the sight of annette turning out the pocket of the grave gentleman in clerical dress god teaches the little ones to know a good man she said annette is always afraid of strangers and see she is not shy with his reverence at all the wonderful thing 
kneel down annette and ask the good monsieur's blessing before he goes it will bring thee luck i didn't know you could play with children that way padre arthur said an hour later as they walked through the sunlit pastures land that child never took her eyes off you all the time do you know i think yes i was only going to say it seems to me almost a pity that the church should forbid priests to marry i cannot quite understand why you see the training of children is such a serious thing and it means so much to them to be surrounded from the very beginning with good influences that i should have thought the holier a man's vocation and the purer his life the more fit he is to be a father i am sure padre if you had not been under a vow if you had married your children would have been the very hush the word was uttered in a hasty whisper that seemed to deepen the ensuing silence padre arthur began again distressed by the other's sombre look do you think there is anything wrong in what i said of course i may be mistaken but i must think as it comes natural to me to think perhaps montanelli answered gently you do not quite realize the meaning of what you just said you will see differently in a few years meanwhile we had better talk about something else it was the first break in the perfect ease and harmony that reigned between them on this ideal holiday from chamonix they went on by the tinoir to martigny where they stopped to rest as the weather was stiflingly hot after dinner they sat on the terrace of the hotel which was sheltered from the sun and commanded a good view of the mountains arthur brought out his specimen box and plunged into an earnest botanical discussion in italian two english artists were sitting on the terrace one sketching the other lazily chatting it did not seem to have occurred to him that the strangers might understand english leave off dopping at the landscape willie he said and draw that glorious italian boy going into ecstasy over those bit of ferns just look at the line of his eyebrows you only need to put a crucifix for the magnifying glass and a roman toga for the jacket and the knuckerbuckers and there's your early christian complete expression and all early christian be hanged i sat beside that youth at dinner he was just as ecstatic over the roast fowl as over those grubby little weeds he's pretty enough that olive colouring is beautiful but he's not half so picturesque as his father his who his father sitting there straight in front of you do you mean to say you have passed him over it's a perfectly magnificent face what you donter headed go to meeting methodist don't you know a catholic priest when you see one a priest by jove so he is yes i forgot vow of chastity and all that sort of thing well then we'll be charitable and suppose the boy's his nephew what idiotic people arthur whispered looking up with dancing eyes still it is kind of them to think me like you i wish i were really your nephew padre what is the matter how white you are montanelli was standing up pressing one hand to his forehead i'm a little giddy he said in a curiously faint dull tone perhaps i was too much in the sun this morning i will go and lie down carino it's nothing but the heat after a fortnight beside the lake of lucerne arthur and montanelli returned to italy by the saint gothard pass they had been fortunate as to weather and had made several very pleasant excursions but the first charm was gone out of their enjoyment montanelli was continually haunted by an easy thought of the more definite talk for which this holiday was to have been the opportunity in the r v valley he had purposely put off all reference to the subject of which they had spoken under the magnolia tree it would be cruel he thought to spoil the first delights of alpine scenery for a nature so artistic as arthur's by associating them with a conversation which must necessarily be painful ever since the day at martigny he had said to himself each morning i'll speak to-day and each evening i'll speak to-morrow and now the holiday was over and he still repeated again and again to-morrow to-morrow 
a chill, indefinable sense of something not quite the same as it had been, of an invisible veil falling between himself and Arthur, kept him silent until on the last evening of their holiday he realized suddenly that he must speak now if he would speak at all. They were stopping for the night at Lugano and were to start for Pisa next morning. He would at least find out how far his darling had been drawn into the fatal quicksand of Italian politics. The rain has stopped, Carino, he said after sunset, and this is the only chance we shall have to see the lake. Come out, I want to have a talk with you. They walked along the water's edge to a quiet spot and sat down on a low stone wall. Close beside them grew a rose bush covered with scarlet hips, one or two belated clusters of creamy blossom still hung from the upper branch, swaying morphingly and heavy with raindrops. On the green surface of the lake, a little boat with white wings, faintly fluttering, rocked in a dewy breeze. It looked as light and frail as a tuft of silverly dandelion seed flung upon the water, high up on mountain Salvatore, the window of some shepherd's hut opened a golden eye the roses hung their heads and dreamed under the still september clouds and the water plashed and murmured softly among the pebbles of the shore this will be my only chance of a quiet talk with you for a long time montanelli began you will go back to your college work and friends and i too shall be very busy this winter I want to understand quite clearly what our position as regards each other is to be. And so if you... He stopped for a moment and then continued more slowly. If you feel that you can still trust me as you used to do, I want you to tell me more definitely than that night in the seminary garden how far you have gone. Arthur looked across the water, listened quietly and said nothing. I want to know if you will tell me. Montanelli went on, whether you have bound yourself by a vow or in any way. There is nothing to tell, dear Padre. I have not bound myself, but I am bound. I don't understand. What is the use of vows? They are not what binds people if you feel in a certain way about a thing that binds you to it. If you don't feel that way, nothing else can bind you. Do you mean, then, that this thing, this feeling, is quite irrevocable? Arthur, have you thought what you are saying? Arthur turned round and looked straight into Montanelli's eyes. Padre, you asked me if I could trust you. Can you not trust me, too? Indeed, if there were anything to tell, I would tell it to you. But there is no use in talking about these things. I have not forgotten what you said to me that night. I shall never forget it. But I must go my way and follow the light that I see. Montanelli picked a rose from the bush, pulled off the petals one by one, and tossed them into the water. You are right, Carino. Yes, we will say no more about these things. It seems there is indeed no help in many words. Well, well, let us go in. End of chapter 2 of the first part. Recording by Sarah Hale. Part One, Chapter Three of the Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Part One, Chapter Three. The autumn and winter passed uneventfully. Arthur was reading hard and had little spare time. He contrived to get a glimpse of Montanelli once or oftener in every week, if only for a few minutes. From time to time he would come in to ask for help with some difficult book. But on these occasions the subject of study was strictly adhered to. Montanelli, feeling rather than observing the slight, impalpable barrier that had come between them, shrank from everything which might seem like an attempt to retain the old close relationship arthur's visits now caused him more distress than pleasure so trying was the constant effort to appear at ease and to behave as if nothing were altered arthur for his part noticed 
hardly understanding it the subtle change in the padre's manner and vaguely feeling that it had some connection with the vexed question of the new ideas avoided all mention of the subject with which his thoughts were constantly filled yet he had never loved montanelli so deeply as now the dim persistent sense of dissatisfaction of spiritual emptiness which he had tried so hard to stifle under a load of theology and ritual had vanished into nothing at the touch of young italy all the unhealthy fancies born of loneliness and sick-room watching had passed away and the doubts against which he used to pray had gone without the need of exorcism with the awakening of a new enthusiasm a clearer fresher religious ideal for it was more in this light than in that of a political development that the students movement had appeared to him had come a sense of rest and completeness of peace on earth and good will towards men and in this mood of solemn and tender exaltation all the world seemed to him full of light he found a new element of something lovable in the persons whom he had most disliked and montanelli who for five years had been his ideal hero was now in his eyes surrounded with an additional halo as a potential prophet of the new faith he listened with passionate eagerness to the padre's sermons trying to find in them some trace of inner kinship with the republican ideal and pored over the gospels rejoicing in the democratic tendencies of christianity at its origin one day in january he called at the seminary to return a book which he had borrowed hearing that the father director was out he went up to montanelli's private study placed the volume on its shelf and was about to leave the room when the title of a book lying on the table caught his eyes it was dante's de monarchia he began to read it and soon became so absorbed that when the door opened and shut he did not hear he was aroused from his preoccupation by montanelli's voice behind him i did not expect you to-day said the padre glancing at the title of the book i was just going to send and ask if you could come to me this evening is it anything important i have an engagement for this evening but i will miss it if no to-morrow will do i want to see you because i am going away on tuesday i have been sent for to rome to rome for long the letter says till after easter it is from the vatican i would have let you know at once but have been very busy settling up things about the seminary and making arrangements for the new director but padre surely you are not giving up the seminary it will have to be so but i shall probably come back to pisa for some time at least but why are you giving it up well it is not yet officially announced but i am offered a bishopric padre where that is the point about which i have to go to rome it is not yet decided whether i am to take a see in the apennines or to remain here as suffragan and is the new director chosen yet father cardi has been nominated and arrives here to-morrow is not that rather sudden yes but the decisions of the vatican are sometimes not communicated till the last moment do you know the new director not personally but he is very highly spoken of monsignor belloni who writes says that he is a man of great erudition the seminary will miss you terribly i don't know about the seminary but i am sure you will miss me carino perhaps almost as much as i shall miss you i shall indeed but i am very glad for all that are you i don't know that i am he sat down at the table with a weary look on his face not the look of a man who is expecting high promotion are you busy this afternoon arthur he said after a moment if not i wish you would stay with me for a while as you can't come to-night i am a little out of sorts i think and i want to see as much of you as possible before leaving yes i can stay a bit i am due at six one of your meetings arthur nodded and montanelli changed the subject hastily i want to speak to you about yourself he said you will need another confessor in my absence when you come back i may go on confessing to you may i not my dear boy how can you ask of course i am speaking only of the three or four months that i shall be away will you go to one of the fathers of santa caterina very well they talked of other matters for a little while then arthur rose i must go padre the students will be waiting for me the haggard look came back to montanelli's face already you had almost charmed away my black mood well good-bye good-bye i will be sure to come to-morrow try to come early so that i may have time to see you alone father cardi will be here 
arthur my dear boy be careful while i am gone don't be led into doing anything rash at least before i come back you cannot think how anxious i feel about leaving you there is no need padre everything is quite quiet it will be a long time yet good-bye Antonelli said abruptly and sat down to his writing the first person upon whom arthur's eyes fell as he entered the room where the students little gatherings were held was his old playmate dr warren's daughter she was sitting in a corner by the window listening with an absorbed and earnest face to what one of the initiators a tall young lombard in a threadbare coat was saying to her during the last few months she had changed and developed greatly and now looked a grown-up young woman though the dense black plates still hung down her back in schoolgirl fashion she was dressed all in black and had thrown a black scarf over her head as the room was cold and draughty at her breast was a spray of cypress the emblem of young italy the initiator was passionately describing to her the misery of the calabrian peasantry and she sat listening silently her chin resting on one hand and her eyes on the ground to arthur she seemed a melancholy vision of liberty mourning for the lost republic julia would have seen in her only an overgrown hoyden with a sallow complexion and irregular nose and an old stuff frock that was too short for her you here jim he said coming up to her when the initiator had been called to the other end of the room jim was a childish corruption of her curious baptismal name jennifer her italian schoolmates called her gemma she raised her head with a start arthur oh i didn't know you belonged here and i had no idea about you jim since when have you you don't understand she interposed quickly i am not a member it is only that i have done one or two little things you see i met binny you know carlo binny yes of course binny was the organizer of the leghorn branch and all young italy knew him well he began talking to me about these things and i asked him to let me go to a student's meeting the other day he wrote to me to florence didn't you know i had been to florence for the christmas holidays i don't often hear from home now ah yes anyhow i went to stay with the wrights the wrights were old schoolfellows of hers who had moved to florence then benny wrote and told me to pass through pisa to-day on my way home so that i could come here ah they're going to begin the lecture was upon the ideal republic and the duty of the young to fit themselves for it the lecturer's comprehension of his subject was somewhat vague but arthur listened with devout admiration his mind at this period was curiously uncritical when he accepted a moral ideal he swallowed it whole without stopping to think whether it was quite digestible when the lecture and the long discussion which followed it were finished and the students began to disperse he went up to jemma who was still sitting in the corner of the room let me walk with you jim where are you staying with marietta your father's old housekeeper yes she lives a good way from here they walked for some time in silence then arthur said suddenly you are seventeen now aren't you i was seventeen in october i always knew you would not grow up like other girls and begin wanting to go to balls and all that sort of thing jim dear i have so often wondered whether you would ever come to be one of us so have i you said you had done things for benny i didn't know you even knew him it wasn't for benny it was for the other one which other one the one that was talking to me to-night bola do you know him well arthur put in with a little touch of jealousy bola was a sore subject with him there had been a rivalry between them about some work which the committee of young italy had finally entrusted to bola declaring arthur too young and inexperienced i know him pretty well and i like him very much he has been staying in leghorn i know he went there in november because of the steamers arthur don't you think your house would be safer than ours for that work nobody would suspect a rich shipping family like yours and you know every one at the docks hush not so loud dear so it was in your house the books from marseilles were hidden only for one day oh perhaps i oughtn't to have told you why not you know i belong to the society gemma dear there is nothing in all the world that would make me so happy as for you to join us you and the padre your padre surely he no he thinks differently but i have sometimes fancied that is 
hoped i don't know but arthur he's a priest what of that there are priests in the society two of them write in the paper and why not it is the mission of the priesthood to lead the world to higher ideals and aims and what else does the society try to do it is after all more a religious and moral question than a political one if people are fit to be free and responsible citizens no one can keep them enslaved gemma knit her brows it seems to me arthur she said that there's a muddle somewhere in your logic a priest teaches religious doctrine i don't see what that has to do with getting rid of the austrians a priest is a teacher of christianity and the greatest of all revolutionists was christ do you know i was talking about priests to father the other day and he said gemma your father is a protestant after a little pause she looked round at him frankly look here we had better leave this subject alone you are always intolerant when you talk about protestants i didn't mean to be intolerant but i think protestants are generally intolerant when they talk about priests i dare say anyhow we have so often quarrelled over the subject that it is not worth while to begin again what do you think of the lecture i liked it very much especially the last part i was glad he spoke so strongly about the need of living the republic not dreaming of it it is as christ said the kingdom of heaven is within you it was just that part that i didn't like he talked so much of the wonderful things we ought to think and feel and be but he never told us practically what we ought to do when the time of crisis comes there will be plenty for us to do but we must be patient these great changes are not made in a day the longer a thing is to take doing the more reason to begin at once you talk about being fit for freedom did you ever know any one so fit for it as your mother wasn't she the most perfectly angelic woman you ever saw and what use was all her goodness she was a slave till the day she died bullied and worried and insulted by your brother james and his wife it would have been much better for her if she had not been so sweet and patient they would never have treated her so that's just the way with italy it's not patience that's wanted it's for somebody to get up and defend themselves jim dear if anger and passion could have saved italy she would have been free long ago it is not hatred that she needs it is love as he said the word a sudden flush went up to his forehead and died out again gemma did not see it she was looking straight before her with knitted brows and set mouth you think i am wrong arthur she said after a pause but i am right and you will grow to see it some day this is the house will you come in no it's late good night dear she was standing on the doorstep clasping her hand in both of his for god and the people slowly and gravely she completed the unfinished motto now and for ever then she pulled away her hand and ran into the house when the door had closed behind her he stooped and picked up the spray of cypress which had fallen from her breast end of chapter three of the first part part one chapter four of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the gadfly by ethel lillian voynich part one chapter four arthur went back to his lodgings feeling as though he had wings he was absolutely cloudlessly happy at the meeting there had been hints of preparations for armed insurrection and now Jamal was a comrade and he loved her they could work together possibly even die together for the republic that was to be the blossoming time of their hope was come and the padre would see it and believe the next morning however he awoke in a soberer mood and remembered that Jamal was going to leghorn and the padre to rome january february march three long months to easter and if Juma should fall under protestant influences at home in arthur's vocabulary protestant stood for palestine no Juma would never learn to flirt and simper and captivate tourists and bald-headed ship owners like the other english girls in leghorn she was made of different stuff but she might be very miserable she was so young so friendless so utterly alone among all those wooden people if only mother had lived 
In the evening he went to the seminary, where he found Montanelli entertaining the new director, looking both tired and bored. And instead of lighting up as usual at the sight of Arthur, the padre's face grew darker. This is the student I spoke to you about, he said, introducing Arthur stiffly. I shall be much obliged if you will allow him to continue using the library. Father Cardi, a benevolent-looking early priest, at once began talking to Arthur about the Sapienza with an ease and familiarity which showed him to be well acquainted with college life. The conversation soon drifted into a discussion of university regulations, a burning question of that day. To Arthur's great delight, the new director spoke strongly against the custom adopted by the university authorities of constantly worrying the students by senseless and vexatious restrictions. I have had a good deal of experience in guiding young people, he said, and I make it a rule never to prohibit anything without a good reason. There are very few young men who will give much trouble if proper consideration and respect for their personality are shown to them. But, of course, the most docile horse will kick if you are always jerking at the rein. Arthur opened his eyes wide. He had not expected to hear the student's calls pleaded by the new director. Montanelli took no part in the discussion. Its subject apparently did not interest him. The expression of his face was so unutterably hopeless and weary that Father Cardri broke off suddenly. I am afraid I have overtired you, Canon. You must forgive my talkativeness. I am hot upon this subject and forget that others may grow weary of it. On the contrary, I was much interested. Montanelli was not given to stereotype politeness, and his tone jarred uncomfortably upon Arthur. When Father Cardi went to his own room, Montanelli turned to Arthur with the intent and brooding look that his face had worn all the evening. Arthur, my dear boy, he began slowly, I have something to tell you. He must have had bad news, flushed through Arthur's mind as he looked anxiously at the haggard face. There was a long pause. How do you like the new director? Montanelli asked suddenly. The question was so unexpected that for a moment Arthur was at a loss how to reply to it. I, I like him very much. I think, at least, no, I'm not quite sure that I do, but it is difficult to say after seeing a person once. Montanelli sat beating his hand gently on the arm of his chair, a habit with him when anxious or perplexed. About this journey to Rome, he began again. If you think there is any, well, if you wish it, Arthur, I will write and say I cannot go. Padre, but the Vatican. The Vatican will find someone else. I can send apologies. But why? I can't understand. Montanelli drew one hand across his forehead. I am anxious about you. Things keep coming into my head. And after all, there is no need for me to go. But the bishopric. Oh, Arthur, what shall it profit me if I gain a bishopric and lose? He broke off. Arthur had never seen him like this before and was greatly troubled. I can't understand, he said. Padre, if you could explain to me more, more definitely what it is you think. I think nothing. I am haunted with a horrible fear. Tell me, is there any special danger? He has heard something, Arthur thought, remembering the whispers of a project revolt, but the secret was not his to tell, and he merely answered, What special danger should there be? Don't question me, answer me. Montanelli's voice was almost harsh in its eagerness. Are you in danger? I don't want to know your secrets. Only tell me that. We are all in God's hands, Padre. Anything may always happen, but I know of no reason why I should not be here alive and safe when you come back. When I come back. Listen, Carino, I will leave it in your hands. You need give me no reason. Only say to me, stay, and I will give up this journey. There will be no injury to anyone, and I shall feel you are safer if I have you beside me. 
This kind of morbid fancifulness was so foreign to Montanelli's character that Arthur looked at him with grave anxiety. Padre, I am sure you are not well. Of course you must go to Rome and try to have a thorough rest and get rid of your sleeplessness and headaches. Very well, Montanelli interrupted as if tired of the subject. I will start by the early coach tomorrow morning. Arthur looked at him, wondering. You had something to tell me? He said. No, no, nothing more. Nothing of any consequence. There was a startled, almost terrified look in his face. A few days after Montanelli's departure, Arthur went to fetch a book from the seminary library and met Father Cardry on the stairs. Ah, Mr. Burton! exclaimed the director. The very person I wanted. Please come in and help me out of a difficulty. He opened the study door, and Arthur followed him into the room with a foolish secret sense of resentment. It seemed hard to see this dear study, the padre's own private sanctum, invaded by a stranger. I'm a terrible bookworm, said the director, and my first act when I got here was to examine the library. It seems very interesting but I don't understand the system by which it is catalogued. The catalogue is imperfect. Many of the best books have been added to the collection lately. Can you spare half an hour to explain the arrangement to me? They went into the library, and Arthur carefully explained the catalogue. When he rose to take his hat, the director interfered, laughing. No, no, I can't have you rushing off in that way. It is Saturday and quite time for you to leave off work till Monday morning. Stop and have supper with me now. I have kept you so late. I am quite alone and shall be glad of company. His manner was so bright and pleasant that Arthur felt at ease with him at once. After some desultory conversation, the director inquired how long he had known Montanelli. For about seven years. He came back from China when I was twelve years old. Ah, yes, it was there that he gained his reputation as a missionary preacher. Have you been his pupil ever since? He began teaching me a year later, about the time when I first confessed to him. Since I have been at the Sapienza, he has still gone on helping me with anything I wanted to study that was not in the regular course. He has been very kind to me. You can hardly imagine how kind. I can well believe it. He is a man whom no one can fail to admire, a most noble and beautiful nature. I have met priests who were out in China with him, and they had no words high enough to praise his energy and courage under all hardships, and his unfailing devotion. You are fortunate to have had in your youth the help and guidance of such a man. I understood from him that you have lost both parents. Yes, my father died when I was a child, and my mother a year ago. Have you brothers and sisters? No, I have stepbrothers, but they were businessmen when I was in the nursery. You must have had a lonely childhood. Perhaps you value Canon Montanelli's kindness the more for that. By the way, have you chosen a confessor for the time of his absence? I thought of going to one of the fathers of St. Catrina, if they have not too many penitents. Will you confess to me? Arthur opened his eyes in wonder. Reverend Father! Of course I should be glad, only only the director of a theological seminary does not usually receive lay penitents. That is quite true, but I know Canon Montanelli takes a great interest in you, and I fancy he is a little anxious on your behalf, just as I should be if I were leaving a favorite pupil, and would like to know you were under the spiritual guidance of his colleague. And to be quite frank with you, my son, I like you and should be glad to give you any help I can. If you put it that way, of course I shall be very grateful for your guidance. Then you will come to me next month? That's right, and run in to see me, my lad, when you have time any evening. Shortly before Easter, Montanelli's appointment to the little sea of Prisigella in the Etruscan Apennines was officially announced. He wrote to Arthur from Rome in a cheerful and tranquil spirit. Evidently his depression was passing over. You must come to see me every vacation, he wrote, and I shall often be coming to Pisa. 
so I hope to see a good deal of you, if not so much as I should wish. Dr. Warren had invited Arthur to spend the Easter holidays with him and his children, instead of in the dreary, red-written old place where Julia now reigned supreme. Enclosed in the letter was a short note, scrawled in Gemma's childish, irregular handwriting, begging him to come if possible. As I want to talk to you about something. Still more encouraging was the whispered communication passing around from student to student in the university. Everyone was to be prepared for great things after Easter. All this had put Arthur into a state of rapturous anticipation, in which the wildest improbabilities hinted at among the students seemed to him natural and likely to be realized within the next two months. He arranged to go home on Thursday in Passion Week, and to spend the first days of the vacation there, that the pleasure of visiting the Warrens and the delight of seeing Jemma might not unfit him for the solemn religious meditation demanded by the church from all her children at this season. He wrote to Jemma, promising to come on Easter Monday, and went up to his bedroom on Wednesday night with a soul at peace. He knelt down before the crucifix. Father Cardry had promised to receive him in the morning, and for this his last confession before the Easter communion, he must prepare himself by long and earnest prayer. Kneeling with clasped hands and bent head, he looked back over the months and reckoned up the miniature sense of impatience, carelessness, hastiness of temper, which had left their faint small spots upon the whiteness of his soul. Beyond these he could find nothing. In this month he had been too happy to sin much. He crossed himself and, rising, began to undress. As he unfastened his shirt, a scrap of paper slipped from it and fluttered to the floor. It was Jemma's letter, which he had worn all day upon his neck. He picked it up, unfolded it, and kissed the dear scribble, then began folding the paper up again, with a dim consciousness of having done something very ridiculous. When he noticed on the back of the sheet a postscript which he had not read before, Be sure and come as soon as possible, it ran. For I want you to meet Paula. He has been staying here and we have read together every day. The hot color went up to Arthur's forehead as he read. Always Bola. What was he doing in Leghorn again? And why should Jemma want to read with him? Had he bewitched her with his smuggling? It had been quite easy to see at the meeting in January that he was in love with her. That was why he had been so earnest over his propaganda. And now he was close to her? reading with her every day? Arthur suddenly threw the letter aside and knelt down again before the crucifix, and this was the soul that was preparing for absolution, for the Easter sacrament, the soul at peace with God and itself and all the world, a soul capable of sordid jealousies and suspicions, of selfish animosities and ungenerous hatred, and against a comrade, he covered his face with both hands in bitter humiliation. Only five minutes ago he had been dreaming of martyrdom, and now he had been guilty of a mean and pity thought like this. When he entered the seminary chapel on Thursday morning, he found Father Cardry alone. After repeating the confiteor, he plunged at once into the subject of his last night's backsliding. My father... I accuse myself of the sins of jealousy and anger, and of unworthy thoughts against one who has done me no wrong. Father Cardi knew quite well with what kind of penitent he had to deal. He only said softly, You have not told me all, my son. Father, the man against whom I have thought an unchristian thought is one whom I am specially bound to love and honor one to whom you are bound by ties of blood by a still closer tie by what tie my son by that of comradeship comradeship in what in a great and holy work a little pause and your anger against this comrade your jealousy of him was called forth by his success in that work being greater than yours I, 
yes partly i envied him his experience his usefulness and then i thought i feared that he would take from me the heart of the girl i love and this girl that you love is she a daughter of the holy church no she is a protestant a heretic arthur clasped his hands in great distress yes a heretic he repeated we were brought up together our mothers were friends and i envied him because i saw that he loves her too and because because my son said father Cardi, speaking after a moment's silence slowly and gravely you have still not told me all there is more than this upon your soul father i he fluttered and broke off again the priest waited silently i envied him because the society the young italy that i belong to yes entrusted him with the work that i had hoped would be given to me that i had thought myself specially adapted for what work the taking in of books political books from the steamers that bring them and finding a hiding place for them in the town and this work was given by the party to your rival to bola and i envied him and he gave you no cause for this feeling you do not accuse him of having neglected the mission entrusted to him no father he has worked bravely and devotedly he is a true patriot and has deserved nothing but love and respect from me father cardi pondered my son if there is within you a new light a dream of some great work to be accomplished for your fellow men a hope that shall lighten the burdens of the weary and oppressed take heed how you deal with the most precious blessing of god all good things are of his giving and of his giving is the new birth if you have found the way of sacrifice the way that leads to peace if you have joined with loving comrades to bring deliverance to them that weep and mourn in secret then see to it that your soul be free from envy and passion and your heart as an altar where the sacred fire burns eternally remember that this is a high and holy thing and that the heart which would receive it must be purified from every selfish thought this vocation is as the vocation of a priest it is not for the love of a woman nor for the moment of a fleeting passion it is for god and the people it is now and forever oh arthur started and clasped his hands he had almost burst out sobbing at the motto father you give us the sanction of the church christ is on our side my son the priest answered solemnly christ drove the money changers out of the temple for his house shall be called a house of prayer and they had made it a den of thieves after a long silence arthur whispered tremulously and italy shall be his temple when they are driven out he stopped and the soft answer came back the earth and the fullness thereof are mine saith the lord End of chapter 4 of the first part Recording by Sarah Hale Part 1, Chapter 5 of The Gadfly This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begeman, Somerville, South Carolina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Boynich. Part 1, Chapter 5. That afternoon, Arthur felt the need of a long walk. He entrusted his luggage to a fellow student and went to Leghorn on foot. The day was damp and cloudy, but not cold and the low level country seemed to him fairer than he had ever known it to look before he had a sense of delight in the soft elasticity of the wet grass under his feet and in the shy wandering eyes of the wild spring flowers by the roadside 
in a thorn acacia bush at the edge of a little strip of wood a bird was building a nest and flew up as he passed with a startled cry and a quick fluttering of brown wings he tried to keep his mind fixed upon the devout meditations proper to the eve of good friday but thoughts of montanelli and gemma got so much in the way of this devotional exercise that at last he gave up the attempt and allowed his fancy to drift away to the wonders and glories of the coming insurrection and to the part in it that he had allotted to his two idols the padre was to be the leader the apostle the prophet before whose sacred wrath the powers of darkness were to flee and at whose feet the young defenders of liberty were to learn afresh the old doctrines the old truths in their new and unimagined significance and gemma oh gemma would fight at the barricades she was made of the clay from which heroines are moulded she would be the perfect comrade the maiden undefiled and unafraid of whom so many poets have dreamed she would stand beside him shoulder to shoulder rejoicing under the winged death storm and they would die together perhaps in the moment of victory without doubt there would be a victory of his love he would tell her nothing he would say no word that might disturb her peace or spoil her tranquil sense of comradeship she was to him a holy thing a spotless victim to be laid upon the altar as a burnt offering for the deliverance of the people and who was he that he should enter into the white sanctuary of a soul that knew no other love than god and italy god and italy then came a sudden drop from the clouds as he entered the great dreary house in the street of palaces and julia's butler immaculate calm and politely disapproving as ever confronted him upon the stairs good evening gibbons are my brothers in mr thomas is in sir and mrs burton they are in the drawing-room arthur went in with a dull sense of oppression what a dismal house it was the flood of life seemed to roll past and leave it always just above high water mark nothing in it ever changed neither the people nor the family portraits nor the heavy furniture and ugly plate nor the vulgar ostentation of riches nor the lifeless aspect of everything even the flowers on the brass stands looked like painted metal flowers that had never known the stirring of young sap within them in the warm spring days julia dressed for dinner and waiting for visitors in the drawing-room which was to her the centre of existence might have sat for a fashion plate just as she was with her wooden smile and flaxen ringlets and the lap-dog on her knee how do you do arthur she said stiffly giving him the tips of her fingers for a moment and then transferring them to the more congenial contact of the lap-dog's silken coat i hope you are quite well and have made satisfactory progress at college arthur murmured the first commonplace that he could think of at the moment and relapsed into uncomfortable silence the arrival of james in his most pompous mood and accompanied by a stiff elderly shipping agent did not improve matters and when gibbons announced that dinner was served arthur rose with a little sigh of relief i won't come to dinner julia if you'll excuse me i will go to my room you're overdoing the fasting my boy said thomas i am sure you'll make yourself ill oh no good night in the corridor arthur met the under housemaid and asked her to knock at his door at six in the morning the signorina is going to church yes good night teresa he went into his room it had belonged to his mother and the alcove opposite the window had been fitted up during her long illness as an oratory a great crucifix on a black pedestal occupied the middle of the altar and before it hung a little roman lamp 
this was the room where she had died her portrait was on the wall beside the bed and on the table stood a china bowl which had been hers filled with a great bunch of her favorite violets it was just a year since her death and the italian servants had not forgotten her he took out of his portmanteau a framed picture carefully wrapped up it was a crayon portrait of montanelli which had come from rome only a few days before he was unwrapping this precious treasure when julia's page brought in a supper tray on which the old italian cook who had served gladys before the harsh new mistress came had placed such little delicacies as she considered her dear signorino might permit himself to eat without infringing the rules of the church arthur refused everything but a piece of bread and the page a nephew of gibbons lately arrived from england grinned significantly as he carried out the tray he had already joined the protestant camp in the servants hall arthur went into the alcove and knelt down before the crucifix trying to compose his mind to the proper attitude for prayer and meditation but this he found difficult to accomplish he had as thomas said rather overdone the lenten privations and they had gone to his head like strong wine little quivers of excitement went down his back and the crucifix swam in a misty cloud before his eyes it was only after a long litany mechanically repeated that he succeeded in recalling his wandering imagination to the mystery of the atonement at last sheer physical weariness conquered the feverish agitation of his nerves and he lay down to sleep in a calm and peaceful mood free from all unquiet or disturbing thoughts he was fast asleep when a sharp impatient knock came at his door ah teresa he thought turning over lazily the knock was repeated and he awoke with a violent start signorino signorino cried a man's voice in italian get up for the love of god arthur jumped out of bed what is the matter who is it it's i gian battista get up quick for our lady's sake arthur hurriedly dressed and opened the door as he stared in perplexity at the coachman's pale terrified face the sound of tramping feet and the clanking metal came along the corridor and he suddenly realized the truth for me he asked coolly for you oh signorino make haste what have you to hide i can put i have nothing to hide do my brothers know the first uniform appeared at the turn of the passage the signor has been called all the house is awake alas what a misfortune what a terrible misfortune and on good friday holy saints have pity gian battista burst into tears arthur moved a few steps forward and waited for the gendarme who came clattering along followed by a shivering crowd of servants in various impromptu costumes as the soldiers surrounded arthur the master and mistress of the house brought up the rear of this strange procession he in dressing-gown and slippers she in a long peignoir with her hair in curl-papers there is sure another flood toward and these couples are coming to the ark here comes a pair of very strange beasts the quotation flashed across arthur's mind as he looked at the grotesque figures he checked a laugh with a sense of its jarring incongruity this was a time for worthier thoughts ave maria regina celli he whispered and turned his eyes away that the bobbing of julia's curl papers might not again tempt him to levity kindly explain to me said mr burton approaching the officer of gendarmerie what is the meaning of this violent intrusion into a private house i warn you that unless you are prepared to furnish me with a satisfactory explanation i shall feel bound to complain to the english ambassador i presume 
replied the officer stiffly that you will recognize this as a sufficient explanation the english ambassador certainly will he pulled out a warrant for the arrest of arthur burton student of philosophy and handing it to james added coldly if you wish for any further explanation you had better apply in person to the chief of police julia snatched the paper from her husband glanced over it and flew at arthur like nothing else in the world but a fashionable lady in a rage so it's you that have disgraced the family she screamed setting all the rabble in the town gaping and staring as if things were a show so you have turned jailbird now with all your piety it's what we might have expected from that popish woman's child you must not speak to a prisoner in a foreign language madame the officer interrupted but his remonstrance was hardly audible under the torrent of julia's vociferous english just what we might have expected fasting and prayer and saintly meditation and this is what was underneath it all i thought that that would be the end of it dr warren had once compared julia to a salad into which the cook had upset the vinegar cruet the sound of her thin hard voice set arthur's teeth on edge and the simile suddenly popped up in his memory there's no use in this kind of talk he said you need not be afraid of any unpleasantness every one will understand that you are all quite innocent i suppose gentlemen you want to search my things i have nothing to hide while the gendarme ransacked the room reading his letters examining his college papers and turning out drawers and boxes he sat waiting on the edge of the bed a little flushed with excitement but in no way distressed the search did not disquiet him he had always burned letters which could possibly compromise any one and beyond a few manuscript verses half revolutionary half mystical and two or three numbers of young italy the gendarme found nothing to repay them for their trouble julia after a long resistance yielded to the entreaties of her brother-in-law and went back to bed sweeping past arthur with magnificent disdain james meekly following when they had left the room thomas who all this while had been tramping up and down trying to look indifferent approached the officer and asked permission to speak to the prisoner receiving a nod in answer he went up to arthur and muttered in a rather husky voice i say this is an infernally awkward business i'm very sorry about it arthur looked up with a face as serene as a summer morning you have always been good to me he said there's nothing to be sorry about i shall be safe enough look here arthur thomas gave his mustache a hard pull and plunged head first into the awkward question is all this anything to do with money because if it is i with money why no what could it have to do then it's some political tomfoolery i thought so well don't you get down in the mouth and never mind all the stuff julia talks it's only her spiteful tongue and if you want help cash or anything let me know will you arthur held out his hand in silence and thomas left the room with a carefully made-up expression of unconcern that rendered his face more stolid than ever the gendarmes meanwhile had finished their search and the officer in charge requested arthur to put on his outdoor clothes he obeyed at once and turned to leave the room then stopped with sudden hesitation it seemed hard to take leave of his mother's oratory in the presence of these officials have you any objection to leaving the room for a moment he asked you see that i cannot escape and that there is nothing to conceal i am sorry but it is forbidden to leave a prisoner alone very well it doesn't matter 
he went into the alcove and kneeling down kissed the feet and pedestal of the crucifix whispering softly lord keep me faithful unto death when he rose the officer was standing by the table examining montanelli's portrait is this a relative of yours he asked no it is my confessor the new bishop of brisighella on the staircase the italian servants were waiting anxious and sorrowful they all loved arthur for his own sake and his mother's and crowded around him kissing his hands and dress with passionate grief gian battista stood by the tears dripping down his gray mustache none of the burtons came out to take leave of him their coldness accentuated the tenderness and sympathy of the servants and arthur was near to breaking down as he pressed the hands held out to him good-bye gian battista kiss the little ones for me good-bye teresa pray for me all of you and god keep you good-bye good-bye he ran hastily downstairs to the front door a moment later only a little group of silent men and sobbing women stood on the doorstep watching the carriage as it drove away end of chapter five Part One, Chapter Six of The Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Part One, Chapter Six arthur was taken to the huge medieval fortress at the harbor's mouth he found prison life fairly endurable his cell was unpleasantly damp and dark but he had been brought up in a palace in the via bora and neither close air rats nor foul smells were novelties to him the food also was both bad and insufficient but james soon obtained permission to send him all the necessities of life from home he was kept in solitary confinement and though the vigilance of the warders was less strict than he had expected he failed to obtain any explanation of the cause of his arrest nevertheless the tranquil frame of mind in which he had entered the fortress did not change not being allowed books he spent his time in prayer and devout meditation and waited without impatience or anxiety for the further course of events one day a soldier unlocked the door of his cell and called to him this way please after two or three questions to which he got no answer but talking is forbidden arthur resigned himself to the inevitable and followed the soldier through a labyrinth of courtyards corridors and stairs all more or less musty smelling into a large light room in which three persons in military uniform sat at a long table covered with green baize and littered with papers chatting in a languid desultory way they put on a stiff business air as he came in and the oldest of them a foppish-looking man with gray whiskers and a colonel's uniform pointed to a chair on the other side of the table and began the preliminary interrogation arthur had expected to be threatened abused and sworn at and had prepared himself to answer with dignity and patience but he was pleasantly disappointed the colonel was stiff cold and formal but perfectly courteous the usual questions as to his name age nationality and social position were put and answered and the replies written down in monotonous succession he was beginning to feel bored and impatient when the colonel asked and now mr burton what do you know about young italy 
i know that it is a society which publishes a newspaper in marseilles and circulates it in italy with the object of inducing people to revolt and drive the austrian army out of the country you have read this paper i think yes i am interested in the subject when you read it you realized that you were committing an illegal action certainly where did you get the copies which were found in your room that i cannot tell you mr burton you must not say i cannot tell here you are bound to answer my questions i will not then if you object to cannot you will regret it if you permit yourself to use such expressions remarked the colonel as arthur made no reply he went on i may as well tell you that evidence has come into our hands proving your connection with this society to be much more intimate than is implied by the mere reading of forbidden literature it will be to your advantage to confess frankly in any case the truth will be sure to come out and you will find it useless to screen yourself behind evasion and denials i have no reason to screen myself what is it you want to know firstly how did you a foreigner come to be implicated in matters of this kind i thought about the subject and read everything i could get hold of and formed my own conclusions who persuaded you to join this society no one i wish to join it you are shilly-shallying with me said the colonel sharply his patience was evidently beginning to give out no one can join a society by himself to whom did you communicate your wish to join it silence will you have the kindness to answer me not when you ask questions of that kind arthur spoke sullenly a curious nervous irritability was taking possession of him he knew by this time that many arrests had been made in both leghorn and pisa and though still ignorant of the extent of the calamity he had already heard enough to put him into a fever of anxiety for the safety of jamma and his other friends the studied politeness of the officers the dull game of fencing and parrying of insidious questions and evasive answers worried and annoyed him and the clumsy tramping backward and forward of the sentinel outside the door jarred detestably upon his ear oh by the by when did you last meet giovanni balla asked the colonel after a little more bandying of words just before you left pisa was it i know no one of that name what giovanni bola surely you know him a tall young fellow closely shaven why he is one of your fellow students there are many students in the university whom i don't know oh but you must know bola surely look this is his handwriting you see he knows you well enough the colonel carelessly handed him a paper headed protocol and signed giovanni bola glancing down it arthur came upon his own name he looked up in surprise am i to read it yes you may as well it concerns you he began to read while the officers sat silently watching his face the document appeared to consist of depositions in answer to a long string of questions evidently bola too must have been arrested the first depositions were of the usual stereotyped character then followed a short account of bola's connection with the society of the dissemination of prohibited literature in leghorn and of the students meetings next came among those who joined us was a young englishman arthur burton who belongs to one of the rich ship-owning families the blood rushed into arthur's face bola had betrayed him bola who had taken upon himself the solemn duties of an initiator bola who had converted gemma who was in love with her he laid down the paper and stared at the floor i hope that little document has refreshed your memory hinted the colonel politely 
arthur shook his head i know no one of that name he repeated in a dull hard voice there must be some mistake mistake oh nonsense come mr burton chivalry and quixotism are very fine things in their way but there's no use in overdoing them it's an error all you young people fall into at first come think what good is it for you to compromise yourself and spoil your prospects in life over a simple formality about a man that has betrayed you you see yourself he wasn't so particular as to what he said about you a faint shade of something like mockery had crept into the colonel's voice arthur looked up with a start a sudden light flashed upon his mind it's a lie he cried out it's a forgery i can see it in your face you cowardly you've got some prisoner there you want to compromise or a trap you want to drag me into you are a forger and a liar and a scoundrel silence shouted the colonel starting up in a rage his two colleagues were already on their feet captain tomasi he went on turning to one of them ring for the guard if you please and have this young gentleman put in the punishment cell for a few days he wants a lesson i see to bring him to reason the punishment cell was a dark damp filthy hole underground instead of bringing arthur to reason it thoroughly exasperated him his luxurious home had rendered him daintily fastidious about personal cleanliness and the first effect of the slimy vermin-covered walls the floor heaped with accumulations of filth and garbage the fearful stench of fungi and sewage and rotting wood was strong enough to have satisfied the offended officer when he was pushed in and the door locked behind him he took three cautious steps forward with outstretched hands shuddering with disgust as his fingers came into contact with the slippery wall and groped in the dense blackness for some spot less filthy than the rest in which to sit down the long day passed in unbroken blackness and silence and the night brought no change in the utter void and absence of all external impressions he gradually lost the consciousness of time and when on the following morning a key was turned in the door lock and the frightened rats scurried past him squeaking he started up in a sudden panic his heart throbbing furiously and a roaring noise in his ears as though he had been shut away from light and sound for months instead of hours the door opened letting in a feeble lantern gleam a flood of blinding light it seemed to him and the head warder entered carrying a piece of bread and a mug of water arthur made a step forward he was quite convinced that the man had come to let him out before he had time to speak the warder put the bread and mug into his hands turned round and went away without a word locking the door again arthur stamped his foot upon the ground for the first time in his life he was savagely angry but as the hours went by the consciousness of time and place gradually slipped further and further away the blackness seemed an illimitable thing with no beginning and no end and life had as it were stopped for him on the evening of the third day when the door was opened and the head warder appeared on the threshold with a soldier he looked up dazed and bewildered shading his eyes from the unaccustomed light and vaguely wondering how many hours or weeks he had been in this grave this way please said the cool business voice of the warder arthur rose and moved forward mechanically with a strange unsteadiness swaying and stumbling like a drunkard he resented the warder's attempt to help him up the steep narrow steps leading to the courtyard but as he reached the highest step a sudden giddiness came over him 
so that he staggered and would have fallen backwards had the warder not caught him by the shoulder there he'll be all right now said a cheerful voice they most of them go off this way coming out into the air arthur struggled desperately for breath as another handful of water was dashed into his face the blackness seemed to fall away from him in pieces with a rushing noise then he woke suddenly into full consciousness and pushing aside the warder's arm walked along the corridor and up the stairs almost steadily they stopped for a moment in front of a door then it opened and before he realized where they were taking him he was in the brightly lighted interrogation room staring in confused wonder at the table and the papers and the officers sitting in their accustomed places ah it's mr burton said the colonel i hope we shall be able to talk more comfortably now well and how do you like the dark cell not quite so luxurious as your brother's drawing-room is it eh arthur raised his eyes to the colonel's smiling face he was seized by a frantic desire to spring at the throat of this gray-whiskered fop and tear it with his teeth probably something of this kind was visible in his face for the colonel added immediately in a quite different tone sit down mr burton and drink some water you are excited arthur pushed aside the glass of water held out to him and leaning his arms on the table rested his forehead on one hand and tried to collect his thoughts the colonel sat watching him keenly noting with experienced eyes the unsteady hands and lips the hair dripping with water the dim gaze that told of physical prostration and disordered nerves now mr burton he said after a few minutes we will start at the point where we left off and as there has been a certain amount of unpleasantness between us i may as well begin by saying that i for my part have no desire to be anything but indulgent with you if you will behave properly and reasonably i assure you that we shall not treat you with any unnecessary harshness what do you want me to do arthur spoke in a hard sullen voice quite different from his natural tone i only want you to tell us frankly in a straightforward and honourable manner what you know of this society and its adherents first of all how long have you known bola i never met him in my life i know nothing whatever about him really well we will return to that subject presently i think you know a young man named carlo bini i never heard of such a person that is very extraordinary what about francesco neri i never heard the name but here is a letter in your handwriting addressed to him look arthur glanced carelessly at the letter and laid it aside do you recognize that letter no you deny that it is in your writing i deny nothing i have no recollection of it perhaps you remember this one a second letter was handed to him and he saw that it was one which he had written in the autumn to a fellow student no nor the person to whom it is addressed nor the person your memory is singularly short it is a defect from which i have always suffered indeed and i heard the other day from a university professor that you are considered by no means deficient rather clever in fact you probably judge of cleverness by the police spy standard university professors use words in a different sense the note of rising irritation was plainly audible in arthur's voice he was physically exhausted with hunger foul air and want of sleep every bone in his body seemed to ache separately and the colonel's voice grated on his exasperated nerves setting his teeth on edge like the squeak of a slate pencil mr burton said the colonel leaning back in his chair and speaking gravely you are again forgetting yourself and i warn you once more that this kind of talk will do you no good 
surely you have had enough of the dark cell not to want any more just for the present i tell you plainly that i shall use strong measures with you if you persist in repulsing gentle ones mind i have proof positive proof that some of these young men have been engaged in smuggling prohibited literature into this port and that you have been in communication with them now are you going to tell me without compulsion what you know about this affair arthur bent his head lower a blind senseless wild beast fury was beginning to stir within him like a live thing the possibility of losing command over himself was more appalling to him than any threats for the first time he began to realize what latent potentialities may lie hidden beneath the culture of any gentleman and the piety of any christian and the terror of himself was strong upon him i am waiting for your answer said the colonel i have no answer to give you positively refuse to answer i will tell you nothing at all then i simply order you back into the punishment cell and keep you there till you change your mind if there is much more trouble with you i shall put you in irons arthur looked up trembling from head to foot you will do as you please he said slowly and whether the english ambassador will stand your playing tricks of that kind with a british subject who has not been convicted of any crime is for him to decide at last arthur was conducted back to his own cell where he flung himself down upon the bed and slept till the next morning he was not put in irons and saw no more of the dreaded dark cell but the feud between him and the colonel grew more inveterate with every interrogation it was quite useless for arthur to pray in his cell for grace to conquer his evil passions or to meditate half the night long upon the patience and meekness of christ no sooner was he brought again into the long bare room with its baize covered table and confronted with the colonel's waxed moustache than the unchristian spirit would take possession of him once more suggesting bitter repartees and contemptuous answers before he had been a month in the prison the mutual irritation had reached such a height that he and the colonel could not see each other's faces without losing their temper the continual strain of this petty warfare was beginning to tell heavily upon his nerves knowing how closely he was watched and remembering certain dreadful rumors which he had heard of prisoners secretly drugged with belladonna that notes might be taken of their ravings he gradually became afraid to sleep or eat and if a mouse ran past him in the night would start up drenched with cold sweat and quivering with terror fancying that some one was hiding in the room to listen if he talked in his sleep the gendarmes were evidently trying to entrap him into making some admission which might compromise bola and so great was his fear of slipping by any inadvertency into a pitfall that he was really in danger of doing so through sheer nervousness bola's name rang in his ears night and day interfering even with his devotions and forcing its way in among the beads of the rosary instead of the name of mary but the worst thing of all was that his religion like the outer world seemed to be slipping away from him as the days went by to this last foothold he clung with feverish tenacity spending several hours of each day in prayer and meditation but his thoughts wandered more and more often to bola and the prayers were growing terribly mechanical his greatest comfort was the head warder of the prison this was a little old man fat and bald who at first had tried his hardest to wear a severe expression gradually the good nature which peeped out of every dimple in his chubby face conquered his official scruples and he began carrying messages for the prisoners from cell to cell 
one afternoon in the middle of may this warder came into the cell with a face so scowling and gloomy that arthur looked at him in astonishment why enrico he exclaimed what on earth is wrong with you to-day nothing said enrico snappishly and going up to the pallet he began pulling off the rug which was arthur's property what do you want with my things am i to be moved into another cell no you're to be let out let out what to-day for altogether enrico in his excitement arthur had caught hold of the old man's arm it was angrily wrenched away enrico what has come to you why don't you answer are we all going to be let out a contemptuous grunt was the only reply look here arthur again took hold of the warder's arm laughing it is no use for you to be cross to me because i'm not going to get offended i want to know about the others which others growled enrico suddenly laying down the shirt he was folding not bola i suppose bola and all the rest of course enrico what is the matter with you well he's not likely to be let out in a hurry poor lad when a comrade has betrayed him ugh enrico took up the shirt again in disgust betrayed him a comrade oh how dreadful arthur's eyes dilated with horror enrico turned quickly round why wasn't it you i are you off your head man i well they told him so yesterday at interrogation anyhow i'm very glad if it wasn't you for i always thought you were rather a decent young fellow this way enrico stepped out into the corridor and arthur followed him a light breaking in upon the confusion of his mind they told bola i'd betrayed him of course they did why man they told me he had betrayed me surely bola isn't fool enough to believe that sort of stuff then it really isn't true enrico stopped at the foot of the stairs and looked searchingly at arthur who merely shrugged his shoulders of course it's a lie well i'm glad to hear it my lad and i'll tell him you said so but you see what they told him was that you had denounced him out of well out of jealousy because of your both being sweet on the same girl it's a lie arthur repeated the words in a quick breathless whisper a sudden paralyzing fear had come over him the same girl jealousy how could they know how could they know wait a minute my lad enrico stopped in the corridor leading to the interrogation room and spoke softly i believe you but just tell me one thing i know you're a catholic did you ever say anything in the confessional it's a lie this time arthur's voice had ridden to a stifled cry enrico shrugged his shoulders and moved on again you know best of course but you wouldn't be the only young fool that's been taken in that way there's a tremendous ado just now about a priest in pisa that some of your friends have found out they've printed a leaflet saying he's a spy he opened the door of the interrogation room and seeing that arthur stood motionless staring blankly before him pushed him gently across the threshold good afternoon mr burton said the colonel smiling and showing his teeth amiably i have great pleasure in congratulating you an order for your release has arrived from florence will you kindly sign this paper arthur went up to him i want to know he said in a dull voice who it was that betrayed me the colonel raised his eyebrows with a smile can't you guess think a minute arthur shook his head the colonel put out both hands with a gesture of polite surprise can't guess really why you yourself mr burton who else could know your private love affairs arthur turned away in silence on the wall hung a large wooden crucifix and his eyes wandered slowly to its face but with no appeal in them only a dim wonder at this supine and patient god that had no thunderbolt for a priest who betrayed the confessional will you kindly sign this receipt for your papers said the colonel blandly 
and then i need not keep you any longer i am sure you must be in a hurry to get home and my time is very much taken up just now with the affairs of that foolish young man bola who tried your christian forbearance so hard i am afraid he will get a rather heavy sentence good afternoon arthur signed the receipt took his papers and went out in dead silence he followed enrico to the massive gate and without a word of farewell descended to the water's edge where a ferryman was waiting to take him across the moat as he mounted the stone steps leading to the street a girl in a cotton dress and straw hat ran up to him with outstretched hands arthur oh i'm so glad i'm so glad he drew his hands away shivering jim he said at last in a voice that did not seem long to him jim i've been waiting here for half an hour they said you would come out at four arthur why do you look at me like that something has happened arthur what has come to you stop he had turned away and was walking slowly down the street as if he had forgotten her presence thoroughly frightened at his manner she ran after him and caught him by the arm arthur he stopped and looked up with bewildered eyes she slipped her arm through his and they walked on again for a moment in silence listen dear she began softly you mustn't get so upset over this wretched business i know it's dreadfully hard on you but everybody understands what business he asked in the same dull voice i mean about bola's letter arthur's face contracted painfully at the name i thought you wouldn't have heard of it Gemma went on but i suppose they've told you bola must be perfectly mad to have imagined such a thing such a thing you don't know about it then he has written a horrible letter saying that you have told about the steamers and got him arrested it's perfectly absurd of course everyone that knows you sees that it's only the people who don't know you that have been upset by it really that's what i came here for to tell you that no one in our group believes a word of it Gemma. but it's it's true she shrank slowly away from him and stood quite still her eyes wide and dark with horror her face as white as the kerchief at her neck a great icy wave of silence seemed to have swept round them both shutting them out in a world apart from the life and movement of the street yes he whispered at last the steamers i spoke of that and i said his name oh my god my god what shall i do he came to himself suddenly realizing her presence and the mortal terror in her face yes of course she must think Gemma, you don't understand he burst out moving nearer but she recoiled with a sharp cry don't touch me arthur seized her right hand with sudden violence listen for god's sake it was not my fault i let go let my hand go let go the next instant she wrenched her fingers away from his and struck him across the cheek with her open hand a kind of mist came over his eyes for a little while he was conscious of nothing but Gemma's white and desperate face and the right hand which she had fiercely rubbed on the skirt of her cotton dress then the daylight crept back again and he looked round and saw that he was alone end of chapter six part one chapter seven of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the gadfly by ethel lillian voynich part one chapter seven
It had long been dark when Arthur rang at the front door of the great house in the Via Borra. He remembered that he had been wandering about the streets, but where or why or for how long he had no idea. Julius Page opened the door, yawning and grinned significantly at the haggard stony face. It seemed to him a prodigious joke to have the young master come home from jail like a drunk and disorderly beggar. Arthur went upstairs. On the first floor he met Gibbons, coming down with an air of lofty and solemn disapproval. He tried to pass him with a muttered, Good evening, but Gibbons was no easy person to get past against his will. The gentlemen are out, sir, he said, looking critically at Arthur's rather neglected dress and hair. They have gone with the mistress to an evening party and will not be back till nearly twelve. Arthur looked at his watch. It was nine o'clock. Oh, yes, he would have time. Plenty of time. My mistress desired me to ask whether you would like any supper, sir, and to say that she hopes you will sit up for her, as she particularly wishes to speak to you this evening. I don't want anything, thank you. You can tell her I have not gone to bed. He went up to his room. Nothing in it had been changed since his arrest. Montanelli's portrait was on the table where he had placed it, and the crucifix stood in the alcove as before. He paused a moment on the threshold, listening, but the house was quite still. Evidently, no one was coming to disturb him. He stepped softly into the room and locked the door. And so he had come to the end. There was nothing to think or trouble about, an importunate and useless consciousness to get rid of, and nothing more. It seemed a stupid, aimless kind of thing, somehow. He had not formed any resolve to commit suicide, nor indeed had he thought much about it. The thing was quite obvious and inevitable. He had even no definite idea as to what manner of death to choose. All that mattered was to be done with it quickly, to have it over and forget. He had no weapon in the room, not even a pocket knife, but that was of no consequence. A towel would do, or a sheet torn into strips. There was a large nail just over the window. That would do, but it must be firm to bear his weight. He got up on a chair to feel the nail. It was not quite firm, and he stepped down again and took a hammer from a drawer. He knocked in the nail and was about to pull a sheet off his bed when he suddenly remembered that he had not said his prayers. Of course, one must pray before dying. Every Christian does that. There are even special prayers for a departing soul. He went into the alcove and knelt down before the crucifix. Almighty and merciful God, he began aloud, and with that broke off and said no more. Indeed, the world was grown so dull that there was nothing left to pray for or against. And then, what did Christ know about a trouble of this kind? Christ who had never suffered it. He had only been betrayed, like Bola. He had never been tricked into betraying. Arthur rose, crossing himself from old habit. Approaching the table, he saw lying upon it a letter addressed to him in Montanelli's handwriting. It was in pencil. My dear boy, it is a great disappointment to me that I cannot see you on the day of your release. But I have been sent for to visit a dying man. I shall not get back till late at night. Come to me early tomorrow morning in great haste. L.M. He put down the letter with a sigh. It did seem hard on the padre. How the people had laughed and gossiped in the streets. Nothing was altered since the days when he had been alive. Not the least little one of all the daily trifles round him was changed because a human soul, a living human soul, had been struck down dead. It was all just the same as before. The water had plashed in the fountains. The sparrows had twittered under the eaves, just as they had done yesterday, just as they would do tomorrow. And as for him, 
He was dead, quite dead. He sat down on the edge of the bed, crossed his arms along the foot rail, and rested his forehead upon them. There was plenty of time, and his head ached so. The very middle of the brain seemed to ache. It was all so dull and stupid, so utterly meaningless. The front door bell rang sharply, and he started up in a breathless agony of terror, with both hands at his throat. They had come back. He had sat there dreaming and let the precious time slip away, and now he must see their faces and hear their cruel tongues, their sneers and comments. If only he had a knife. He looked desperately round the room. His mother's work basket stood in a little cupboard. Surely there would be scissors. He might sever an artery. No, the sheet and nail were safer if he had time. He dragged the counterpane from his bed and with frantic haste began tearing off a strip. The sound of footsteps came up the stairs. No, the strip was too wide. It would not tie firmly, and there must be a noose. He worked faster as the footsteps drew nearer, and the blood throbbed in his temples and roared in his ears. Quicker, quicker, oh God, five minutes more. There was a knock at the door. The strip of torn stuff dropped from his hands, and he sat quite still, holding his breath to listen. The handle of the door was tried. Then Julia's voice called, Arthur! He stood up panting. Arthur, open the door, please. We are waiting. He gathered up the torn counterpane, threw it into a drawer, and hastily smoothed down the bed. Arthur! This time it was James who called, and the door handle was shaken impatiently. Are you asleep? Arthur looked round the room so that everything was hidden and unlocked the door. I should think you might at least have obeyed my express request that you should sit up for us, Arthur, said Julia, sweeping into the room in a towering fashion. You appear to think it the proper thing for us to dance attendance for half an hour at your door. Four minutes, my dear, James mildly corrected stepping into the room at the end of his wife's pink satin train. I certainly think, Arthur, that it would have been more becoming if... What do you want? Arthur interrupted. He was standing with his hand upon the door, glancing furtively from one to the other like a trapped animal. But James was too obtuse and Julia too angry to notice the look. Mr. Burton placed a chair for his wife and sat down, carefully pulling up his new trousers at the knees. Julia and I, he began, felt it to be our duty to speak to you seriously about. I can't listen tonight. I'm not well. My head aches. You must wait. Arthur spoke in a strange, indistinct voice with a confused and rambling manner. James looked round in surprise. Is there anything the matter with you? He asked anxiously, suddenly, remembering that Arthur had come from a very hot bed of infection. I hope you are not sickening for anything. You look quite feverish. Nonsense! Julia interrupted sharply. It's only the usual theoreticals, because he's ashamed to face us. Come here and sit down, Arthur. Arthur slowly crossed the room and sat down on the bed. Yes, he said wearily. Mr. Burton coughed, cleared his throat, smoothed his already immaculate beard, and began the careful prepared speech over again. I feel it to be my duty, my painful duty, to speak very seriously to you about your extraordinary behavior in connecting yourself with a... Um, Law breakers and incendiaries, and a person of disreputable character. I believe you to have been perhaps more foolish than depraved. Um, he paused. Yes, Arthur said again. Now I don't wish to be hard on you. James went on, softening a little, in spite of himself, before the weary hopelessness of Arthur's manner. 
I am quite willing to believe that you have been led away by bad companions, and to take into account your youth and experience and um, uh, imprudent and uh, impulsive character, which you have, I fear, inherited from your mother. Arthur's eyes wandered slowly to his mother's portrait and back again, but he did not speak. But you will, I feel sure, understand, James continued, that it is quite impossible for me to keep any longer in my house a person who has brought public disgrace upon a name so highly respected as ours. Yes, Arthur repeated once more. Well, said Julia sharply, closing her fan with a snap and lying it across her knee. Are you going to have the goodness to say anything but yes, Arthur? You will do as you think best, of course he answered slowly without moving it doesn't matter much either way doesn't matter james repeated aghast and his wife rose with a laugh oh it doesn't matter doesn't it well james i hope you understand now how much gratitude you may expect in that quarter i told you what would become of showing charity to papist adventuresses at their Hush, hush, never mind that, my dear. It's all nonsense, James. We have had more than enough of this sentimentality. A love child setting himself up as a member of the family. It's quite time he did know what his mother was. Why should we be saddled with the child of a popish priest, a mouret? There, then, look. She pulled a crumbled sheet of paper out of her pocket and tossed it across the table to Arthur. He opened it. The writing was in his mother's hand and was dated four months before his birth. It was a confession addressed to her husband and with two signatures. Arthur's eyes travelled slowly down the page, past the unsteady letters in which her name was written, to the strong, familiar signature. Lorenzo Montanelli. For a moment he stared at the writing, then without a word refolded the paper and laid it down. James rose and took his wife by the arm. There, Julia, that will do. Just go downstairs now. It's late, and I want to talk a little business with Arthur. It won't interest you. She glanced up at her husband, then back at Arthur, who was silently staring at the floor. He seems half stupid, she whispered. When she had gathered up her train and left the room, James carefully shut the door and went back to his chair beside the table. Arthur sat as before, perfectly motionless and silent. Arthur, James began in a milder tone. Now Julia was not there to hear. I am very sorry that this has come out. You might just as well not have known it. However, all that's over, and I'm pleased to see that you can behave with such self-control. Julia is, uh, a little excited. Ladies often, anyhow. I don't want to be too hard on you. He stopped to see what effect the kindly words had produced. But Arthur was quite motionless. Of course, my dear boy, James went on after a moment. This is a distressing story altogether, and the best thing we can do is to hold our tongues about it. My father was generous enough not to divorce your mother when she confessed her fault to him. He only demanded that the man who had led her astray should leave the country at once. And, as you know, he went to China as a missionary. For my part, I was very much against your having anything to do with him when he came back. But my father, just at last, consented to let him teach you, on condition that he never attempted to see your mother. I must, in just, acknowledge that I believe they both observed that condition faithfully to the end. It is a very deplorable business, but... Arthur looked up. All the life and expression had gone out of his face. It was like a waxen mask. Don't you think, he said softly with a curious, stammering hesitation on the words, that all this is very funny? 
funny. James pushed his chair away from the table and sat staring at him, too much petrified for anger. Funny. Arthur, are you mad? Arthur suddenly threw back his head and burst into a frantic fit of laughing. Arthur, exclaimed the ship owner, rising with dignity, I'm amazed at your liberty. There was no answer but peal after peal of laughter, so loud and boisterous that even James began to doubt whether there was not something more the matter here than liberty. Just like a hysterical woman, he muttered, turning with a contemptuous shrug of his shoulders to tramp impatiently up and down the room. Really, Arthur, you're worse than Julia. There, stop laughing. I can't wait about here all night. He might as well have asked the crucifix to come down from its pedestal. Arthur was past caring for remonstrances or exhortations. He only laughed and laughed and laughed without end. This is absurd, said James, stopping at last in his irritated pacing to and fro. You are evidently too much excited to be reasonable tonight. I can't talk business with you if you are going on that way. Come to me tomorrow morning after breakfast, and now you had better go to bed. Good night. He went out, slamming the door. Now for the hysterics downstairs, he muttered as he tramped noisily away. I suppose it will be tears there. The frenzied laughter died on Arthur's lips. He snatched up the hammer from the table and flung himself upon the crucifix. With the crash that followed, he came suddenly to his senses, standing before the empty pedestal, the hammer still in his hand and the fragments of the broken image scattered on the floor about his feet. He threw down the hammer. So easy, he said, and turned away. And what an idiot I am. He sat down by the table, panting heavily for breath, and rested his forehead on both hands. Presently he rose, and going to the washstand, poured a jug full of cold water over his head and face. He came back quite composed and sat down to think. And it was for such things as these, for these false and slavish people, these dumb and soulless gods, that he had suffered all these tortures of shame and passion and despair, had made a rope to hang himself forsooth, because one priest was a liar, as if they were not all liars. Well, all that was done with, he was wiser now. He need only shake off these vermin and begin life afresh. There were plenty of good vessels in the docks, it would be an easy matter to stow himself away in one of them and get across to Canada, Australia, Cape Colony, anywhere. It was no matter for the country, if only it was far enough. And as for the life out there, he could see, and if it did not suit him, he could try some other place. He took out his purse, only thirty-three pauli, but his watch was a good one. That would help him along a bit, and in any case it was of no consequence. He should pull through somehow, but they would search for him, all these people. They would be sure to make inquiries at the docks. No, he must put them on a false scent, make them believe him dead. Then he should be quite free, quite free. He laughed softly to himself at the thought of the Burtons searching for his corpse. What a farce the whole thing was. Taking a sheet of paper, he wrote the first words that occurred to him. I believed in you as I believed in God. God is a thing made of clay that I can smash with a hammer, and you have fooled me with a lie. He folded up the paper, directed it to Montanelli, and taking another sheet, wrote across it, Look for my body in Darcina. Then he put on his hat and went out of the room. Passing his mother's portrait, he looked up with a laugh and a shrug of his shoulders. She too had lied to him. He crept softly along the corridor and slipping back the door bolts, he went out on to the great 
dark, echoing marble staircase. It seemed to yawn beneath him like a black pit as he descended. He crossed the courtyard, trending cautiously for fear of waking Gian Battista, who slept on the ground floor. In the wood cellar at the back was a little grated window, opening on the canal and not more than four feet from the ground. He remembered that the rusty grating had broken away on one side. By pushing a little, he could make an aperture wide enough to climb out by. The grating was strong, and he grazed his hands badly and tore the sleeve of his coat. But that was no matter. He looked up and down the street. There was no one in sight, and the canal lay back and silent, an ugly trench between two straight and slimy walls. The untried universe might prove a dismal hole but it could hardly be more flat and sordid than the corner which he was leaving behind him. There was nothing to regret, nothing to look back upon. It had been a pestilent little stagnant world, full of squalid lies and clumsy sheets and foul-smelling ditches that were not even deep enough to drown a man. He walked along the canal bank and came out upon the tiny square by the Medici palace. It was here that Gemma had run up to him with her vivid face and her outstretched hands. Here was the little flight of wet stone steps leading down to the moat, and there the fortress, scowling across the strip of dirty water. He had never noticed before how squat and mean it looked. Passing through the narrow streets, he reached the Darsena shipping basin, where he took off his hat and flung it into the water. It would be found, of course, when they dragged for his body. Then he walked on along the water's edge, considering perplexedly what to do next. He must contrive to hide on some ship, but it was a difficult thing to do. His only chance would be to get on the huge old Medici breakwater and walk along to the further end of it. There was a low-class tavern on the point. Probably he should find some sailor there who could be bribed. But the dock gates were closed. How should he get past them and past the custom officials? His stock of money would not furnish the high bribe that they would demand for letting him through at night and without a passport. Besides, they might recognize him. As he passed the bronze statue of the four moors, a man's figure emerged from an old house on the opposite side of the shipping basin and approached the bridge. Arthur slipped at once into the deep shadow behind the group of statuary and crouched down in the darkness, peeping cautiously round the corner of the pedestal. It was a soft spring night warm and starlit the water lapped against the stone walls of the basin swirled in gentle eddies round the steps with a sound as of low laughter somewhere near a chain creaked swinging slowly to and fro a huge iron crane towered up tall and melancholy in the dimness black on a shimmering expanse of a starry sky and purely cloud wreaths the figures of the fettered, struggling slaves stood out in vain and vehement protest against a merciless doom. The man approached unsteadily along the water side, shouting an English street song. He was evidently a sailor returning from a carouse at some tavern. No one else was within sight. As he drew near, Arthur stood up and stepped into the middle of the roadway. The sailor broke off in his song with an oath and stopped short. I want to speak to you, Arthur said in Italian. Do you understand me? The man shook his head. It's no use talking the patter to me, he said then, plunging into bad French. Ask sullenly, what do you want? Why can't you let me pass? Just come out of the light here a minute. I want to speak to you. Ah, wouldn't you like it out of the light? Got a knife anywhere about you? 
No, no, man. Can't you see I only want your help? I will pay for it. Eh, what? And dress like a swell, too? The sailor had relapsed into English. He now moved into the shadow and leaned against the railing of the pedestal. Well, he said, returning to his atrocious French, and what is it you want? I want to get away from here. Ah, a stowaway. Want me to hide you? Been up to something, I suppose. Stuck a knife into somebody, eh? Just like these foreigners? And where might you be wanting to go? Not to the police station, I fancy. He laughed in his tipsy way and winked one eye. What vessel do you belong to? Carlotta Leghorn to Buenos Aires. Shipping oil one way and hides the other. She's over there, pointing in the direction of the breakwater. Beastly old hulk. Buenos Aires. Yes. Can you hide me anywhere on board? How much can you give? Not very much. I have only a few pauli. No, can't do it under fifty, and sheep at that too, swell like you. What do you mean by a swell? If you like my clothes, you may change with me, but I can't give you more money than I have got. You have a watch there. Hand it over. Arthur took out a lady's gold watch, delicately chased and enameled, with the initials G.B. on the back. It had been his mother's, but what did that matter now? Ah, remarked the sailor with a quick glance at it. Stolen, of course. Let me look. Arthur drew his hand away. No, he said. I will give you the watch when we are on board, not before. You are not such a fool as you look, after all. I bet it's your first scrape, though, eh? That is my business. Ha! Oh, there comes the watchman. They crouched down behind the group of statuary and waited till the watchman had passed. Then the sailor rose and, telling Arthur to follow him, walked on, laughing foolishly to himself. Arthur followed in silence. The sailor led him back to the little irregular square by the Medici palace, and, stopping in a dark corner, mumbled in what was intended for a cautious whisper. Wait here. Those soldier fellows will see you if you come further. What are you going to do? Get you some clothes. I'm not going to take you on board with that bloody cold sleeve. Arthur glanced down at the sleeve, which had been torn by the window grating. A little blood from the grazed hand had fallen upon it. Evidently the man thought him a murderer. Well, it was of no consequence what people thought. After some time the sailor came back triumphant with a bundle under his arm. Change, he whispered, and make haste about it. I must get back, and that old Jew has kept me bargaining and hungling for half an hour. Arthur obeyed shrinking with instinctive disgust at the first touch of second-hand clothes. Fortunately, these, though rough and coarse, were fairly clean. When he stepped into the light in his new attire, the sailor looked at him with stepsy solemnity and gravely nodded his approval. You will do, he said. This way, and don't make a noise. Arthur, carrying his discarded clothes, followed him through a labyrinth of winding canals and dark, narrow alleys, the medieval slum quarter which the people of Leghorn called New Venice. Here and there, a gloomy old palace, solitary among the squalid houses and filthy courts, stood between two noisome ditches with a forlorn air of trying to preserve its ancient dignity, and yet of knowing the effort to be a hopeless one. Some of the alleys he knew were notorious dens of thieves, cutthroats and smugglers. Others were merely wretched and poverty-stricken. Beside one of the little bridges the sailor stopped, and looking round to see that they were not observed, descended a flight of stone steps to a narrow landing stage. Under the bridge was a dirty, crazy old boat, Sharply ordering Arthur to jump in and lie down, he seated himself in the boat and began rowing towards the harbour's mouth. Arthur lay still on the wet and leaky blanks, 
hidden by the clothes which the man had thrown over him, and peeping out from under them at the familiar streets and houses. Presently they passed under a bridge and entered that part of the canal which forms a moat for the fortress. The massive walls rose out of the water, broad at the base and narrowing upward to the frowning turrets. How strong, how threatening they had seemed to him a few hours ago. And now he laughed softly as he lay in the bottom of the boat. Hold your noise, the sailor whispered, and keep your head covered. We are close to the custom house. Arthur drew the clothes over his head. A few yards further on the boat stopped before a row of moss, chained together, which lay across the surface of the canal, blocking the narrow waterway between the custom house and the fortress wall. A sleepy official came out yawning and bent over the water's edge with a lantern in his hand. Passport, please. The sailor handed up his official papers. Arthur, half stifled under the clothes, held his breath, listening. A nice time of night to come back to your ship, grumbled the customs official. Been out on the spear, I suppose. What's in your boat? Old clothes got them cheap. He held up the waistcoat for an inspection. The official, lowering his lantern, bent over, straining his eyes to see. It's all right. I suppose you can't pass. He lifted the barrier and the boat moved slowly out into the dark, heaving water. At a little distance, Arthur sat up and threw off the clothes. Here she is, the sailor whispered after rowing for some time in silence. Keep close behind me and hold your tongue. He clambered up the side of a huge black monster, swearing under his breath, at the clumsiness of the land's man. Though Arthur's natural agility rendered him less awkward than most people would have been in his place, once safely on board, they crept cautiously between dark masses of ringing and machinery and came at last to a hatchway, which the sailor softly raised. Down here, he whispered, I'll be back in a minute. The hold was not only damp and dark, but intolerably foul. At first, Arthur instinctively drew back, half shocked by the stench of raw hides and rancid oil. Then he remembered the punishment cell and descended the ladder, shrugging his shoulders. Life is pretty much the same everywhere. It seemed ugly, putrid, invested with vermin, full of shameful secrets and dark corners. Still, life is life, and he must make the best of it. In a few minutes, the sailor came back with something in his hands, which Arthur could not distinctly see for the darkness. Now, give me the watch and money. Make haste. Taking advantage of the darkness, Arthur succeeded in keeping back a few coins. You must get me something to eat, he said. I'm half starved. I have brought it. Here you are. The sailor handed him a pitcher, some hard biscuit, and a piece of salt pork. Now mind, you must hide in this empty barrel here when the custom officers come to examine tomorrow morning. Keep as still as a mouse till we are right out at sea. I will let you know when to come out, and won't you just catch it when the captain sees you, that's all. Got the drink safe? Good night. The hatchway closed and Arthur, setting the precious drink in a safe place, climbed on to an oil barrel to eat his pork and biscuit. Then he curled himself up on the dirty floor, and for the first time since his babyhood, settled himself to sleep without a prayer. The rats scurried round him in the darkness, but neither their persistent noise, nor the swaying of the ship, nor the nauseating stench of oil, nor the prospect of tomorrow's sea sickness could keep him awake. He cared no more for them all than for the broken and dishonored idols that only yesterday had been the gods of his adoration. End of chapter 7 of the first part Recording by Sarah Hale
Part 2, Chapter 1 of The Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Isaacson. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Part 2. Thirteen Years Later. Chapter 1. One evening in July 1846, a few acquaintances met at Professor Fabrizi's house in Florence to discuss plans for future political work. Several of them belonged to the Mazzinian party and would have been satisfied with nothing less than a democratic republic and a united Italy. Others were constitutional monarchists and liberals of various shades. On one point, however, they were all agreed that of dissatisfaction with the Tuscan censorship, and the popular professor had called the meeting in the hope that on this one subject at least the representatives of the dissentient parties would be able to get through an hour's discussion without quarrelling. Only a fortnight had elapsed since the famous amnesty which Pius IX had granted on his accession to political offenders in the Papal States, but the wave of liberal enthusiasm caused by it was already spreading over Italy. In Tuscany even the government appeared to have been affected by the astounding event. It had occurred to Fabrizi and a few other leading Florentines that this was a propitious moment for a bold effort to reform the press laws. Of course, the dramatist Lager had said when the subject was first broached to him, it would be impossible to start a newspaper till we can get the press law changed. We should not bring out the first number but we may be able to run some pamphlets through the censorship already, and the sooner we begin, the sooner we shall get the law changed. He was now explaining in Fabrizi's library his theory of the line which should be taken by liberal writers at the moment. There is no doubt, interposed one of the company, a grey-haired barrister with a rather drawling manner of speech, that in some way we must take advantage of the moment. We shall not see such a favourable one again for bringing forward serious reforms, but I doubt the pamphlets doing any good. They will only irritate and frighten the government instead of winning it over to our side, which is what we really want to do. If, once the authorities begin to think of us as dangerous agitators, our chance of getting their help is gone. Then what would you have us do? Petition. To the Grand Duke? Yes, for an augmentation of the liberty of the press. A keen-looking dark man sitting by the window turned his head round with a laugh. You'll get a lot out of petitioning, he said. I should have thought the result of the Renzi case was enough to cure anybody of going to work that way. My dear sir, I am as much grieved as you are that we did not succeed in preventing the extradition of Renzi, but really... I do not wish to hurt the sensibilities of anyone, but I cannot help thinking that our failure in that case was largely due to the impatience and vehemence of some persons among our number. I should certainly hesitate, as every Piedmontese always does, the dark man interrupted sharply. I don't know where the vehemence and impatience lay, unless you found them in the strings of meek petitions we sent in. That may be vehemence for Tuscany or Piedmont, but we should not call it particularly vehement in Naples. Fortunately, remarked the Piedmontese, Neapolitan vehemence is peculiar to Naples. There, there, gentlemen, that will do, the professor put in. Neapolitan customs are very good things in their way, and Piedmontese customs in theirs. But just now we are in Tuscany, and the Tuscan custom is to stick to the matter in hand. Grassini votes for petitions, and Galli against them. What do you think, Dr. Ricardo? I see no harm in petitions, and if Grassini gets one up, I'll sign it with all the pleasure in life. But I don't think mere petitioning and nothing else will accomplish much. Why can't we have both petitions and pamphlets? Simply because the pamphlets will put the government into a state of mind in which it won't grant the petitions, said Grassini. It won't do that anyhow. 
The Neapolitan rose and came across the table. Gentlemen, you're on the wrong tack. Conciliating the government will do no good. What we must do is to rouse the people. That's easier said than done. How are you going to start? Fancy asking Galley that. Of course he'd start by knocking the censor on the head. No, indeed I shouldn't said Galley stoutly. You always think if a man comes from down south, he must believe in no argument but cold steel. Well, what do you propose then? Shh! Attention, gentlemen. Galley has a proposal to make. The whole company, which had broken up into little knots of twos and threes carrying on separate discussions, collected round the table to listen. Galley raised his hands in expostulation. No, gentlemen, it is not a proposal. It is merely a suggestion. It appears to me that there is a great practical danger in all this rejoicing over the new Pope. People seem to think that because he has struck out a new line and granted this amnesty, we have only to throw ourselves, all of us, the whole of Italy, into his arms, and he will carry us to the promised land. Now, I am second to no one in admiration of the Pope's behaviour. His amnesty was a splendid action. I am sure His Holiness ought to feel flattered, Grassini began contemptuously. There, Grassini, do let the man speak. Ricardo interrupted in his turn. It's a most extraordinary thing that you two never can keep from sparring like a cat and dog. Get on, Galley. What I wanted to say is this, continued the Neapolitan. The Holy Father, undoubtedly, is acting with the best intentions. But how far he will succeed in carrying his reforms is another question. Just now it's smooth enough, and of course the reactionists all over Italy will lie quiet for a month or two till the excitement about the amnesty blows over but they are not likely to let the power be taken out of their hands without a fight, and my own belief is that before the winter is half over, we shall have Jesuits and Gregorians and Sanfordists and all the rest of the crew about our ears, plotting and intriguing, and poisoning off everybody they can't bribe. That's likely enough. Very well, then. Shall we wait here, meekly sending in petitions, till Lambruschini and his pack have persuaded the Grand Duke to put us bodily under Jesuit rule, with perhaps a few Austrian hussars to patrol the streets and keep us in order? Or shall we forestall them, and take advantage of their momentary discomfiture to strike the first blow? Tell us first what blow you propose. I would suggest that we start an organised propaganda and agitation against the Jesuits. A pamphleteering declaration of war, in fact, yes, exposing their intrigues, ferreting out their secrets, and calling upon the people to make common cause against them. But there are no Jesuits here to expose, aren't there? Wait three months and see how many we shall have. It'll be too late to keep them out then. But really, to rouse the town against the Jesuits, one must speak plainly, and if you do that, how will you evade the censorship? I wouldn't evade it. I would defy it. You would print the pamphlets anonymously? That's all very well, but the fact is, we have all seen enough of the clandestine press to know I did not mean that. I would print the pamphlets openly, with our names and addresses, and let them prosecute us if they dare. The project is a perfectly mad one, Grassini exclaimed. It is simply putting one's head into the lion's mouth out of sheer wantonness. Oh, you needn't be afraid, Galley cut in sharply. We shouldn't ask you to go to prison for our pamphlets. Hold your tongue, Galley, said Ricardo. It's not a question of being afraid. We are all as ready as you are to go to prison if there's any good to be got by it, but it is childish to run into danger for nothing. For my part, I have an amendment to the proposal to suggest. Well, what is it? I think we might contrive, with care, to fight the Jesuits without coming into collision with the censorship. I don't see how you're going to manage it. I think that it is possible to clothe what one has to say in so roundabout a form that, that the censorship won't understand it, and then you'll expect every poor artisan and labourer to find out the meaning by the light of the ignorance and stupidity that they are in him. That doesn't sound very practical. Martini, what do you think? asked the professor, turning to a broad-shouldered man with a great brown beard who was sitting beside him. I think that I will reserve my opinion till I have more facts to go upon. It's a question of trying experiments and seeing what comes of them. And you, Sacconi? I should like to hear what Signora Bola has to say. Her suggestions are always valuable. Everyone turned to the only woman in the room, who had been sitting on the sofa, resting her chin on one hand and listening in silence to the discussion. 
She had deep, serious black eyes, but as she raised them now, there was an unmistakable gleam of amusement in them. I am afraid, she said, that I disagree with everybody. You always do, and the worst of it is that you are always right, Ricardo put in. I think it is quite true that we must fight the Jesuits somehow. And if we can't do it with one weapon, we must with another. But mere defiance is a feeble weapon, and evasion a cumbersome one. As for petitioning, that is a child's toy. I hope, Signora, Grassini interposed with a solemn face, that you are not suggesting such methods as assassination. Martini tugged at his big moustache, and Galley sniggered outright. Even the grave young woman could not repress a smile. Believe me, she said, that if I were ferocious enough to think of such things, I should not be childish enough to talk about them. But the deadliest weapon I know is ridicule. If you can once succeed in rendering the Jesuits ludicrous, in making people laugh at them and their claims, you have conquered them without bloodshed. I believe you are right as far as that goes, Fabrizi said, but I don't see how you are going to carry the thing through. Why should we not be able to carry it through? asked Martini. A satirical thing has a better chance of getting over the censorship difficulty than a serious one. And if it must be cloaked, the average reader is more likely to find out the double meaning of an apparently silly joke than of a scientific or economic treatise. Then is your suggestion, Signora, that we should issue satirical pamphlets or attempt to run a comic paper? That last I am sure the censorship would never allow. I don't mean exactly either. I believe a series of small satirical leaflets in verse or prose to be sold cheap or distributed free about the streets would be very useful. If we could find a clever artist who would enter into the spirit of the thing, we might have them illustrated. It's a capital idea, if only one could carry it out. But if the thing is to be done at all, it must be well done. We should want a first-class satirist. And where are we to get him? You see, added Lega, most of us are serious writers, and with all respect to the company, I am afraid that a general attempt to be humorous would present the spectacle of an elephant trying to dance the tarantella. I never suggested that we should all rush into work for which we are unfitted. My idea was that we should try and find a really gifted satirist. There must be one to be got somewhere in Italy, surely, and offer to provide the necessary funds. Of course, we should have to know something of the man and make sure that he would work on lines with which we could agree. But where are you going to find him? I can count up the satirists of any real talent on the fingers of one hand, and none of them are available. Giusti wouldn't accept he is fully occupied as it is. There are one or two good men in Lombardy, but they write only in the Milanese dialect. And moreover, said Grassini, the Tuscan people can be influenced in better ways than this. I am sure that it would be felt as to say the least a want of political savoir-faire if we were to treat this solemn question of civil and religious liberty as a subject for trifling. Florence is not a mere wilderness of factories and money-getting like London, nor a haunt of idle luxury like Paris. It is a city with a great history. So was Athens, she interrupted, smiling. But it was rather sluggish from its size, and needed a gadfly to rouse it. Ricardo struck his hand upon the table. Why? We never thought of the gadfly, the very man. Who is that? The gadfly. Felice Rilares. Don't you remember him? One of Muratori's band that came down from the Apennines three years ago. Oh, you knew that set, didn't you? I remember your travelling with them when they went on to Paris. Yes. I went as far as Leghorn to see Ravirez off for Marseille. He wouldn't stop in Tuscany. He said there was nothing left to do but laugh once the insurrection had failed, and so he had better go to Paris. No doubt he agreed with Signor Grassini that Tuscany is the wrong place to laugh in. But I am nearly sure he would come back if we asked him, now that there is a chance of doing something in Italy. What name did you say? Rivarez. He's a Brazilian, I think. At any rate, I know he has lived out there. He is one of the wittiest men I ever came across. Heaven knows we had nothing to be merry over that week in Leghorn. It was enough to break one's heart to look at poor Lambertini, but there was no keeping one's countenance when Rivarez was in the room. It was one perpetual fire of absurdities. 
He had a nasty sabre-cut across the face, too. I remember sewing it up. He's an odd creature, but I believe he and his nonsense kept some of those poor lads from breaking down altogether. Is that the man who writes political skits in the French papers under the name of Le Taon? Yes, short paragraphs mostly, and comic feuilletons. The smugglers up in the Apennines call him the Gadfly because of his tongue, and he took the nickname to sign his work with. I know something about this gentleman, said Grassini, breaking in upon the conversation in his slow and stately manner, and I cannot say that what I have heard is much to his credit. He undoubtedly possesses a certain showy, superficial cleverness, though I think his abilities have been exaggerated, and possibly he is not lacking in physical courage, but his reputation in Paris and Vienna is, I believe, very far from spotless. He appears to be a gentleman of, uh, uh, many adventures and unknown antecedents. It is said that he was picked up out of charity by Duprez's expedition somewhere in the wilds of tropical South America, in a state of inconceivable savagery and degradation. I believe he has never satisfactorily explained how he came to be in such a condition. As for the rising in the Apennines, I fear it is no secret that persons of all characters took part in that unfortunate affair. The men who were executed in Bologna are known to have been nothing but common malefactors, and the character of many who escaped will hardly bear description. Without doubt, some of the participants were men of high character. Some of them were the intimate friends of several persons in this room, Ricardo interrupted, with an angry ring in his voice. It's all very well to be particular and exclusive, Grassini, but these common malefactors died for their belief, which is more than you or I have done as yet. And another time when people tell you the stale gossip of Paris, added Galli, you can tell them from me that they are mistaken about the Duprez expedition. I know Duprez's adjutant Martel personally, and I have heard the whole story from him. It's true that they found Rivarez stranded out there. He had been taken prisoner in the war, fighting for the Argentine Republic, and had escaped. He was wandering about the country in various disguises, trying to get back to Buenos Aires. But the story of their taking him out on charity is pure fabrication. Their interpreter had fallen ill and had been obliged to turn back, and not one of the Frenchmen could speak the native languages. So they offered him the post, and he spent the whole three years with them exploring the tributaries of the Amazon. Martel told me he believed they never would have got through the expedition at all if it had not been for Rivarez. Whatever he may be, said Fabrizi, there must be something remarkable about a man who could lay his come hither on two old campaigners like Martel and Duprez as he seems to have done. What do you think, Signora? I know nothing about the matter. I was in England when the fugitives passed through Tuscany. But I should think that if the companions who were with a man on a three years' expedition in savage countries, and the comrades who were with him through an insurrection, think well of him, that is recommendation enough to counterbalance a good deal of boulevard gossip. There is no question about the opinion his comrades had of him, said Ricardo. From Muratori and Zambacari down to the roughest mountaineers, they were all devoted to him. Moreover, he is a personal friend of Orsini. It's quite true, on the other hand, that there are endless cock-and-bull stories of a not very pleasant kind going about concerning him in Paris. But if a man doesn't want to make enemies, he shouldn't become a political satirist. I'm not quite sure, interposed Lega, but it seems to me that I saw him once when the refugees were here. Was he not hunchbacked or crooked or something of that kind? The professor had opened a drawer in his writing table and was turning over a heap of papers. I think I have his police description somewhere here, he said. You remember when they escaped and hid in the mountain passes, their personal appearance was posted up everywhere, and that cardinal, what's the scoundrel's name, Spinola, offered a reward for their heads. There was a splendid story about Rivarez in that police paper, by the way. He put on a soldier's old uniform and tramped across country as a carabineer wounded in the discharge of his duty and trying to find his company. He actually got Spinola's search party to give him a lift, and rode the whole day in one of their wagons, telling them harrowing stories of how he had been taken captive by the rebels and dragged off into the haunts in their mountains, and of the fearful tortures that he had suffered at their hands. They showed him the description paper, and he told them all the rubbish he could think of about the fiend they called the gadfly. Then, at night when they were asleep, he poured a bucket full of water into their powder and decamped, with his pockets full of provisions and ammunition. Ah! Here's the paper, Fabrizi broke in. Felice Rivarez called the gadfly. Age, about 30. Birthplace and parentage unknown, probably South American. Profession, journalist. 
short black hair, black beard, dark skin, eyes blue, forehead broad and square, nose, mouth, chin, yes, here it is, special marks, right foot lame, left arm twisted, two ringers missing on left hand, recent sabre cut across face, stammers. Then there's a note put, very expert shot, care should be taken in arresting. It's an extraordinary thing that he can have managed to deceive the search party with such a formidable list of identification marks. It was nothing but sheer audacity that carried him through, of course. If it had once occurred to them to suspect him, he would have been lost. But the air of confiding innocence that he can put on when he chooses would bring a man through anything. Well, gentlemen, what do you think of the proposal? Rivara seems to be pretty well known to several of the company. Shall we suggest to him that we should be glad of his help here or not? I think, said Fabrizi, that he might be sounded upon the subject just to find out whether he would be inclined to think of the plan. Oh, he'll be inclined, you may be sure. Once it's a case of fighting the Jesuits, he is the most savage anti-clerical I ever met. In fact, he's rather rabid on the point. Then will you write, Ricardo? Certainly. Let me see, where is he now? In Switzerland, I think. He's the most restless being, always flitting about. But as for the pamphlet question, they plunged into a long and animated discussion. When at last the company began to disperse, Martini went up to the quiet young woman. I will see you home, Gemma. Thanks. I want to have a business talk with you. Anything wrong with the addresses? he asked softly. Nothing serious, but I think it is time to make a few alterations. Two letters have been stopped in the post this week. They were both quite unimportant, and it may have been accidental, but we cannot afford to have any risks. If once the police have begun to suspect any of our addresses, they must be changed immediately. I will come in about that tomorrow. I am not going to talk business with you tonight. You look tired. I am not tired. Then you are depressed again. Oh no, not particularly. End of chapter one of the second part. Recording by Sam Isaacson. Part 2, Chapter 2 of The Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Isaacson. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Chapter 2. Is the mistress in, Katie? Yes, sir, she is dressing. If you'll just step into the parlour, she'll be down in a few minutes. Katie ushered the visitor in with the cheerful friendliness of a true Devonshire girl. Martini was a special favourite of hers. He spoke English like a foreigner, of course, but still quite respectably, and he never sat discussing politics at the top of his voice till one in the morning when the mistress was tired, as some visitors had a way of doing. Moreover, he had come to Devonshire to help the mistress in her trouble when her baby was dead and her husband dying there, and ever since that time, the big, awkward, silent man had been to Katie as much one of the family as was the lazy black cat which now ensconced itself upon his knee. Pasht, for his part, regarded Martini as a useful piece of household furniture. This visitor never trod upon his tail, or puffed tobacco smoke into his eyes, or in any way obtruded upon his consciousness an aggressive biped personality. He behaved as a mere man should, provided a comfortable knee to lie upon and purr, and at table never forgot that to look on while human beings eat fish is not interesting for a cat. The friendship between them was of old date. Once, when Pasht was a kitten and his mistress too ill to think about him, he had come from England under Martini's care, tucked away in a basket. Since then, long experience had convinced him that this clumsy human bear was no fair-weather friend. "'How snug you look, you two, said Gemma, coming into the room. One would think you had settled yourselves for the evening. Martini carefully lifted the cat off his knee. I came early, he said, in the hope that you will give me some tea before we start. There will probably be a frightful crush, and Grassini won't give us any sensible supper. They never do in those fashionable houses. Come now, she said, laughing. That's as bad as galley. Poor Grassini has quite enough sins of his own to answer for without having his wife's imperfect housekeeping visited upon his head. As for the tea, we'll be ready in a minute. Katie has been making some Devonshire cakes specially for you. Katie is a good soul, isn't she, Pasht? 
By the way, so are you to have put on that pretty dress. I was afraid you would forget. I promised you I would wear it, though it is rather warm for a hot evening like this. It will be much cooler up at Fiesole, and nothing else ever suits you so well as white cashmere. I have brought you some flowers to wear with it. Oh, those lovely cluster roses, I am so fond of them. But I had much better go into water. I hate to wear flowers. Now that's one of your superstitious fancies. No, it isn't. Only I think they must get so bored, spending all the evening pinned to such a dull companion. I am afraid we shall all be bored tonight. The conversazione will be dull beyond endurance. Why? Partly because everything Grassini touches becomes as dull as himself. Now don't be spiteful. It is not fair when we are going to be a man's guests. You are always right, Madonna. Well, then, it will be dull because half the interesting people are not coming. How is that? I don't know. Out of town or ill or something. Anyway, there will be two or three ambassadors and some learned Germans and the usual nondescript crowd of tourists and Russian princes and literary club people and a few French officers. Nobody else that I know of. Except, of course, the new satirist, who is to be the attraction of the evening. The new satirist? What, Rivarez? But I thought Grassini disapproved of him so strongly. Yes, but once the man is here and is sure to be talked about, of course Grassini wants his house to be the first place where the new lion will be on show. You may be sure Rivarez has heard nothing of Grassini's disapproval. He may have guessed it, though. He's sharp enough. I did not even know he had come. He only arrived yesterday. Here comes the tea. No, don't get up. Let me fetch the kettle. He was never so happy as in this little study. Gemma's friendship, her grave unconsciousness of the charm she exercised over him, her frank and simple comradeship were the brightest things for him in a life that was none too bright. And whenever he began to feel more than usually depressed, he would come in here after business hours and sit with her, generally in silence, watching her as she bent over her needlework or poured out tea. She never questioned him about his troubles or expressed any sympathy in words, but he always went away stronger and calmer, feeling, as he put it to himself, that he could trudge through another fortnight quite respectably. She possessed, without knowing it, the rare gift of consolation, and when, two years ago, his dearest friends had been betrayed in Calabria and shot down like wolves, her steady faith had been perhaps the thing which had saved him from despair. On Sunday mornings he sometimes came in to talk business, that expression standing for anything connected with the practical work of the Mazzinian party, of which they were both active and devoted members. She was quite a different creature then, keen, cool and logical, perfectly accurate and perfectly neutral, those who saw her only at her political work regarded her as a trained and disciplined conspirator, trustworthy, courageous, in every way a valuable member of the party, but somehow lacking in life and individuality. She's a born conspirator, worth any dozen of us, and she is nothing more, Galli had said of her. The Madonna Gemma whom Martini knew was very difficult to get at. Well, and what is your new satirist like? she asked, glancing back over her shoulder as she opened the sideboard. There, Cesare, there are barley sugar and candied angelica for you. I wonder, by the way, why revolutionary men are always so fond of sweets. Other men are too, only they think it beneath their dignity to confess it. The new satirist, oh, the kind of man that ordinary women will rave over and you will dislike. A sort of professional dealer in sharp speeches that goes about the world with a lackadaisical manner and a handsome ballet girl dangling onto his coattails. Do you mean that there is really a ballet girl? or simply that you feel cross and want to imitate the sharp speeches. The Lord defend me! No! The ballet girl is real enough and handsome enough too for those who like shrewish beauty. Personally, I don't. She's a Hungarian gypsy or something of that kind, so Ricardo says, from some provincial theatre in Galicia. He seems to be a rather cool hand. He has been introducing the girl to people just as if she were his maiden aunt. Well, that's only fair if he has taken her away from her home. You may look at things that way, dear Madonna, but society won't. I think most people will very much resent being introduced to a woman whom they know to be his mistress. How can they know it unless he tells them so? It's plain enough, you'll see if you meet her. But I should think even he would not have the audacity to bring her to the Grassinis. They wouldn't receive her. Signora Grassini is not the woman to do unconventional things of that kind. But I wanted to hear about Signor Rivarez as a satirist, not as a man. Fabrizzi told me he had been written to and had consented to come and take up the campaign against the Jesuits, and that is the last I have heard. There has been such a rush of work this week. I don't know that I can tell you much more. 
There doesn't seem to have been any difficulty over the money question, as we feared there would be. He's well off, it appears, and willing to work for nothing. Has he a private fortune, then? Apparently he has, though it seems rather odd. You heard that night at Fabrizzi's about the state the Duprez expedition found him in. But he's got shares in mines somewhere out in Brazil, and then he has been immensely successful as a feuilleton writer in Paris and Vienna and London. He seems to have half a dozen languages at his fingertips, and there's nothing to prevent his keeping up his newspaper connections from here. Slanging the Jesuits won't take all his time. That's true, of course. It's time to start, Cesare. Yes, I will wear the roses. Wait just a minute. She ran upstairs and came back with the roses in the bosom of her dress, and a long scarf of black Spanish lace thrown over her head. Martini surveyed her with artistic approval. You look like a queen, Madonna Mia, like the great and wise queen of Sheba. What an unkind speech, she retorted, laughing. When you know how hard I've been trying to mould myself into the image of the typical society lady. Who wants a conspirator to look like the Queen of Sheba? That's not the way to keep clear of spies. You'll never be able to personate the stupid society woman if you try forever. But it doesn't matter after all. You're too fair to look upon for spies to guess your opinions, even though you can't simper and hide behind your fan like Signora Grassini. Now, Cesare, let that poor woman alone. There, take some more barley sugar to sweeten your temper. Are you ready? and we had better start. Martini had been quite right in saying that the conversazione would be both crowded and dull. The literary men talked polite, small talk, and looked hopelessly bored, while the nondescript crowd of tourists and Russian princes fluttered up and down the rooms, asking each other who were the various celebrities and trying to carry on intellectual conversation. Grassini was receiving his guests with a manner as carefully polished as his boots, but his cold face lighted up at the sight of Gemma. He did not really like her, and indeed was secretly a little afraid of her, but he realised that without her his drawing room would lack a great attraction. He had risen high in his profession, and now that he was rich and well known, his chief ambition was to make of his house a centre of liberal and intellectual society. He was painfully conscious that this insignificant, overdressed little woman whom in his youth he had made the mistake of marrying was not fit, with her vapid talk and faded prettiness, to be the mistress of a great literary salon. When he could prevail upon Gemma to come, he always felt that the evening would be a success. Her quiet graciousness of manner set the guests at their ease, and her very presence seemed to lay the spectre of vulgarity which always, in his imagination, haunted the house. Signora Grassini greeted Gemma affectionately, exclaiming in a loud whisper, "'How charming you look tonight!' and examining the white cashmere with viciously critical eyes. She hated her visitor rancorously for the very things for which Martini loved her, for her quiet strength of character, for her grave, sincere directness, for the steady balance of her mind, for the very expression of her face. And when Signora Grassini hated a woman, she showed it by effusive tenderness. Gemma took the compliments and endearments for what they were worth and troubled her head no more about them. What is called going into society was in her eyes one of the wearisome and rather unpleasant tasks which a conspirator who wishes not to attract the notice of spies must conscientiously fulfil. She classed it together with the laborious work of writing in cipher, and, knowing how valuable a practical safeguard against suspicion is the reputation of being a well-dressed woman, studied the fashion plates as carefully as she did the keys of her ciphers. The bored and melancholy literary lions brightened up a little at the sound of Gemma's name, she was very popular among them, and the radical journalists especially gravitated at once to her end of the long room. But she was far too practised a conspirator to let them monopolise her. Radicals could be had any day, and now, when they came crowding round her, she gently sent them about their business, reminding them with a smile that they need not waste their time on converting her when there were so many tourists in need of instruction. For her part, she devoted herself to an English MP whose sympathies the Republican Party was anxious to gain, and, knowing him to be a specialist on finance, she first won his attention by asking his opinion on a technical point concerning the Austrian currency, and then deftly turned the conversation to the condition of the Lombardo Venetian revenue. The Englishman, who had expected to be bored with small talk, looked askance at her, evidently fearing that he had fallen into the clutches of a blue stocking, but finding that she was both pleasant to look at and interesting to talk to, surrendered completely and plunged into as grave a discussion of Italian finance as if she had been Metternich. When Grassini brought up a Frenchman, who wishes to ask Signora Bola something about the history of young Italy, 
The MP rose with a bewildered sense that perhaps there was more ground for Italian discontent than he had supposed. Later in the evening, Gemma slipped out onto the terrace under the drawing-room windows to sit alone for a few moments among the great camellias and oleanders. The close air and continually shifting crowd in the rooms were beginning to give her a headache. At the further end of the terrace stood a row of palms and tree ferns, planted in large tubs which were hidden by a bank of lilies and other flowering plants. The whole formed a complete screen, behind which was a little nook, commanding a beautiful view out across the valley. The branches of a pomegranate tree, clustered with late blossoms, hung beside the narrow opening between the plants. In this nook, Gemma took refuge, hoping that no one would guess her whereabouts until she had secured herself against the threatening headache by a little rest and silence. The night was warm and beautifully still, but coming out from the hot close room she felt it cool, and drew her lace scarf about her head. Presently the sounds of voices and footsteps approaching along the terrace roused her from the dreamy state into which she had fallen. She drew back into the shadow, hoping to escape notice and get a few more precious minutes of silence before again having to rack her tired brain for conversation. To her great annoyance the footsteps paused near to the screen, then Signora Grassini's thin, piping little voice broke off for a moment in its stream of chatter. The other voice, a man's, was remarkably soft and musical, but its sweetness of tone was marred by a peculiar purring drawl, perhaps mere affectation, more probably the result of a habitual effort to conquer some impediment of speech, but in any case very unpleasant. "'English, did you say?' it asked. "'But surely the name is quite Italian.' What was it? Bola? Yes, she is the widow of poor Giovanni Bola, who died in England about four years ago. Don't you remember? Ah, oh, I forgot. You lead such a wandering life. We can't expect you to know of all our unhappy country's martyrs. They are so many. Signora Grassini sighed. She always talked in this style to strangers. The role of a patriotic mourner for the sorrows of Italy formed an effective combination with her boarding school manner and pretty infantine pout. Died in England, repeated the other voice. Was he a refugee then? I seem to recognize the name somehow. Was he not connected with young Italy in its early days? Yes, he was one of the unfortunate young men who were arrested in 33. You remember that sad affair? He was released in a few months, then two or three years later. When there was a warrant out against him again, he escaped to England. The next we heard that he was married there. It was a most romantic affair altogether, but poor Bola always was romantic. And then he died in England, you say? Yes, of consumption. He could not stand that terrible English climate. And she lost her only child just before his death. It caught scarlet fever. Very sad, is it not? And we are all so fond of dear Gemma. She is a little stiff, poor thing. The English always are, you know, but I think her troubles have made her melancholy. And Gemma stood up and pushed back the boughs of the pomegranate tree. This retailing of her private sorrows for purposes of small talk was almost unbearable to her, and there was visible annoyance in her face as she stepped into the light. Ah, here she is, exclaimed the hostess with admirable coolness. Gemma, dear, I was wondering where you could have disappeared to. Signor Felice Rivares wishes to make your acquaintance. So it's the gadfly, thought Gemma, looking at him with some curiosity. He bowed to her decorously enough, but his eyes glanced over her face and figure with a look which seemed to her insolently keen and inquisitorial. You have found the delightful little nook here, he remarked looking at the thick screen, and w w what a charming view. Yes, it's a pretty corner. I came out here to get some air. It seems almost ungrateful to the good God to stay indoors on such a lovely night, said the hostess, raising her eyes to the stars. She had good eyelashes and liked to show them. Look, signore, would not our sweet Italy be heaven on earth if only she were free? To think that she would be a bond slave with such flowers and such skies. And such patriotic women, the gadfly murmured in his soft, languid drawl. Gemma glanced round at him in some trepidation. His impudence was too glaring, surely, to deceive anyone. But she had underrated Signora Grassini's appetite for compliments. The poor woman cast down her lashes with a sigh. Ah, oh, Signore, it is so little that a woman can do. 
Perhaps some day I may prove my right to the name of an Italian. Who knows? And now I must go back to my social duties. The French ambassador has begged me to introduce his ward to all the notabilities. You must come in presently and see her. She is a most charming girl. Gemma, dear, I brought Signor Revise out to show him our beautiful view. I must leave him under your care. I know you will look after him and introduce him to everyone. Ah! There is that delightful Russian prince. Have you met him? They say he is a great favourite of the Emperor Nicholas. He is military commander of some Polish town with a name that nobody can pronounce. Can we magnifique, n'est-ce pas, mon prince? She fluttered away, chattering volubly to a bull-necked man, with a heavy jaw and a coat glittering with orders, and her plaintive dirges for Notre malheureuse patrie, interpolated with Charmant and Mon Prince, died away along the terrace. Gemma stood quite still beside the pomegranate tree. She was sorry for the poor silly little woman, and annoyed at the gadfly's languid insolence. He was watching the retreating figures with an expression of face that angered her, it seemed ungenerous to mock at such pitiable creatures. There go Italian and Russian patriotism, he said, turning to her with a smile, arm in arm and mightily pleased with each other's company. Which do you prefer? She frowned slightly and made no answer. Of course, he went on, it's all a question of p personal taste, but I think of the two. I like the Russian variety best. It's so thorough. If Russia had to depend on flowers and skies for her supremacy instead of on powder and shot, how long do you think Mon Prince would k keep that Polish fortress? I think, she answered coldly, that we can hold our personal opinions without ridiculing a woman whose guests we are. Ah, uh, yes, I f forgot the obligations of hospitality here in Italy. They are a wonderfully hospitable people, these Italians. I am sure the Austrians find them so. Won't you sit down? He limped across the terrace to fetch a chair for her, and placed himself opposite to her leaning against the balustrade. The light from the window was shining full on his face, and she was able to study it at her leisure. She was disappointed. She had expected to see a striking and powerful, if not pleasant, face, but the most salient points of his appearance were a tendency to foppishness in dress, and rather more than a tendency to a certain veiled insolence of expression and manner. For the rest, he was as swarthy as a mulatto, and notwithstanding his lameness, as agile as a cat. His whole personality was oddly suggestive of a black jaguar. The forehead and left cheek were terribly disfigured by the long crooked scar of the old sabre cut, and she had already noticed that when he began to stammer in speaking, that side of his face was affected with a nervous twitch but for these defects he would have been, in a certain restless and uncomfortable way, rather handsome, but it was not an attractive face. Presently he began again in his soft murmuring purr. Just the voice a jaguar would talk in, if it could speak and were in a good humour, Gemma said to herself with rising irritation. I hear, he said, that you are interested in the radical press and write for the papers. I write a little... I have not time to do much. Ah, of course. I understood from Signor Grassini that you undertake other important work as well. Gemma raised her eyebrows slightly. Signora Grassini, like the silly little woman she was, had evidently been chattering imprudently to this slippery creature whom Gemma, for her part, was beginning actually to dislike. My time is a good deal taken up, she said rather stiffly. But Signora Grassini overrates the importance of my occupations. They are mostly of a very trivial character. Well, the world would be in a bad way if we all of us spent our time in chanting dirges for Italy. I should think the neighbourhood of our host of this evening and his wife would make anybody frivolous in self-defence. Oh, yes, I know what you are going to say. You are perfectly right, but they are both so deliciously funny with their patriotism. Are you going in already? It is so nice out here. I think I will go in now. Is that my scarf? Thank you. He had picked it up, and now stood looking at her with wide eyes as blue and innocent as forget-me-nots in a brook. I know you are offended with me, he said penitently, for fooling that painted-up wax doll. But what can a fellow do? Since you ask me, I do think it an ungenerous and, well, cowardly thing to hold one's intellectual inferiors up to ridicule in that way. It is like laughing at a cripple, or... He caught his breath suddenly, painfully, and shrank back, glancing at his lame foot and mutilated hand. 
In another instant he recovered his self-possession and burst out laughing. "'That's hardly a fair comparison, Signora. We cripples don't flaunt our deformities in people's faces as she does her stupidity. At least give us credit for recognizing that crooked backs are no pleasanter than crooked ways. There is a step here. Will you take my arm?' She re-entered the house in embarrassed silence. His unexpected sensitiveness had completely disconcerted her. Directly he opened the door of the great reception room, she realized that something unusual had happened in her absence. Most of the gentlemen looked both angry and uncomfortable. The ladies, with hot cheeks and carefully feigned unconsciousness, were all collected at one end of the room. The host was fingering his eyeglasses with suppressed but unmistakable fury, and a little group of tourists stood in a corner casting amused glances at the further end of the room. Evidently, something was going on there which appeared to them in the light of a joke, and to most of the guests in that of an insult. Signora Grassini alone did not appear to have noticed anything. She was fluttering her fan coquettishly, and chattering to the secretary of the Dutch embassy, who listened with a broad grin on his face. Gemma paused an instant in the doorway, turning to see if the gadfly too had noticed the disturbed appearance of the company. There was no mistaking the malicious triumph in his eyes as he glanced from the face of the blissfully unconscious hostess to a sofa at the end of the room. She understood at once. He had brought his mistress here under some false colour, which had deceived no one but Signora Grassini. The gypsy girl was leaning back on the sofa, surrounded by a group of simpering dandies and blandly ironical cavalry officers. She was gorgeously dressed in amber and scarlet, with an oriental brilliancy of tint and profusion of ornament as startling in a Florentine literary salon as if she had been some tropical bird among sparrows and starlings. She herself seemed to feel out of place and looked at the offended ladies with a fiercely contemptuous scowl. Catching sight of the gadfly as he crossed the room with Gemma, she sprang up and came towards him with a voluble flood of painfully incorrect French. "'Monsieur Rivarez, I've been looking for you everywhere. Count Saltikov wants to know whether you can go to his villa tomorrow night. They will be dancing.' "'I am sorry I can't go, but then I couldn't dance if I did. Signora Bola, allow me to introduce to you Madame Zita Reni. The gypsy glanced round at Gemma with a half-defiant air and bowed stiffly. She was certainly handsome enough, as Martini had said, with a vivid, animal, unintelligent beauty, and the perfect harmony and freedom of her movements were delightful to see, but her forehead was low and narrow, and the line of her delicate nostrils was unsympathetic, almost cruel. The sense of oppression which Gemma had felt in the gadfly society was intensified by the gypsy's presence, and when, a moment later, the host came up to beg Signora Bolla to help him entertain some tourists in the other room, she consented with an odd feeling of relief. "'Well, Madonna, and what do you think of the gadfly?' Martini asked as they drove back to Florence late at night. "'Did you ever see anything quite so shameless as the way he fooled that poor little Grassini woman?' "'About the ballet girl, you mean? Yes. He persuaded her the girl was going to be the lion of the season. Signora Grassini would do anything for a celebrity.' "'I thought it an unfair and unkind thing to do. It put the Grassinis into a false position, and it was nothing less than cruel to the girl herself.' I am sure she felt ill at ease. You had a talk with him, didn't you? What did you think of him? Oh, Cesare, I didn't think anything except how glad I was to see the last of him. I never met anyone so fearfully tiring. He gave me a headache in ten minutes. He's like an incarnate demon of unrest. I thought you wouldn't like him, and to tell the truth, no more do I. The man's as slippery as an eel. I don't trust him. End of chapter two of the second part. Recording by Sam Isaacson. Part two, chapter three of The Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich Part 2 Chapter 3 The Gadfly took lodgings outside the Roman gate, near to which Zeta was boarding. He was evidently somewhat of a Sybarite, and though nothing in the rooms showed any serious extravagance, 
there was a tendency to luxuriousness in trifles and to a certain fastidious daintiness in the arrangement of everything which surprised galli and ricardo they had expected to find a man who had lived among the wildernesses of the amazon more simple in his tastes and wondered at his spotless ties and rows of boots and at the masses of flowers which always stood upon his writing table on the whole they got on very well with him he was hospitable and friendly to every one especially to the local members of the mazinian party to this rule gemma apparently formed an exception he seemed to have taken a dislike to her from the time of their first meeting and in every way avoided her company on two or three occasions he was actually rude to her thus bringing upon himself martini's most cordial detestation there had been no love lost between the two men from the beginning their temperaments appeared to be too incompatible for them to feel anything but repugnance for each other on martini's part this was fast developing into hostility i don't care about his not liking me he said one day to gemma with an aggrieved air i don't like him for that matter so there is no harm done but i can't stand the way he behaves to you if it weren't for the scandal it would make in the party first to beg a man to come and then to quarrel with him i should call him to account for it let him alone cesare it isn't of any consequence and after all it is much my fault as his what is your fault that he dislikes me so i said a brutal thing to him when we first met that night at the gracinus you said a brutal thing that is hard to believe madonna it was unintentional of course and i was very sorry i said something about people laughing at cripples and he took it personally it had never occurred to me to think of him as a cripple he is not so badly deformed of course not he has one shoulder higher than the other and his left arm is pretty badly disabled but he is neither hunchbacked nor club-footed as for his lameness it isn't worth talking about anyway he shivered all over and changed color of course it was horribly tactless of me but it is odd he should be so sensitive i wonder if he has ever suffered from any cruel jokes of that kind much more likely to have perpetrated them i should think there is a sort of eternal brutality about that man under all his fine manners that is perfectly sickening to me now cesare that is downright unfair i don't like him any more than you do but what is the use of making him out worse than he is his manner is a little affected and irritating i expect he has been too much leonized and the everlasting smart speeches are dreadfully tiring but i don't believe he means any harm i don't know what he means but there is something not clean about a man who sneers at everything it fairly disgusted me the other day at fabrizio's debate to hear the way he cried down the reforms in rome just as if he wanted to find a foul motive for everything gemma sighed i'm afraid i agreed better with him than with you on that point she said all you good people are so full of the most delightful hopes and expectations you are always ready to think that if one well-meaning middle-aged gentleman happens to get elected pope everything else will come right of itself he has only got to throw open the prison doors and give his blessing to everybody all round and we may expect the millennium within three months you never seem able to see that he can't set things right even if he would it's the principle of the thing that's wrong not the behavior of this man or that what principle the temporal power of the pope why that in particular 
that's merely a part of the general wrong. The bad principle is that any man should hold over another the power to bind and loose. It's a false relationship to stand in towards one's fellows. Martini held up his hands. That will do, Madonna, he said, laughing. I'm not going to discuss with you. Once you begin talking rank antinomianism in that fashion, I am sure your ancestors must have been English levelers in the 17th century. Besides, what I came round about is this miss. He pulled it out of his pocket. Another new pamphlet. A stupid thing this wretched man Rivaritz sent in to yesterday's committee. I knew we should come to loggerheads with him before long. What is the matter with it? Honestly, Cesare, I think you are a little prejudiced. Rivaritz may be unpleasant, but he is not stupid. Oh, I don't deny that this is clever enough in its way, but you had better read the thing yourself. The pamphlet was a skit on the wild enthusiasm over the new pope, with which Italy was still ringing. Like all the gadfly's writing, it was bitter and vindictive. But notwithstanding her irritation at the style, Gemma could not help recognizing in her heart the justice of the criticism. I quite agree with you that it is detestably malicious she said, lying down the manuscript. But the worst thing about it is that it's all true. Gemma! Yes, but it is. The man's a cold-blooded eel, if you like. But he has got the truth on his side. There is no use in our trying to persuade ourselves that this doesn't hit the mark. It does. Then do you suggest that we should print it? Ah, uh, that's quite another matter. I certainly don't think we ought to print it as it stands. It would hurt and alienate everybody and do no good. But if he would rewrite it and cut out the personal attacks, I think it might be made into a really valuable piece of work. As political criticism, it is very fine. I had no idea he could write so well. He says things which need saying and which none of us have had the courage to say. This passage, where he compares Italy to a tipsy man, weeping with tenderness on the neck of the thief, who is picking his pocket, is splendidly written. Gemma, the very worst bit in the whole thing. I hate that ill-natured yelping at everything and everybody. So do I, but that's not the point. Rivaritz has a very disagreeable style, and as a human being he is not attractive. But when he says that we have made ourselves drunk with processions and embracing and shouting about love and reconciliation, and that the Jesuits and St. Fadids are the people who will profit by it all, he is right a thousand times. I wish I could have been at the committee yesterday. What decision did you finally arrive at? what I have come here about, to ask you to go and talk it over with him and persuade him to soften the thing. Me? But I hardly know the man. And besides that, he detests me. Why should I go of all people? Simply because there is no one else to do it today. Besides, you are more reasonable than the rest of us and won't get into useless arguments and quarrel with him as we should. I shan't do that, certainly. Well, I will go if you like, though I have not much hope of success. I am sure you will be able to manage him if you try. Yes, and tell him that the committee all admire the thing from a literary point of view. That will put him into a good humor, and it is perfectly true, too. The gadfly was sitting beside a table covered with flowers and ferns staring absently at the floor, with an open letter on his knee, a shaggy collie dog lying on a rug at his feet, raised its head and growled as Gemma knocked at the open door, and a gadfly rose hastily and bowed in a stiff, ceremonious way. 
His face had suddenly grown hard and expressionless. You are too kind, he said in his most chilling manner. If you had let me know that you wanted to speak to me, I would have called on you. Seeing that he evidently wished her at the end of the earth, Gemma hastened to state her business. He bowed again and placed a chair for her. The committee wished me to call upon you, she began, because there has been a certain difference of opinion about your pamphlet. So I expected. He smiled and sat down opposite to her, drawing a large vase of chrysanthemums between his face and the light. Most of the members agreed that, however much they may admire the pamphlet as a literary composition, they do not think that in its present form it is quite suitable for publication. They fear that the vehemence of its tone may give offence and alienate persons whose help and support are valuable to the party. He pulled a chrysanthemum from the vase and began slowly plucking off one white petal after another. As her eyes happened to catch the movement of the slim right hand, dropping the petals one by one, an uncomfortable sensation came over Gemma, as though she had somewhere seen that gesture before. As a literary composition, he remarked in his soft, cold voice, it is utterly worthless, and could be admired only by persons who know nothing about literature. As for its giving offence, that is the very thing I intended it to do. That I quite understand. The question is whether you may not succeed in giving offence to the wrong people. He shrugged his shoulders and put a torn-off petal between his teeth. I think you are mistaken, he said. The question is, for what purpose did your committee invite me to come here? I understood to expose and ridicule the Jesuits. I fulfill my obligation to the best of my ability. And I can assure you that no one has any doubt as to either the ability or the goodwill. What the committee fears is that the Liberal Party may take offence, and also that the town workmen may withdraw their moral support. You may have meant the pamphlet for an attack upon the San Fadid, but many readers will construe it as an attack upon the church and the new pope, and this, as a matter of political tactics, the committee does not consider desirable. I begin to understand. So long as I keep to the particular set of clerical gentlemen with whom the party is just now on bad terms, I may speak thus if the fancy takes me. But directly I touch upon the committee's own pet priests. Truth a dog must to nil. He must be whipped out. When the Holy Father may stand by the fire and Yes, the fool was right. I would rather be any kind of a thing than a fool. Of course, I must bow to the committee's decision, but I continue to think that it has paired its wit of both sides and left Monsignor Montanelli in the middle. Montanelli, Gemma repeated, I don't understand you. Do you mean the Bishop of Prisigella? Yes. The new Pope has just created him a cardinal. You know, I have a letter about him here. Would you care to hear it? The writer is a friend of mine. On the other side of the frontier. The papal frontier? Yes. This is what he writes. He took up the letter which had been in his hand when she entered and read aloud, suddenly beginning to stammer violently. You, you, you will so, so, soon have the p pleasure of me me meeting one of our w w worst enemies, C Cardinal Lorenzo M Montanelli, the b b Bishop of Prisigella, he, in t t he broke off, paused a moment, and began again. 
very slowly and drowling insufferably but no longer stammering he intends to visit Tuscany during the coming months on a mission of reconciliation he will preach first in florence where he will stay for about three weeks then will go on the siena and pisa and return to romagna by pistoia he ostensibly belongs to the liberal party in the church and is a personal friend of the pope and cardinal Ferretti. under gregory he was out of favor and was kept out of sight in a little hole in the apennine now he has come suddenly to the front really of course he is as much pulled by jesuit wires as any sanfedits in the country this mission was suggested by some of the jesuit fathers he is one of the most brilliant preachers in the church and as mischievous in his way as lambruschini himself his business is to keep the popular enthusiasm over the pope from subsiding and to occupy the public attention until the grand duke has signed a project which the agents of the jesuits are preparing to lay before him what this project is i have been unable to discover then further on it says whether montanelli understands for what purpose he is being sent to tuscany or whether the jesuits are playing on him i cannot make out he is either an uncommonly clever knave or the biggest ass that was ever folded the odd thing is that so far as i can discover he neither takes bribes nor keeps mistresses the first time i ever came across such a thing he laid down the letter and sat looking at her with half-shut eyes waiting apparently for her to speak are you satisfied that your informant is correct in his facts she asked after a moment as to the irreproachable character of monsignor montanelli's private life no but neither is he as you will observe he puts in the saving clause so far as i can, can discover i was not speaking of that she interposed coldly but of the part about this mission i can fully trust the writer he is an old friend of mine one of my comrades of forty-three and he is in a position which gives him exceptional opportunities for finding out things of that kind some official at the vatican thought gemma quickly so that's the kind of connections you have i guess there was something of that sort this letter is of course a private one the gadfly went on and you understand that the information is to be kept strictly to the members of your committee that hardly needs saying then about the pamphlet may i tell the committee that you consent to make a few alterations and soften it a little or that don't you think the alterations may succeed in spoiling the beauty of the literary composition signora as well as in reducing the vehemence of the tone you are asking my personal opinion what i have come here to express is that of the committee as a whole does that imply that you 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 disagree with the committee as a whole he had put the letter into his pocket and was now leaning forward and looking at her with an eager concentrated expression which quite changed the character of his face you think if you care to know what i personally think i disagree with the majority on both points i do not at all admire the pamphlet from a literary point of view and i do think it true as a presentation of facts and wise as a matter of tactics that is i quite agree with you that italy is being led away by the will of the wisp and that all this enthusiasm and rejoicing will probably land her in a terrible bog and i should be most heartily glad to have that openly and boldly said even at the cost of offending or alienating some of our present supporters but as a member of a body large majority of which holds the opposite view 
I cannot insist upon my personal opinion, and I certainly think that if things of that kind are to be said at all, they should be said temperately and quietly, not in the tone adopted in this pamphlet. Will you wait a minute while I look through the manuscript? He took it up and glanced down the pages. A dissatisfied frown settled on his face. Yes, of course, you are perfectly right. The thing's written like a café chantant skit, not a political satire. But what's a man to do? If I write decently, the public won't understand it. They will say it's dull if it isn't spiteful enough. Don't you think spitefulness manages to be dull when we get too much of it? He threw a keen, rabid glance at her and burst out laughing. <laughs> Apparently the signora belongs to the dreadful category of people who are always right. Then, if I yield to the temptation to be spiteful, I may come in time to be as dull as signora Grassini. Heavens, what a fate! No, you needn't frown. I know you don't like me, and I'm going to keep to business. What it comes to, then, is practically this. If I cut out the personalities and leave the essential part of the thing as it is, the committee will very much regret that they can't take the responsibility of printing it. If I cut out the political truths and make all the hard names apply to no one but the party's enemies, the committee will praise the thing up to the skies, and you and I will know it's not worth printing. Rather a nice point of metaphysics. Which is the more desirable condition, to be printed and not be worth it, or to be worth it and not be printed? Well, signora? I do not think you are tied to any such alternative. I believe that if you were to cut out the personalities, the committee will consent to print the pamphlet, though the majority would, of course, not agree with it, and I am convinced that it would be very useful. But you would have to lay aside the spitefulness. If you are going to say a thing, the substance of which is a big pill for your readers to swallow, there is no use in frightening them at the beginning by the form. He sighed and shrugged his shoulders resignedly. I submit, signora, but on one condition. If you rob me of my laugh now, I must have it out next time, when his eminence, the irreproachable cardinal, turns up in Florence. Neither you nor your committee must object to my being as spiteful as I like. It's my due. He spoke in his lightest, coldest manner, pulling the chrysanthemums out of their vase and holding them up toward the light through the translucent petals. What an unsteady hand he has, she thought, seeing how the flowers shook and quivered. Surely he doesn't drink. You had better discuss the matter with the other members of the committee, she said, rising. I cannot form any opinion as to what they will think about it. And you? He had risen too and was leaning against the table, pressing the flowers to his face. She hesitated. The question distressed her, bringing up an old and miserable association. I hardly know, she said at last. Many years ago, I used to know something about Monsignor Montanelli. He was only a canon at that time and director of the theological seminary in the province where I lived as a girl. I heard a great deal about him from someone who knew him very intimately, and I never heard anything of him that wasn't good. I believe that, in those days at least, he was really a most remarkable man. But that was long ago, and he may have changed irresponsible power corrupts so many people the gadfly raised his head from the flowers and looked at her with a steady face at any rate he said if monsignor montanelli is not himself a scoundrel he is at all in scoundrelly hands it is all one to me which he is 
and to my friends across the frontier. A stone in the path may have the best intentions, but it must be kicked out of the path for all that. Allow me, signora. He rang the bell and, limping to the door, opened it for her to pass out. It was very kind of you to call, signora. May I send for a vettura? No? Good afternoon, then. Bianca, open the hall door, please. Gemma went out into the street, pondering anxiously. My friends across the frontier? Who were they? And how was the stone to be kicked out of the paws? If with satire only, why had he said it with such dangerous eyes? End of chapter 3 of the second part Recording by Sarah Hale Part 2 Chapter 4 of The Cat Fly this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich Part 2 Chapter 4 Monsignor Montanelli arrived in Florence in the first week of October. His visit caused a little flutter of excitement throughout the town. He was a famous preacher and a representative of the Reform Papacy, and people looked eagerly to him for an exposition of the new doctrine, the gospel of love and reconciliation, which was to cure the sorrows of Italy. The nomination of Cardinal Gizzi to the Roman State Secretaryship in place of the universally detested Lambruschini, had raised the public enthusiasm to its highest pitch, and Montanelli was just the man who could most easily sustain it. The irreproachable strictness of his life was a phenomenon sufficiently rare among the high dignitaries of the Roman Church to attract the attention of people accustomed to regard blackmailing, peculation, and disreputable intrigues as almost invariable adjuncts to the career of a prelate. Moreover, his talent as a preacher was really great, and with his beautiful voice and magnetic personality, he would, in any time and place, have made his mark. Grassini, as usual, strained every nerve to get the newly arrived celebrity to his house, but Montanelli was no easy game to catch. To all invitations, he replied with the same courteous but positive refusal, saying that his health was bad and his time fully occupied, and that he had neither strength nor leisure for going into society. What omnivorous creatures those Grassinis are! Marcini said contemptuously to Gemma as they crossed the Signoria Square one bright, cold Sunday morning. Did you notice the way Grassini bowed when the cardinal's carriage drove up? It's all one to them who a man is, so long as he's talked about. I never saw such lion hunters in my life. Only last August it was the gadfly. Now it's Montanelli. I hope his eminence feels flattered at the attention. A precious lot of adventurers have shared it with him. They had been hearing Montanelli preach in the cathedral, and the great building had been so thronged with eager listeners that Martini, fearing a return of Gemma's troublesome headaches, had persuaded her to come away before the mass was over. The sunny morning, the first after a week of rain, offered him an excuse for suggesting a walk among the garden slopes by San Nicolo. No, she answered, I should like a walk if you have time, but not to the hills. Let us keep along the Longarno. Montanelli will pass on his way back from church, and I'm like Rossini. I want to see the notability. But you have just seen him. Not close. There was such a crush in the cathedral, and his back was turned to us when the carriage paused. If we keep near to the bridge, 
we shall be sure to see him well he's staying on the lungarno you know but what has given you such a sudden fancy to see montanelli you never used to care about famous preachers it is not famous preachers it is the man himself i want to see how much he has changed since i saw him last when was that two days after arthur's death martini glanced at her anxiously they had come out on to the lungarno and she was staring absently across the water with a look on her face that he hated to see gemma dear he said after a moment are you going to let that miserable business haunt you all your life we have all made mistakes when we were seventeen we have not all killed our dearest friend when we were seventeen she answered wearily and leaning her arm on the stone balustrade of the bridge looked down into the river martini held his tongue he was almost afraid to speak to her when this mood was on her i never look down at water without remembering she said slowly raising her eyes to his then with a nervous little shiver let us walk on a bit chaisery it is chilly for standing they crossed the bridge in silence and walked on along the river side after a few minutes she spoke again what a beautiful voice that man has there is something about it that i have never heard in any other human voice i believe it is the secret of half his influence it is a wonderful voice martini ascended catching at a subject of conversation which might lead her away from the dreadful memory called up by the river and he is apart from his voice about the finest preacher i have ever heard but i believe the secret of his influence lies deeper than that it is the way his life stands out from that of almost all the other prelates i don't know whether you could lay your hand on one other high dignitary in all the italian church except the pope himself whose reputation is so utterly spotless i remember when i was in the romagna last year passing through his diocese and seeing those fierce mountaineers waiting in the rain to get a glimpse of him or touch his dress he is venerated there almost as a saint and that means a good deal among the romagnols who generally hate everything that wears a cassock i remarked to one of the old peasants as typical a smuggler as ever i saw in my life that the people seemed very much devoted to their bishop and he said we don't love bishops they are liars we love monsignor montanelli nobody has ever known him to tell a lie or do an unjust thing i wonder gemma said half to herself if he knows the people think that about him why shouldn't he know it do you think it is not true i know it is not true how do you know it because he told me so he told you montanelli gemma what do you mean she pushed the hair back from her forehead and turned towards him they were standing still again he leaning on the palustrade and she slowly drawing lines on the pavement with the point of her umbrella chaisery you and i have been friends for all these years and i have never told you what really happened about arthur there is no need to tell me dear he broke in hastily i know all about it already giovanni told you yes when he was dying he told me about it one night when i was sitting up with him he said gemma dear i had better tell you the truth now we have begun talking about it he said that you were always brooding over that wretched story 
and he begged me to be as good a friend to you as I could, and try to keep you from thinking of it. And I have tried to, dear, though I may not have succeeded. I have indeed. I know you have, she answered softly, raising her eyes for a moment. I should have been badly off without your friendship, but Giovanni did not tell you about Monsignor Montanelli then? No, I didn't know that he had anything to do with it. What he told me was about all that affair with the spy and about about my striking Arthur and his drowning himself. Well, I will tell you about Montanelli. They turned back towards the bridge over which the cardinal's carriage would have to pass. Gemma looked out steadily across the water as she spoke. In those days, Montanelli was a canon. He was director of the theological seminary at Pisa and used to give Arthur lessons in philosophy and read with him after he went up to the Sapienza. They were perfectly devoted to each other more like two lovers than teacher and pupil. Arthur almost worshipped the ground that Montanelli walked on, and I remember his once telling me that if he lost his padre, he always used to call Montanelli so, he should go and drown himself. Well then, you know what happened about the spy. The next day, my father and the Burtons, Arthur's stepbrothers, most detestable people, spent the whole day dragging the Darcena basin for the body, and I sat in my room, alone, and thought of what I had done. She paused a moment and went on again. Late in the evening, my father came into my room and said, Gemma, child, come downstairs. There is a man I want you to see. And when we went down, there was one of the students belonging to the group sitting in the consulting room, all white and shaking, and he told us about Giovanni's second letter coming from the prison to say they had heard from the jailer about Cardi and that Arthur had been tricked in the confessional. I remember the student saying to me, It is at least some consolation that we know he was innocent. My father held my hands and tried to comfort me. He didn't know then about the blow. Then I went back to my room and sat there all night alone. In the morning, my father went out again with the Burtons to see the harbour dragged. They had some hope of finding the body there. It was never found, was it? No. It must have got washed out to sea, but they thought there was a chance. I was alone in my room, and the servant came up to say that El Verendissimo Padre had called, and she had told him my father was at the docks, and he had gone away. I knew it must be Montanelli, so I ran out at the back door and caught him up at the garden gate. When I said, Can you Montanelli? I want to speak to you. He just stopped and waited silently for me to speak. Oh, Cesare, if you had seen his face, it haunted me for months afterwards. I said, I am Dr. Wong's daughter, and I have come to tell you that it is I who have killed Arthur. I told him everything and he stood and listened like a figure cut in stone till i had finished then he said set your heart at rest my child it is i that am a murderer not you i deceived him and he found it out and with that he turned and went out at the gate without another word and then? I don't know what happened to him after that. I heard the same evening that he had fallen down in the street in a kind of fit and had been carried into a house near the docks, but that is all I know. 
my father did everything he could for me when i told him about it he threw up his practice and took me away to england at once so that i should never hear anything that could remind me he was afraid i should end in the water too and indeed i believe i was near it at one time but then you know when we found out that my father had cancer i was obliged to come to myself there was no one else to nurse him and after he died i was left with the little ones on my hands until my elder brother was able to give them a home then there was giovanni do you know when he came to england we were almost afraid to meet each other with that frightful memory between us he was so bitterly remorseful for his share in it all that unhappy letter he wrote from prison but i believe really it was our common trouble that drew us together martini smiled and shook his head it may have been so on your side he said but giovanni had made up his mind from the first time he ever saw you i remember his coming back to milan after that first visit to leghorn and raving about you to me till i was perfectly sick of hearing of the english gemma i thought i should hate you aha there it comes the carriage crossed the bridge and drove up to a large house on the Longarno. montanelli was leaning back on the cushions as if too tired to care any longer for the enthusiastic crowd which had collected round the door to catch a glimpse of him the inspired look that his face had worn in the cathedral had faded quite away and the sunlight showed the lines of care and fatigue when he had alighted and paused with the heavy spiritless tread of weary and heart-sick old age into the house gemma turned away and walked slowly to the bridge her face seemed for a moment to reflect the withered hopeless look of his martini walked beside her in silence i have so often wondered she began again after a little pause what he meant about the deception it has sometimes occurred to me yes well it is very strange there was the most extraordinary personal resemblance between them between whom arthur and montanelli it was not only i who noticed it and there was something mysterious in the relationship between the members of that household mrs burton arthur's mother was one of the sweetest women i ever knew her face had the same spiritual look as arthur's and i believe they were alike in character too but she always seemed half frightened like a detected criminal and her stepson's wife used to treat her as no decent person treats a dog and then arthur himself was such a startling contrast to all those vulgar burtons of course when one is a child one takes everything for granted but looking back on it afterwards i have often wondered whether arthur was really a burton possibly he found out something about his mother that may easily have been the cause of his death not the cardi affair at all martini interposed offering the only consolation he could think of at the moment gemma shook her head if you could have seen his face after i struck him cesare you would not think that it may be all true about montanelli very likely it is but what i have done i have done they walked on a little way without speaking my dear martini said at last if there were any way on earth to undo a thing that is once done it would be worth while to brood over our old mistakes but as it is let the dead bury their dead it is a terrible story but at least 
the poor lad is out of it now and luckier than some of those that are left the ones that are in exile and in prison you and i have them to think of we have no right to eat out our hearts for the dead remember what your own shelley says the past is death the future is thine own take it while it is still yours and fix your mind not on what you may have done long ago to her but on what you can do now to help in his earnestness he had taken her hand he dropped it suddenly and drew back at the sound of a soft cold drowling voice behind him monsignor montanelli murmured his languid voice is undoubtedly all you say my dear doctor in fact he appears to be so much too good for this world that he ought to be politely escorted into the next i am sure he would cause as great a sensation there as he has done here there are but, but probably many old established ghosts who have never seen such a thing as an honest cardinal and there is nothing that ghosts love as they do novelties how do you know that asked dr ricardo's voice in a tone of ill-suppressed irritation from holy writ my dear sir if the gospel is to be trusted even the most respectable of all ghosts had a fa fa fancy for capricious alliances now honesty and ca ca cardinals that seems to me a somewhat capricious alliance and rather uncomfortable one like shrimps and licorice ah signora martini and signora bola lovely weather after the rain is it not have you been to hear the n new savonarola too martini turned round sharply the gadfly was a cigar in his mouth and a hot house flower in his buttonhole was holding out to him a slender carefully gloved hand with the sunlight reflected in his immaculate boots and glancing back from the water on to his smiling face he looked to martini less lame and more conceited than usual they were shaking hands affably on one side and rather sulkily on the other when ricardo hastily exclaimed i'm afraid signora bola is not well she was so pale that her face looked almost livid under the shadow of her bonnet and the ribbon at her throat fluttered perceptibly from the violent beating of the heart i will go home she said faintly a cab was called and martini got in with her to see her safely home as the gadfly bent down to arrange her cloak which was hanging over the wheel he raised his eyes suddenly to her face and martini saw that she shrank away with a look of something like terror gemma what is the matter with you he asked in english when they had started what did that scoundrel say to you nothing Cesare. it was no fault of his i i had a fright a fright yes i fancied she put one hand over her eyes and he waited silently till she could recover her self-command her face was already regaining its natural color you are quite right she said at last turning to him and speaking in her usual voice it is worse than useless to look back at a horrible past it plays tricks with one's nerves and makes one imagine all sorts of impossible things we will never talk about that subject again cesare or i shall see fantastic likenesses to arthur in every face i meet this kind of hallucination like a nightmare in broad daylight just now when that odious little fob came up i fancied it was arthur end of chapter four of the second part recording by sarah hale
Part two, chapter five of the Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Hoynich. Part two, chapter five the gadfly certainly knew how to make personal enemies he had arrived in florence in august and by the end of october three-fourths of the committee which had invited him shared martini's opinion his savage attacks upon montanelli had annoyed even his admirers and galli himself who at first had been inclined to uphold everything the witty satirist said or did began to acknowledge with an aggrieved air that montanelli had better have been left in peace decent cardinals are none so plenty one might treat them politely when they do turn up the only person who apparently remained quite indifferent to the storm of caricatures and posquinades was montanelli himself it seemed as martini said hardly worth while to expend one's energy in ridiculing a man who took it so good-humouredly it was said in the town that montanelli one day when the archbishop of florence was dining with him had found in the room one of the gadfly's bitter personal lampoons against himself had read it through and handed the paper to the archbishop remarking that is rather cleverly put is it not one day there appeared in the town a leaflet headed the mystery of the annunciation even had the author omitted his now familiar signature a sketch of a gadfly with spread wings the bitter trenchant style would have left in the minds of most readers no doubt as to his identity the skit was in the form of a dialogue between tuscany as the virgin mary and montanelli as the angel who bearing the lilies of purity and crowned with the olive branch of peace was announcing the advent of the jesuits the whole thing was full of offensive personal allusions and hints of the most risky nature and all florence felt the satire to be both ungenerous and unfair and yet all florence laughed there was something so irresistible in the gadfly's grave absurdities that those who most disapproved of and disliked him laughed as immoderately at all his squibs as did his warmest partisans repulsive in tone as the leaflet was it left its trace upon the popular feeling of the town montanelli's personal reputation stood too high for any lampoon however witty seriously to injure it but for a moment the tide almost turned against him the gadfly had known where to sting and though eager crowds still collected before the cardinal's house to see him enter or leave his carriage ominous cries of jesuit and sanfedist spy often mingled with the cheers and benedictions but montanelli had no lack of supporters two days after the publication of the skit the churchman a leading clerical paper brought out a brilliant article called an answer to the mystery of the annunciation and signed a son of the church it was an impassioned defence of montanelli against the gadflies slanderous imputations the anonymous writer after expounding with great eloquence and fervor the doctrine of peace on earth and good will towards men of which the new pontiff was the evangelist concluded by challenging the gadfly to prove a single one of his assertions and solemnly appealing to the public not to believe a contemptible slanderer both the cogency of the article as a bit of special pleading and its merit as a literary composition were sufficiently far above the average to attract much attention in the town especially as not even the editor of the newspaper could guess the author's identity 
the article was soon reprinted separately in pamphlet form and the anonymous defender was discussed in every coffee-shop in florence the gadfly responded with a violent attack on the new pontificate and all its supporters especially on montanelli who he cautiously hinted had probably consented to the panegyric on himself to this the anonymous defender again replied in the churchman with an indignant denial during the rest of montanelli's stay the controversy raging between the two writers occupied more of the public attention than did even the famous preacher himself some members of the liberal party ventured to remonstrate with the gadfly about the unnecessary malice of his tone towards montanelli but they did not get much satisfaction out of him he only smiled affably and answered with a languid little stammer er really gentlemen you are rather unfair i expressly stipulated when i gave in to signora bolla that i should be allowed a l little chuckle all to myself now it is so nominated in the bond at the end of october montanelli returned to his see in the romagna and before leaving florence preached a farewell sermon in which he spoke of the controversy gently deprecating the vehemence of both writers and begging his unknown defender to set an example of tolerance by closing a useless and unseemly war of words on the following day the churchman contained a notice that at monsignor montanelli's publicly expressed desire a son of the church would withdraw from the controversy the last word remained with the gadfly he issued a little leaflet in which he declared himself disarmed and converted by montanelli's christian meekness and ready to weep tears of reconciliation upon the neck of the first sanfedist he met i am even willing he concluded to embrace my anonymous challenger himself and if my readers knew as his eminence and i know what that implies and why he remains anonymous they would believe in the sincerity of my conversion in the latter part of november he announced to the literary committee that he was going for a fortnight's holiday to the seaside he went apparently to leghorn but dr ricardo going there soon after and wishing to speak to him searched the town for him in vain on the fifth of december a political demonstration of the most extreme character burst out in the states of the church along the whole chain of the apennines and people began to guess the reason of the gadfly's sudden fancy to take his holidays in the depth of winter he came back to florence when the riots had been quelled and meeting ricardo in the street remarked affably i hear you were inquiring for me in leghorn i was staying in pisa what a pretty old town it is there's something quite arcadian about it in christmas week he attended an afternoon meeting of the literary committee which was held in dr ricardo's lodgings near the porta alla croce the meeting was a full one and when he came in a little late with an apologetic bow and smile there seemed to be no seat empty ricardo rose to fetch a chair from the next room but the gadfly stopped him don't trouble about it he said i shall be quite comfortable here and crossing the room to a window beside which gemma had placed her chair he sat down on the sill leaning his head indolently back against the shutter as he looked down at gemma smiling with half-shut eyes in the subtle sphinx-like way that gave him the look of a leonardo da vinci portrait the instinctive distrust with which he inspired her deepened into a sense of unreasoning fear the proposal under discussion was that a pamphlet be issued setting forth the committee's views on the dearth with which tuscany was threatened and the measures which should be taken to meet it 
the matter was a somewhat difficult one to decide because as usual the committee's views upon the subject were much divided the more advanced section to which gemma martini and riccardo belonged was in favor of an energetic appeal to both government and public to take adequate measures at once for the relief of the peasantry the moderate division including of course grassini feared that an over-emphatic tone might irritate rather than convince the ministry it is all very well gentlemen to want the people helped at once he said looking round upon the red-hot radicals with his calm and pitying air we most of us want a good many things that we are not likely to get but if we start with the tone you propose to adopt the government is very likely not to begin any relief measures at all till there is actual famine if we could only induce the ministry to make an inquiry into the state of the crops it would be a step in advance galley in his corner by the stove jumped up to answer his enemy a step in advance yes my dear sir but if there's going to be a famine it won't wait for us to advance at that pace the people might all starve before we got to any actual relief it would be interesting to know Sacconi began but several voices interrupted him speak up we can't hear i should think not with such an infernal row in the street said galley irritably is that window shut riccardo one can't hear oneself speak gemma looked around yes she said the window is quite shut i think there is a variety show or some such thing passing the sounds of shouting and laughter of the tinkling of bells and trampling of feet resounded from the street below mixed with the braying of a villainous brass band and the unmerciful banging of a drum it can't be helped these few days said riccardo we must expect noise at christmas time what were you saying Sacconi? i said it would be interesting to hear what is thought about the matter in pisa and leghorn perhaps signor riveras can tell us something he has just come from there the gadfly did not answer he was staring out of the window and appeared not to have heard what had been said signor riveras said gemma she was the only person sitting near to him and as he remained silent she bent forward and touched him on the arm he slowly turned his face to her and she started as she saw its fixed and awful immobility for a moment it was like the face of a corpse then the lips moved in a strange lifeless way yes he whispered a variety show her first instinct was to shield him from the curiosity of the others without understanding what was the matter with him she realized that some frightful fancy or hallucination had seized upon him and that for a moment he was at its mercy body and soul she rose quickly and standing between him and the company threw the window open as if to look out no one but herself had seen his face in the street a travelling circus was passing with mountebanks on donkeys and harlequins in party-coloured dresses the crowd of holiday masqueraders laughing and shoving was exchanging jests and showers of paper ribbon with the clowns and flinging little bags of sugar plums to the columbine who sat in her car tricked out in tinsel and feathers with artificial curls on her forehead and an artificial smile on her painted lips behind the car came a motley string of figures street arabs beggars clowns turning somersaults and costermongers hawking their wares they were jostling pelting and applauding a figure which at first gemma could not see for the pushing and swaying of the crowd the next moment however she saw plainly what it was a hunchback dwarfish and ugly grotesquely attired in a fool's dress with paper cap and bells 
he evidently belonged to the strolling company and was amusing the crowd with hideous grimaces and contortions what is going on out there asked ricardo approaching the window you seem very much interested he was a little surprised at their keeping the whole committee waiting to look at a strolling company of mountebanks gemma turned round it is nothing interesting she said only a variety show but they made such a noise that i thought it must be something else she was standing with one hand upon the window-sill and suddenly felt the gadfly's cold fingers press the hand with a passionate clasp thank you he whispered softly and then closing the window sat down again upon the sill i am afraid he said in his airy manner that i have interrupted you gentlemen i was looking at the variety show it is s such a p pretty sight sacconi was asking you a question said martini gruffly the gadfly's behavior seemed to him an absurd piece of affectation and he was annoyed that gemma should have been tactless enough to follow his example it was not like her the gadfly disclaimed all knowledge of the state of feeling in pisa explaining that he had been there only on a holiday he then plunged at once into an animated discussion first of agricultural prospects then of the pamphlet question and continued pouring out a flood of stammering talk till the others were quite tired he seemed to find some feverish delight in the sound of his own voice when the meeting ended and the members of the committee rose to go ricardo came up to martini will you stop to dinner with me fabrizi and sacconi have promised to stay thanks but i was going to see signora bola home are you really afraid i can't get home by myself she asked rising and putting on her wrap of course he will stay with you dr ricardo it's good for him to get a change he doesn't go out half enough if you will allow me i will see you home the gadfly interposed i am going in that direction if you really are going that way i suppose you won't have time to drop in here in the course of the evening will you riveras asked ricardo as he opened the door for them the gadfly looked back over his shoulder laughing i my dear fellow i'm going to see the variety show what a strange creature that is and what an odd affection for mountebanks said ricardo coming back to his visitors case of a fellow feeling i should think said martini the man's a mountebank himself if ever i saw one i wish i could think he was only that fabrizi interposed with a grave face if he is a mountebank i am afraid he's a very dangerous one dangerous in what way well i don't like these mysterious little pleasure trips that he is so fond of taking this is the third time you know and i don't believe he has been in pisa at all i suppose it is almost an open secret that it's into the mountains he goes said sacconi he has hardly taken the trouble to deny that he is still in relations with the smugglers he got to know in the savino affair and it's quite natural he should take advantage of their friendship to get his leaflets across the papal frontier for my part said ricardo what i wanted to talk to you about is this very question it occurred to me that we could hardly do better than ask rivera's to undertake the management of our own smuggling that press at pistoia is very inefficiently managed to my thinking and the way the leaflets are taken across always rolled in those everlasting cigars is more than primitive it has answered pretty well up till now said martini contumaciously he was getting wearied of hearing golly and ricardo always putting the gadfly forward as a model to copy and inclined to think that the world had gone well enough before this lackadaisical buccaneer turned up to set every one to rights it has answered so far well that we have been satisfied with it for want of anything better 
but you know there have been plenty of arrests and confiscations now i believe that if rivera's undertook the business for us there would be less of that why do you think so in the first place the smugglers look upon us as strangers to do business with or as sheep to fleece whereas riveras is their personal friend very likely their leader whom they look up to and trust you may be sure every smuggler in the apennines will do for a man who is in the savino revolt that he will not do for us in the next place there's hardly a man among us that knows the mountains as riveras does remember he has been a fugitive among them and knows the smugglers paths by heart no smuggler would dare to cheat him even if he wished to and no smuggler could cheat him if he dared to try then is your proposal that we should ask him to take over the whole management of our literature on the other side of the frontier distribution addresses hiding places everything or simply that we should ask him to put the things across for us well as for addresses and hiding places he probably knows already all the ones that we have and a good many more that we have not i don't suppose we should be able to teach him much in that line as for distribution it's as the others prefer of course the important question to my mind is the actual smuggling itself once the books are safe in bologna it's a comparatively simple matter to circulate them for my part said martini i am against the plan in the first place all this about his skilfulness is mere conjecture we have not actually seen him engaged in frontier work and do not know whether he keeps his head in critical moments oh you needn't have any doubt of that riccardo put in the history of the savino affair proves that he keeps his head and then martini went on i do not feel at all inclined from what little i know of rivera's to entrust him with all the party's secrets he seems to me feather-brained and theatrical to give the whole management of a party's contraband work into a man's hands is a serious matter fabrizi what do you think if i had only such objections as yours martini replied the professor i should certainly waive them in the case of a man really possessing as rivera's undoubtedly does all the qualifications ricardo speaks of for my part i have not the slightest doubt as to either his courage his honesty or his presence of mind and that he knows both mountains and mountaineers we have had ample proof but there is another objection i do not feel sure that it is only for the smuggling of pamphlets he goes into the mountains i have begun to doubt whether he has not another purpose this is of course entirely between ourselves it is a mere suspicion it seems to me just possible that he is in connection with some one of the sects and perhaps with the most dangerous of them which one do you mean the red girdles no the occultellatori the knifers but that is a little body of outlaws peasants most of them with neither education nor political experience so were the insurgents of savino but they had a few educated men as leaders and this little society may have the same and remember it's pretty well known that most of the members of those more violent sects in romagna are survivors of the savino affair who found themselves too weak to fight the churchmen in open insurrection and so have fallen back on assassination their hands are not strong enough for guns and they take to knives instead but what makes you suppose riveras to be connected with them i don't suppose i merely suspect in any case i think we had better find out for certain before we entrust our smuggling to him if he attempted to do both kinds of work at once he would injure our party most terribly he would simply destroy its reputation and accomplish nothing however 
we will talk of that another time i wanted to speak to you about the news from rome it is said that a commission is to be appointed to draw up a project for a municipal constitution end of chapter five of the second part part two chapter six of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina the gadfly by ethel lillian voynich part two chapter six Gemma and the gadfly walked silently along the Lungiarno. His feverish talkativeness seemed to have quite spent itself. He had hardly spoken a word since they left Ricardo's door, and Gemma was heartily glad of his silence. She always felt embarrassed in his company, and today more so than usual, for his strange behavior at the committee meeting had greatly perplexed her by the uffizi palace he suddenly stopped and turned to her are you tired no why nor especially busy this evening no i want to ask a favor of you i want you to come for a walk with me where to nowhere in particular anywhere you like but what for he hesitated i can't tell you at least it's very difficult but please come if you can he raised his eyes suddenly from the ground and she saw how strange their expression was there is something the matter with you she said gently he pulled a leaf from the flower in his buttonhole and began tearing it to pieces who was it that he was so oddly like someone who had that same trick of the fingers and hurried nervous gesture i am in trouble he said looking down at his hands and speaking in a hardly audible voice i don't want to be alone this evening will you come yes certainly unless you would rather go to my lodgings no come and dine with me at a restaurant there's one on the signoria please don't refuse now you've promised they went into a restaurant where he ordered dinner but hardly touched his own share and remained obstinately silent crumbling the bread over the cloth and fidgeting with the fringe of his table napkin gemma felt thoroughly uncomfortable and began to wish she had refused to come the silence was growing awkward yet she could not begin to make small talk with a person who seemed to have forgotten her presence at last he looked up and said abruptly would you like to see the variety show she stared at him in astonishment what had he got into his head about variety shows have you ever seen one he asked before she had time to speak no i don't think so i didn't suppose they were interesting they are very interesting i don't think anyone can study the life of the people without seeing them let us go back to the porta alla croce when they arrived the mountebanks had set up their tent beside the town gate and an abominable scraping of fiddles and banging of drums announced that the performance had begun the entertainment was of the roughest kind a few clowns harlequins and acrobats a circus rider jumping through hoops the painted columbine and the hunchback performing various dull and foolish antics represented the entire force of the company the jokes were not on the whole coarse or offensive but they were very tame and stale and there was a depressing flatness about the whole thing the audience laughed and clapped from their innate tuscan courtesy but the only part which they seemed really to enjoy was the performance of the hunchback in which gemma could find nothing either witty or skilful it was merely a series of grotesque and hideous contortions which the spectators mimicked holding up children on their shoulders that the little ones might see the ugly man signor rivera's 
do you really think this attractive said Gemma, turning to the gadfly who was standing beside her his arm around one of the wooden posts of the tent it seems to me she broke off and remained looking at him silently except when she had stood with montanelli at the garden gate in leghorn she had never seen a human face express such fathomless hopeless misery she thought of dante's hell as she watched him presently the hunchback receiving a kick from one of the clowns turned a somersault and tumbled in a grotesque heap outside the ring a dialogue between two clowns began and the gadfly seemed to wake out of a dream shall we go he asked or would you like to see more i would rather go they left the tent and walked across the dark green to the river for a few moments neither spoke what did you think of the show the gadfly asked presently i thought it rather a dreary business and part of it seemed to me positively unpleasant which part well all those grimaces and contortions they are simply ugly there is nothing clever about them do you mean the hunchback's performance remembering his peculiar sensitiveness on the subject of his own physical defects she had avoided mentioning this particular bit of the entertainment but now that he had touched upon the subject himself she answered yes i did not like that part at all that was the part the people enjoyed most i dare say and that is just the worst thing about it because it was inartistic N no it was all inartistic i meant because it was cruel he smiled cruel do you mean to the hunchback i mean of course the man himself was quite indifferent no doubt it is to him just a way of getting a living like the circus rider's way or the columbines but the thing makes one feel unhappy it is humiliating it is the degradation of a human being he probably is not any more degraded than he was to start with most of us are degraded in one way or another yes but this i dare say you will think it an absurd prejudice but a human body to me is a sacred thing i don't like to see it treated irreverently and made hideous and a human soul he had stopped short and was standing with one hand on the stone balustrade of the embankment looking straight at her a soul she repeated stopping in her turn to look at him in wonder he flung out both hands with a sudden passionate gesture has it never occurred to you that that miserable clown may have a soul a living struggling human soul tied down into that crooked hulk of a body and forced to slave for it you that are so tender-hearted to everything you that pity the body in its fool's dress and bells have you never thought of the wretched soul that has not even motley to cover its horrible nakedness think of it shivering with cold stilled with shame and misery before all those people feeling their jeers that cut like a whip their laughter that burns like red-hot iron on a bare flesh think of it looking around so helpless before them all for the mountains that will not fall on it for the rocks that have not the heart to cover it envying the rats that can creep into some hole in the earth and hide and remember that a soul is dumb it has no voice to cry out it must endure and endure and endure oh i'm talking nonsense why on earth don't you laugh you have no sense of humor slowly and in dead silence she turned and walked on along the riverside during the whole evening it had not once occurred to her to connect his trouble whatever it might be with the variety show and now that some dim picture of his inner life had been revealed to her by this sudden outburst she could not find in her overwhelming pity for him one word to say he walked on beside her with his head turned away and looked into the water i want you please to understand he began suddenly 
turning to her with a defiant air that everything i have just been saying to you is pure imagination i'm rather given to romancing but i don't like people to take it seriously she made no answer and they walked on in silence as they passed by the gateway of the uffizi he crossed the road and stooped down over a dark bundle that was lying against the railings what is the matter little one he asked more gently than she had ever heard him speak why don't you go home the bundle moved and answered something in a low moaning voice gemma came across to look and saw a child of about six years old ragged and dirty crouching on the pavement like a frightened animal the gadfly was bending down with his hand on the unkempt head what is it he said stooping lower to catch the unintelligible answer you ought to go home to bed little boys have no business out of doors at night you'll be quite frozen give me your hand and jump up like a man where do you live he took the child's arm to raise him the result was a sharp scream and a quick shrinking away why what is it the gadfly asked kneeling down on the pavement ah oh, signora look here the child's shoulder and jacket were covered with blood tell me what has happened the gadfly went on caressingly it wasn't a fall was it no someone's been beating you i thought so who was it my uncle oh yes and when was it this morning he was drunk and i-i and you got in his way was that it you shouldn't get in people's way when they are drunk little man they don't like it what shall we do with this poor mite signora come here to the light sonny and let me look at that shoulder put your arm round my neck i won't hurt you there we are he lifted the boy in his arms and carrying him across the street set him down on the wide stone balustrade then taking out a pocket knife he deftly ripped up the torn sleeve supporting the child's head against his breast while gemma held the injured arm the shoulder was badly bruised and grazed and there was a deep gash on the arm that's an ugly cut to give a mite like you said the gadfly fastening his handkerchief round the wound to prevent the jacket from rubbing against it what did he do it with the shovel i went to ask him to give me a soldo to get some polenta at the corner shop and he hit me with a shovel the gadfly shuddered ah he said softly that hurts doesn't it little one he hit me with the shovel and i ran away i ran away because he hit me and you've been wandering about ever since without any dinner instead of answering the child began to sob violently the gadfly lifted him off the balustrade there there we'll soon set all that straight i wonder if we can get a cab anywhere i'm afraid they'll all be waiting by the theatre there's a grand performance going on to-night i am sorry to drag you about so signora but i would rather come with you you may want help do you think you can carry him so far isn't he very heavy oh i can manage thank you at the theatre door they found only a few cabs waiting and these were all engaged the performance was over and most of the audience had gone zita's name was printed in large letters on the wall placards she had been dancing in the ballet asking gemma to wait for him a moment the gadfly went round to the performer's entrance and spoke to an attendant has madame rene gone yet no sir the man answered staring blankly at the spectacle of a well-dressed gentleman carrying a ragged street child in his arms madame rene is just coming out i think her carriage is waiting for her yes there she comes zita descended the stairs leaning on the arm of a young cavalry officer she looked superbly handsome with an opera cloak of flame-colored velvet thrown over her evening dress 
and a great fan of ostrich plumes hanging from her waist in the entry she stopped short and drawing her hand away from the officer's arm approached the gadfly in amazement felice she exclaimed under her breath what have you got there i have picked up this child in the street it is hurt and starving and i want to get it home as quickly as possible there is not a cab to be got anywhere so i want to have your carriage felice you are not going to take a horrid beggar child into your rooms send for a policeman and let him carry it to the refuge or whatever is the proper place for it you can't have all the paupers in the town it is hurt the gadfly repeated it can go to the refuge to-morrow if necessary but i must see to the child first and give it some food zita made a little grimace of disgust you've got its head right against your shirt how can you it is dirty the gadfly looked up with a sudden flash of anger it is hungry he said fiercely you don't know what that means do you signor riveras interposed gemma coming forward my lodgings are quite close let us take the child in there then if you cannot find a vettura i will manage to put it up for the night he turned round quickly you don't mind of course not good night madame rene the gypsy with a stiff bow and an angry shrug of her shoulders took her officer's arm again and gathering up the train of her dress swept past them to the contested carriage i will send it back to fetch you and the child if you like monsieur riveras she said pausing on the doorstep very well i will give the address he came out on to the pavement gave the address to the driver and walked back to gemma with his burden katie was waiting up for her mistress and on hearing what had happened ran for warm water and other necessaries placing the child on a chair the gadfly knelt down beside him and deftly slipping off the ragged clothing bathed and bandaged the wound with tender skilful hands he had just finished washing the boy and was wrapping him in a warm blanket when gemma came in with a tray in her hands is your patient ready for his supper she asked smiling at the strange little figure i have been cooking it for him the gadfly stood up and rolled the dirty rags together i'm afraid we have made a terrible mess in your room he said as for these they had better go straight into the fire and i will buy him some new clothes to-morrow have you any brandy in the house signora i think he ought to have a little i will just wash my hands if you will allow me when the child had finished his supper he immediately went to sleep in the gadfly's arms with his rough head against the white shirt front gemma who had been helping katie to set the disordered room tidy again sat down at the table signor riveras you must take something before you go home you had hardly had any dinner and it's very late i should like a cup of tea in the english fashion if you have it i'm sorry to keep you up so late oh that doesn't matter put the child down on the sofa he will tire you wait a minute i will just lay a sheet over the cushions what are you going to do with him to-morrow find out whether he has any other relations except that drunken brute and if not i suppose i must follow madame renee's advice and take him to the refuge perhaps the kindest thing to do would be to put a stone round his neck and pitch him into the river there but that would expose me to unpleasant consequences fast asleep what an odd little lump of ill luck you are you might not half as capable of defending yourself as a stray cat when katie brought in the tea-tray the boy opened his eyes and sat up with a bewildered air recognizing the gadfly whom he had already regarded as his natural protector he wriggled off the sofa and much encumbered by the folds of his blanket came up to nestle against him he was by now sufficiently revived to be inquisitive 
and pointing to the mutilated left hand in which the gadfly was holding a piece of cake asked what's that that cake do you want some i think you've had enough for now wait till tomorrow, little man no that he stretched out his hand and touched the stumps of the amputated fingers and the great scar on the wrist the gadfly put down his cake oh that it's the same sort of thing as what you have on your shoulder a hit i got from someone stronger than i was didn't it hurt awfully oh i don't know not more than other things there now go to sleep again you have no business asking questions at this time of night when the carriage arrived the boy was again asleep and the gadfly without awaking him lifted him gently and carried him out on to the stairs you have been a sort of ministering angel to me to-day he said to gemma pausing at the door but i suppose that need not prevent us from quarrelling to our heart's content in future i have no desire to quarrel with any one oh but i have life would be unendurable without quarrels a good quarrel is the salt of the earth it's better than a variety show and with that he went downstairs laughing softly to himself with the sleeping child in his arms End of chapter 6 of part 2part two chapter seven of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina the gadfly by ethel lillian voynich part two chapter seven one day in the first week of january martini who had sent round the forms of invitation to the monthly group meeting of the literary committee received from the gadfly a laconic pencil scrawled very sorry can't come he was a little annoyed as a notice of important business had been put into the invitation this cavalier treatment seemed to him almost insolent moreover three separate letters containing bad news arrived during the day and the wind was in the east so that martini felt out of sorts and out of temper and when at the group meeting dr ricardo asked isn't Rivera's here he answered rather sulkily no he seems to have got something more interesting on hand and can't come or doesn't want to really martini said golly irritably you are about the most prejudiced person in florence once you object to a man everything he does is wrong how could Rivera's come when he's ill who told you he was ill didn't you know he's been laid up for the last four days what's the matter with him i don't know he had to put off an appointment with me on thursday on account of illness and last night when i went round i heard that he was too ill to see any one i thought ricardo would be looking after him i knew nothing about it i'll go round to-night and see if he wants anything the next morning ricardo looking very pale and tired came into gemma's little study she was sitting at the table reading out monotonous strings of figures to martini who with a magnifying glass in one hand and a finely pointed pencil in the other was making tiny marks in the pages of a book she made with one hand a gesture requesting silence ricardo knowing that a person who is writing in cipher must not be interrupted sat down on the sofa behind her and yawned like a man who can hardly keep awake two four three seven six one three five four one gemma's voice went on with machine-like evenness eight four seven two five one that finishes the sentence caesar she stuck a pin into the paper to mark the exact place and turned round good morning doctor how fagged you look are you well oh i'm well enough 
only tired out i've had an awful night with Rivera's. with Rivera's, yes i've been up with him all night and now i must go off to my hospital patients i just came round to know whether you can think of any one that could look after him a bit for the next few days he's in a devil of a state i'll do my best of course but i really haven't the time and he won't hear of my sending in a nurse what is the matter with him well rather a complication of things first of all first of all have you had any breakfast yes thank you about rivera's no doubt it's complicated with a lot of nerve trouble but the main cause of disturbance is an old injury that seems to have been disgracefully neglected altogether he's a frightfully knocked about state i suppose it was that war in south america and he certainly didn't get proper care when the mischief was done probably things were managed in a very rough-and-ready fashion out there he's lucky to be alive at all however there's a chronic tendency to inflammation and any trifle may bring on an attack is that dangerous N no the chief danger in a case of that kind is of the patient getting desperate and taking a dose of arsenic it is very painful of course it's simply horrible i don't know how he manages to bear it i was obliged to stupefy him with opium in the night a thing i hate to do with a nervous patient but i had to stop it somehow he is nervous i should think very but splendidly plucky as long as he was not actually light-headed with the pain last night his coolness was quite wonderful but i had an awful job with him towards the end how long do you suppose this thing has been going on just five nights and not a soul within call except that stupid landlady who wouldn't wake if the house tumbled down and wouldn't be no use if she did but what about the ballet girl yes isn't that a curious thing he won't let her come near him he has a morbid horror of her altogether he's one of the most incomprehensible creatures i ever met a perfect mass of contradictions he took out his watch and looked at it with a preoccupied face i shall be late at the hospital but it can't be helped the junior will have to begin without me for once i wish i had known of all this before it ought not to have been let go on that way night after night but why on earth didn't he send to say he was ill martini interrupted he might have guessed we shouldn't have left him stranded in that fashion i wish doctor said gemma that you had sent for one of us last night instead of wearing yourself out like this my dear lady i wanted to send round to golly but Rivera's got so frantic at the suggestion that i didn't dare attempt it when i asked him whether there was any one else he would like fetched he looked at me for a minute as if he were scared out of his wits and then put up both hands to his eyes and said don't tell them they will laugh he seemed quite possessed with some fancy about people laughing at something i couldn't make out what he kept talking spanish but patients do say the oddest things sometimes who is with him now asked gemma no one except the landlady and her maid i'll go to him at once said martini thank you i'll look around again in the evening you'll find a paper of written directions in the table drawer by the large window and the opium is on the shelf in the next room if the pain comes on again give him another dose not more than one but don't leave the bottle where he can get at it whatever you do he might be tempted to take too much when martini entered the darkened room the gadfly turned his head round quickly and holding out to him a burning hand began in a bad imitation of his usual flippant manner ah martini you have come to rout me out about those proofs it's no use swearing at me for missing the committee last night the fact is i have not been quite well and never mind the committee i have just seen ricardo and have come to know if i can be of any use the gadfly set his face like a flint oh really that is very kind of you but it isn't worth the trouble 
i'm only a little out of sorts so i understand from ricardo he was up with you all night i believe the gadfly bit his lips savagely i am quite comfortable thank you and don't want anything very well that i will sit in the other room perhaps you would rather be alone i will leave the door ajar in case you call me please don't trouble about it i really shan't want anything i should be wasting your time for nothing nonsense man martini broke in roughly what's the use of trying to fool me that way do you think i have no eyes lie still and go to sleep if you can he went into the adjoining room and leaving the door open sat down with a book presently he heard the gadfly move restlessly two or three times he put down his book and listened there was a short silence then another restless movement then the quick heavy panting breath of a man clenching his teeth to suppress a groan he went back into the room can i do anything for you riveras there was no answer and he crossed the room to the bedside the gadfly with a ghastly livid face looked at him for a moment and silently shook his head shall i give you some more opium ricardo said you were to have it if the pain got very bad no thank you i can bear it a bit longer it may be worse later on martini shrugged his shoulders and sat down beside the bed for an interminable hour he watched in silence then he rose and fetched the opium riveras i won't let this go on any longer if you can stand it i can't you must have the stuff the gadfly took it without speaking then he turned away and closed his eyes martini sat down again and listened as the breathing became gradually deep and even the gadfly was too much exhausted to wake easily when once asleep hour after hour he lay absolutely motionless martini approached him several times during the day and evening and looked at the still figure but except the breathing there was no sign of life the face was so wan and colorless that at last a sudden fear seized upon him what if he had given too much opium the injured left arm lay on the coverlet and he shook it gently to rouse the sleeper as he did so the unfastened sleeve fell back showing a series of deep and fearful scars covering the arm from wrist to elbow that arm must have been in a pleasant condition when those marks were fresh said ricardo's voice behind him ah there you are at last look here ricardo ought this man to sleep forever i gave him a dose about ten hours ago and he hasn't moved a muscle since ricardo stooped down and listened for a moment no he is breathing quite properly it's nothing but sheer exhaustion what you might expect after such a night there may be another paroxysm before morning someone will sit up i hope galley will he has sent to say he will be here by ten it's nearly that now ah he's waking just see the maid-servant gets that broth hot gently gently riveras there there you needn't fight man i'm not a bishop the gadfly started up with a shrinking scared look is, is it my turn he said hurriedly in spanish keep the people amused a minute i ah uh, i didn't see you ricardo he looked round the room and drew one hand across his forehead as if bewildered martini why i thought you had gone away i must have been asleep you have been sleeping like the beauty in the fairy story for the last ten hours and now you are to have some broth and go to sleep again ten hours martini surely you haven't been here all that time yes i was beginning to wonder whether i hadn't given you an overdose of opium the gadfly shot a sly glance at him no such luck wouldn't you have nice quiet committee meetings what the devil do you want ricardo do for mercy's sake leave me in peace can't you i hate being mauled about by doctors well then drink this and i'll leave you in peace i shall come round in a day or two though 
and give you a thorough overhauling. I think you have pulled through the worst of this business now. You don't look quite so much like a death's head at a feast. Oh, I shall be all right soon. Thanks. Who's that? Golly? I seem to have a collection of all the graces here tonight. I have come to stop the night with you. Nonsense. I don't want anyone. Go home, all the lot of you. Even if the thing should come on again, you can't help me. I won't keep taking opium. It's all very well once in a way. I'm afraid you're right, Ricardo said. But that's not always an easy resolution to stick to. The gadfly looked up, smiling. No fear. If I'd have been going in for that sort of thing, I should have done it long ago. Anyway, you are not going to be left alone, Ricardo answered dryly. Come into the other room a minute, Golly. I want to speak to you. Good night, Riveras. I'll look in tomorrow. Martini was following them out of the room when he heard his name softly called. The gadfly was holding out a hand to him. Thank you. Oh, stuff. Go to sleep. When Ricardo had gone, Martini remained a few minutes in the outer room talking with Golly. As he opened the front door of the house, he heard a carriage stop at the garden gate and saw a woman's figure get out and come up the path. It was Zita, returning, evidently, from some evening entertainment. He lifted his hat and stood aside to let her pass, then went out into the dark lane leading from the house to the Paggio Imperiale. Presently the gate clicked, and rapid footsteps came down the lane. "'Wait a minute,' she said, when he turned back to meet her. She stopped short, and then came slowly towards him, dragging one hand after her along the hedge. There was a single street lamp at the corner, and he saw by its light that she was hanging her head down as though embarrassed or ashamed. "'How is he?' she asked without looking up. "'Much better than he was this morning. He has been asleep most of the day and seems less exhausted. I think the attack is passing over.' she still kept her eyes on the ground had it been very bad this time about as bad as it can well be i should think i thought so when he won't let me come into the room that always means it's bad does he often have attacks like this that depends it's so irregular last summer in switzerland he was quite well but the winter before when we were in vienna it was awful he wouldn't let me come near him for days together. He hates to have me around when he's ill. She glanced up for a moment and, dropping her eyes again, went on. He used to send me off to a ball or concert or something on one pretext or another when he felt it coming on. Then he would lock himself into his room. I used to slip back and sit outside the door. He would have been furious if he'd known. He'd let the dog come in if it whined, but not me. He cares more for it, I think. There was a curious, sullen defiance in her manner. Well, I hope it won't be so bad any more, said Martini kindly. Dr. Ricardo is taking the case seriously in hand. Perhaps he will be able to make a permanent improvement, and in any case, the treatment gives relief at the moment but you had better send to us at once another time. He would have suffered very much less if we had known it earlier. Good night. He held out his hand, but she drew back with a quick gesture of refusal. I don't see why you want to shake hands with his mistress. As you like, of course, he began in embarrassment. She stamped her foot on the ground. I hate you, she cried, turning on him with eyes like glowing coals. I hate you all. You come here talking politics to him, and he lets you sit up the night with him and give him things to stop the pain, and I daren't so much as peep at him through the door. What is he to you? What right have you to come and steal him away from me? I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. She burst into a violent fit of sobbing and darting back into the garden, slammed the gate in his face. Good heavens! said Martini to himself as he walked down the lane. 
that girl is actually in love with him of all the extraordinary things end of chapter seven part two part two chapter eight of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Part 2, Chapter 8. The Gadfly's recovery was rapid. One afternoon in the following week, Ricardo found him lying on the sofa in a Turkish dressing gown, chatting with Martini and Galley. He even talked about going downstairs but ricardo merely laughed at the suggestion and asked whether he would like a tramp across the valley to fiesole to start with you might go and call on the grassinis for a change he added wickedly i am sure madame would be delighted to see you especially now when you look so pale and interesting the gadfly clasped his hands with a tragic gesture bless my soul i never thought of that she'd take me for one of italy's martyrs and talk patriotism to me i should have to act up to the part and tell her i've been cut to pieces in an underground dungeon and stuck together again rather badly and she'd want to know exactly what the process felt like you don't think she'd believe it ricardo i'll bet you my indian dagger against the bottled tapeworm in your den that she'll swallow the biggest lie i can invent that's a generous offer and you'd better jump at it thanks i'm not so fond of murderous tools as you are well a tapeworm is as murderous as a dagger any day and not half so pretty but as it happens my dear fellow i don't want the dagger and i do want the tapeworm martini i must run off are you in charge of this obstreperous patient only till three o'clock galli and i have to go to san miniato and signora bolla is coming till i can get back signora bolla the gadfly repeated in a tone of dismay why martini this will never do i can't have a lady bothered over me and my ailments besides where is she to sit she won't like to come in here since when have you gone in so fiercely for the proprieties asked ricardo laughing my good man signora bolla is head nurse in general to all of us she has looked after sick people ever since she was in short frocks and does it better than any sister of mercy i know won't like to come into your room why you might be talking of the grassini woman i needn't leave any directions if she's coming martini heart alive it's half past two i must be off now rivera's take your physic before she comes said galley approaching the sofa with a medicine glass damn the physic the gadfly had reached the irritable stage of convalescence and was inclined to give his devoted nurses a bad time w what do you want to d dose me with all sorts of horrors for now the pain is gone just because i don't want it to come back you wouldn't like it if you collapsed when signora bolla is here and she had to give you opium my good good sir if that pain is going to come back it will come it's not a t toothache to be frightened away with your trashy mixtures they are about as much use as a t toy squirt for a house on fire however i suppose you must have your way he took the glass with his left hand and the sight of the terrible scars recalled galley to the former subject of conversation by the way he asked how did you get so much knocked about in the war was it now didn't i just tell you it was a case of secret dungeons and yes that version is for signora grassini's benefit really i suppose it was in the war with brazil yes 
i got a bit hurt there and then hunting in the savage districts and one thing and another oh yes on the scientific expedition you can fasten your shirt i have quite done you seem to have had an exciting time of it out there well of course you can't live in savage countries without getting a few adventures once in a way said the gadfly lightly and you can hardly expect them all to be pleasant still i don't understand how you managed to get so much knocked about unless in a bad adventure with wild beasts those scars on your left arm for instance oh that was in a puma hunt you see i had fired there was a knock at the door is the room tidy martini yes then please open the door this is really most kind signora you must excuse my not getting up of course you mustn't get up i have not come as a caller i am a little early Cesari. i thought perhaps you were in a hurry to go i can stop for a quarter of an hour let me put your cloak in the other room shall i take the basket too take care those are new laid eggs katie brought them in from mont eleveto this morning there are some christmas roses for you signor riveras i know you are fond of flowers she sat down beside the table and began clipping the stalks of the flowers and arranging them in a vase well riveras said galley tell us the rest of the puma hunt story you had just begun ah oh, yes galley was asking me about life in south america signora and i was telling him how i came to get my left arm spoiled it was in peru we had been wading a river on a puma hunt and when i fired at the beast the powder wouldn't go off it had got splashed with water naturally the puma didn't wait for me to rectify that and this is the result that must have been a pleasant experience oh no not so bad one must take the rough with the smooth of course but it's a splendid life on the whole serpent catching for instance he rattled on telling anecdote after anecdote now of the argentine war now of the brazilian expedition now of hunting feats and adventures with savages or wild beasts galley with the delight of a child hearing a fairy story kept interrupting every moment to ask questions he was of the impressionable neapolitan temperament and loved everything sensational gemma took some knitting from her basket and listened silently with busy fingers and downcast eyes martini frowned and fidgeted the manner in which the anecdotes were told seemed to him boastful and self-conscious and notwithstanding his unwilling admiration for a man who could endure physical pain with the amazing fortitude which he had seen the week before he generally disliked the gadfly and all his works and ways it must have been a glorious life sighed galley with naive envy i wonder you ever made up your mind to leave brazil other countries must seem so flat after it i think i was happiest in peru and ecuador said the gadfly that really is a magnificent tract of country of course it is very hot especially the coast district of ecuador and one has to rough it a bit but the scenery is superb beyond imagination i believe said galley the perfect freedom of life in a barbarous country would attract me more than any scenery a man must feel his personal human dignity as he can never feel it in our crowded towns yes the gadfly answered that is gemma raised her eyes from her knitting and looked at him he flushed suddenly scarlet and broke off there was a little pause surely it has not come on again asked galley anxiously oh nothing to speak of thanks to your s s soothing application that i b b blasphemed against are you going already martini yes come along galley we shall be late 
Gemma followed the two men out of the room and presently returned with an egg beaten up in milk. Take this, please, she said with mild authority, and sat down again to her knitting. The gadfly obeyed meekly. For half an hour, neither spoke. Then the gadfly said in a very low voice, Signora Bola, she looked up. He was tearing the fringe of the couch rug and kept his eyes lowered. You didn't believe I was speaking the truth just now, he began. I had not the smallest doubt that you were telling falsehoods, she answered quietly. You were quite right. I was telling falsehoods all the time. Do you mean about the war? About everything. I was not in that war at all, and as for the expedition, I had a few adventures, of course, and most of those stories are true, but it was not that way I got smashed. You have detected me in one lie, so I may as well confess the lot, I suppose. Does it not seem to you rather a waste of energy to invent so many falsehoods? she asked. I should have thought it was hardly worth the trouble. What would you have? You know your own English proverb. Ask no questions and you'll be told no lies. It's no pleasure for me to fool people that way. But I must answer them somehow when they ask what made a cripple of me. And I may as well invent something pretty while I'm about it. You saw how pleased Galley was. Do you prefer pleasing Galley to speaking the truth? The truth? He looked up with the torn fringe in his hand. You wouldn't have me tell those people the truth. I'd cut my tongue out first. Then, with an awkward, shy abruptness, I have never told it to anybody yet, but I'll tell you if you care to hear. She silently laid down her knitting. To her there was something grievously pathetic in this hard, secret, unlovable creature, suddenly flinging his personal confidence at the feet of a woman who he barely knew and whom he apparently disliked. A long silence followed, and she looked up. He was leaning his left arm on the little table beside him and shading his eyes with the mutilated hand, and she noticed the nervous tension of the fingers and the throbbing of the scar on the wrist. She came up to him and called him softly by name. He started violently and raised his head. I for forgot, he stammered apologetically. I was g going to t tell you about about the accident or whatever it was that caused your lameness but if it worries you the accident oh the smashing yes only it wasn't an accident it was a poker she stared at him in blank amazement he pushed back his hair with a hand that shook perceptibly and looked up at her smiling won't you sit down bring your chair close please I'm so sorry I can't get it for you. R really, now I come to think of it, the case would have been a p perfect treasure trove for Ricardo if he had had me to treat. He has the true surgeon's love for broken bones, and I believe everything in me that was breakable was broken on that occasion, except my neck and your courage, she put in softly but perhaps you count that among your unbreakable possessions. He shook his head. No, he said, my courage has been mended up after a fashion with the rest of me, but it was fairly broken then, like a smashed teacup. That's the horrible part of it. Ah, yes, well, I was telling you about the poker. It was, let me see, nearly thirteen years ago in Lima, I told you Peru is a delightful country to live in, but it's not quite so nice for people that happen to be at low water as I was. I had been down in the Argentine and then in Chile, tramping the country and starving mostly, and had come up from Valparaiso as odd man on a cattle boat. I couldn't get any work in Lima itself, so I went down to the docks. They're at Callo, you know, to try there. 
well of course in all those shipping ports there are low quarters where the seafaring people congregate and after some time i got taken on as servant in one of the gambling hells there i had to do the cooking and billiard marking and fetch drink for the sailors and their women and all that sort of thing not very pleasant work still i was glad to get it there was at least food and the sight of human faces and sound of human tongues of a kind you may think that was no advantage but i had just been down with yellow fever alone in the outhouse of a wretched half-caste shanty and the thing had given me the horrors well one night i was told to put out a tipsy lascar who was making himself obnoxious he had come ashore and lost all his money and was in a bad temper of course i had to obey if i didn't want to lose my place and starve but the man was twice as strong as i i was not twenty-one and as weak as a cat after the fever besides he had the poker he paused a moment glancing furtively at her then went on apparently he intended to put an end to me altogether but somehow he managed to scamp his work lascars always do if they have a chance and left just enough of me not smashed to go on living with yes but the other people could they not interfere were they all afraid of one lascar he looked up and burst out laughing the other people the gamblers and the people of the house why you don't understand they were negroes and chinese and heaven knows what and i was their servant their property they stood round and enjoyed the fun of course that sort of thing counts for a good joke out there so it is if you don't happen to be the subject practised on she shuddered then what was the end of it that i can't tell you much about a man doesn't remember the next few days after a thing of that kind as a rule but there was a ship surgeon near and it seems that when they found i was not dead somebody called him in he patched me up after a fashion ricardo seems to think it was rather badly done but that may be professional jealousy anyhow when i came to my senses an old native woman had taken me in for christian charity that sounds queer doesn't it she used to sit huddled up in the corner of the hut smoking a black pipe and spitting on the floor and crooning to herself however she meant well and she told me i might die in peace and nobody should disturb me but the spirit of contradiction was strong in me and i elected to live it was rather a difficult job scrambling back to life and sometimes i am inclined to think it was a great deal of cry or very little wool anyway that old woman's patience was wonderful she kept me how long was it nearly four months lying in her hut raving like a mad thing at intervals and as vicious as a bear with a sore ear between whiles the pain was pretty bad you see and my temper had been spoiled in childhood with overmuch coddling and then oh then i got up somehow and crawled away no don't think it was any delicacy about taking a poor woman's charity i was past caring for that it was only that i couldn't bear the place any longer you talked just now about my courage if you had seen me then the worst of the pain used to come on every evening about dusk and in the afternoon i used to lie alone and watch the sun get lower and lower oh you can't understand it makes me sick to look at a sunset now a long pause well then i went up country to see if i could get work anywhere it would have driven me mad to stay in lima i got as far as cusco and there really i don't know why i'm inflicting all this ancient history on you it hasn't even the merit of being funny 
she raised her head and looked at him with deep and serious eyes please don't talk that way she said he bit his lip and tore off another piece of the rug fringe shall i go on he asked after a moment if if you will i am afraid it is horrible to you to remember do you think i forget when i hold my tongue it's worse then but don't imagine it's the thing itself that haunts me so it is the fact of having lost the power over myself i-i don't think i quite understand i mean it is the fact of having come to the end of my courage to the point where i found myself a coward surely there is a limit to what any one can bear yes and the man who has once reached that limit never knows when he may reach it again would you mind telling me she asked hesitating how you came to be stranded out there alone at twenty very simply i had a good opening in life at home in the old country and ran away from it why he laughed again in his quick harsh way why because i was a priggish young cub i suppose i had been brought up in an over luxurious home and coddled and faddled after till i thought the world was made of pink cotton wool and sugared almonds then one fine day i found out that someone i had trusted had deceived me why how you start what is it nothing go on please i found out that i had been tricked into believing a lie a common bit of experience of course but as i tell you i was young and priggish and thought that liars go to hell so i ran away from home and plunged into south america to sink or swim as i could without a cent in my pocket or a word of spanish in my tongue or anything but white hands and expensive habits to get my bread with and the natural result was that i got a dip into the real hell to cure me of imagining sham ones a pretty thorough dip too it was just five years before the dupre expedition came along and pulled me out five years oh that is terrible and had you no friends friends i he turned on her with sudden fierceness i have never had a friend the next instant he seemed a little ashamed of his vehemence and went on quickly you mustn't take all this too seriously i dare say i made the worst of things and really it wasn't so bad the first year and a half i was young and strong and i managed to scramble along fairly well till the lascar put his mark on me but after that i couldn't get work it's wonderful what an effectual tool a poker is if you handle it properly and nobody cares to employ a cripple what sort of work did you do what i could get for some time i lived by odd jobbing for the blacks on the sugar plantations fetching and carrying and so on it's one of the curious things in life by the way that slaves always contrive to have a slave of their own and there's nothing a negro likes so much as a white fag to bully but it was no use the overseers always turned me off i was too lame to be quick and i couldn't manage the heavy loads and then i was always getting these attacks of inflammation or whatever the confounded thing is after some time i went down to the silver mines and tried to get work there but it was all no good the managers laughed at the very notion of taking me on and as for the men they made a dead set at me why was that oh human nature i suppose they saw i had only one hand that i could hit back with they're a mangy half-caste lot negroes and zambos mostly and then those horrible coolies 
so at last i got enough of that and set off to tramp the country at random just wandering about on the chance of something turning up to tramp with that lame foot he looked up with a sudden piteous catching of the breath i i was hungry he said she turned her head a little away and rested her chin on one hand after a moment's silence he began again his voice sinking lower and lower as he spoke well i tramped and tramped till i was nearly mad with tramping and nothing came of it i got down into ecuador and there it was worse than ever sometimes i'd get a bit of tinkering to do i'm a pretty fair tinker or an errand to run or a pigsty to clean out sometimes i did oh i hardly know what and then at last one day the slender brown hand clenched itself suddenly on the table and gemma raising her head glanced at him anxiously his side face was turned towards her and she could see a vein on the temple beating like a hammer with quick irregular strokes she bent forward and laid a gentle hand on his arm never mind the rest it's almost too horrible to talk about he stared doubtfully at the hand shook his head and went on steadily then one day i met a travelling variety show you remember that one the other night well that sort of thing only coarser and more indecent the zambos are not like these gentle florentines they don't care for anything that is not foul or brutal there was bullfighting too of course they had camped out by the roadside for the night and i went up to their tent to beg well the weather was hot and i was half starved and so i fainted at the door of the tent i had a trick of fainting suddenly at that time like a boarding-school girl with tight stays so they took me in and gave me brandy and food and so on and then the next morning they offered me another pause they wanted a hunchback or a monstrosity of some kind for the boys to pelt with orange peel and banana skins something to set the blacks laughing you saw the clown that night well i was that for two years i suppose you have a humanitarian feeling about negroes and chinese wait till you've been at their mercy well i learned to do the tricks i was not quite deformed enough but they set that right with an artificial hump and made the most of this foot and arm and the zambos are not critical they're easily satisfied if only they can get hold of some live thing to torture the fool's dress makes a good deal of difference too the only difficulty was that i was so often ill and unable to play sometimes if the manager was out of temper he would insist on my coming into the ring when i had these attacks on and i believe the people liked those evenings best once i remember i fainted right off with the pain in the middle of the performance when i came to my senses again the audience had got round me hooting and yelling and pelting me with don't i can't hear any more stop for god's sake she was standing up with both hands over her ears he broke off and looking up saw the glitter of tears in her eyes damn it all what an idiot i am he said under his breath she crossed the room and stood for a little while looking out of the window when she turned round the gadfly was again leaning on the table and covering his eyes with one hand he had evidently forgotten her presence and she sat down beside him without speaking after a long silence she said slowly i want to ask you a question yes without moving why did you not cut your throat he looked up in grave surprise i did not expect you to ask that 
he said and what about my work who would have done it for me your work ah i see you talked just now about being a coward well if you have come through that and kept to your purpose you are the very bravest man that i ever have met he covered his eyes again and held her hand in a close passionate clasp a silence that seemed to have no end fell around them suddenly a clear and fresh soprano voice rang out from the garden below singing a verse of a doggerel french song eh hey, pierre dance pierre dance on peu mon pauvre Junot. viva la danse et allegresse jouissante de notre belle jeunesse si moi je pleure ou moi je soupire si moi je fais la triste figure monsieur ce n'est que pour hier ha <laughs> monsieur ce n'est que pour hier at the first words the gadfly tore his hand from gemma's and shrank away with a stifled groan she clasped both hands round his arm and pressed it firmly as she might have pressed that of a person undergoing a surgical operation when the song broke off and a chorus of laughter and applause came from the garden he looked up with the eyes of a tortured animal yes it is zita he said slowly with her officer friends she tried to come in here the other night before ricardo came i should have gone mad if she had touched me but she does not know gemma protested softly she cannot guess that she is hurting you she is like a creole he answered shuddering do you remember her face that night when we brought in the beggar child that is how the half-castes look when they laugh another burst of laughter came from the garden gemma rose and opened the window zita with a gold embroidered scarf wound coquettishly round her head was standing in the garden path holding up a bunch of violets for the possession of which three young cavalry officers appeared to be competing madame rennie said gemma zita's face darkened like a thundercloud madame she said turning and raising her eyes with a defiant look would your friends mind speaking a little more softly signor riveras is very unwell the gypsy flung down her violets allez vous en she said turning sharply on the astonished officers vous mon bitty, messieurs she went slowly out into the road gemma closed the window they have gone away she said turning to him thank you i i am sorry to have troubled you it was no trouble he at once detected the hesitation in her voice but he said that sentence was not finished signora there was an unspoken but in the back of your mind if you look into the backs of people's minds you mustn't be offended at what you read there it is not my affair of course but i cannot understand my aversion to madame rennie it is only when no you're caring to live with her when you feel that aversion it seems to me an insult to her as a woman and as a woman he burst out laughing harshly is that what you call a woman madame seneca Pujera. that is not fair she said you have no right to speak of her in that way to any one especially to another woman he turned away and lay with wide open eyes looking out of the window at the sinking sun she lowered the blind and closed the shutters that he might not see it set then sat down at the table by the other window and took up her knitting again would you like the lamp she asked after a moment he shook his head when it grew too dark to see gemma rolled up her knitting and laid it in the basket 
for some time she sat with folded hands silently watching the gadfly's motionless figure the dim evening light falling on his face seemed to soften away its hard mocking self-assertive look and to deepen the tragic lines about the mouth by some fanciful association of ideas her memory went vividly back to the stone cross which her father had set up in memory of arthur and to its inscription all thy waves and billows have gone over me an hour passed in unbroken silence at last she rose and went softly out of the room coming back with a lamp she paused for a moment thinking that the gadfly was asleep as the light fell on his face he turned round i have made you a cup of coffee she said setting down the lamp put it down a minute will you come here please he took both her hands in his i have been thinking he said you are quite right it is an ugly tangle i have got my life into but remember a man does not meet every day a woman whom he can love and i i have been in deep waters i am afraid afraid of the dark sometimes i dare not be alone at night i must have something living something solid beside me it is the outer darkness where shall be no no it's not that that's a sixpenny toy hell it's the inner darkness there's no weeping or gnashing of teeth there only silence silence his eyes dilated she was quite still hardly breathing till he spoke again this is all mystification to you isn't it you can't understand luckily for you what i mean is that i have a pretty fair chance of going mad if i try to live quite alone don't think too hardly of me if you can help it i am not altogether the vicious brute you perhaps imagine me to be i cannot try to judge for you she answered i have not suffered as you have but i have been in rather deep water too in another way and i think i am sure that if you let the fear of anything drive you to do a really cruel or unjust or ungenerous thing you will regret it afterwards for the rest if you have failed in this one thing i know that i in your place should have failed altogether should have cursed god and died he still kept her hands in his tell me he said very softly have you ever in your life done a really cruel thing she did not answer but her head sank down and two great tears fell on his hand tell me he whispered passionately clasping her hands tighter tell me i have told you all my misery yes once long ago and i did it to the person i loved best in the world the hands that clasped hers were trembling violently but they did not loosen their hold he was a comrade she went on and i believed a slander against him a common glaring lie that the police had invented i struck him in the face for a traitor and he went away and drowned himself then two days later i found out that he had been quite innocent perhaps that is a worse memory than any of yours i would cut off my right hand to undo what is done something swift and dangerous something that she had not seen before flashed into his eyes he bent his head down with a furtive sudden gesture and kissed the hand she drew back with a startled face don't she cried out piteously please don't ever do that again you hurt me do you think you didn't hurt the man you killed the man i killed ah there is cesare at the gate at last i-i must go when martini came into the room he found the gadfly lying alone with the untouched coffee beside him 
swearing softly to himself in a languid spiritless way as though he got no satisfaction out of it end of chapter eight of the second part part two chapter nine of the gadfly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina the gadfly by ethel lillian voynich part two chapter nine a few days later the gadfly still rather pale and limping more than usual entered the reading-room of the public library and asked for cardinal montanelli's sermons riccardo who was reading at a table near him looked up he liked the gadfly very much but could not digest this one trait in him this curious personal maliciousness are you preparing another volley against the unlucky cardinal he asked half irritably my dear fellow why do you uh, always attribute evil m m motives to people it's m m most unchristian i am preparing an essay on contemporary theology for the n new paper what's new paper riccardo frowned it was perhaps an open secret that a new press law was expected and that the opposition was preparing to astonish the town with a radical newspaper but still it was formally a secret the swindler's gazette of course or the church calendar sh sh riveras we are disturbing the other readers well then stick to your surgery if that's your subject and l leave me to the theology that's mine i d don't interfere with your treatment of broken bones though i know a p precious lot more about them than you do he sat down to his volume of sermons with an intent and preoccupied face one of the librarians came up to him signor riveras i think you were in the dupres expedition exploring the tributaries of the amazon perhaps you will kindly help us in a difficulty a lady has been inquiring for the records of the expedition and they are at the binders what does she want to know only in what year the expedition started and when it passed through ecuador it started from paris in the autumn of eighteen thirty seven and passed through quito in april eighteen thirty eight we were three years in brazil then went down to rio and got back to paris in the summer of eighteen forty one does the lady want the dates of the separate discoveries no thank you only these i have written them down beppo take this paper to signora bola please many thanks signor riveras i am sorry to have troubled you the gadfly leaned back in his chair with a perplexed frown what did she want the dates for when they passed through ecuador gemma went home with the slip of paper in her hand april eighteen thirty eight and arthur had died in may eighteen thirty three five years she began pacing up and down her room she had slept badly the last few nights and there were dark shadows under her eyes five years and an overly luxurious home and someone he had trusted had deceived him had deceived him and he had found it out she stopped and put up both hands to her head oh this was utterly mad it was not possible it was absurd and yet how they dragged that harbor five years and he was not twenty-one when the lascar then he must have been nineteen when he ran away from home had he not said a year and a half where did he get those blue eyes from and that nervous restlessness of the fingers and why was he so bitter against montanelli five years five years if she could but know that he was drowned if she could but have seen the body 
some day surely the old wound would have left off aching the old memory would have lost its terrors perhaps in another twenty years she would have learned to look back without shrinking all her youth had been poisoned by the thought of what she had done resolutely day after day and year after year she had fought against the demon of remorse always she had remembered that her work lay in the future always had shut her eyes and ears to the haunting spectre of the past and day after day year after year the image of the drowned body drifting out to sea had never left her and the bitter cry that she could not silence had risen in her heart i have killed arthur arthur is dead sometimes it had seemed to her that her burden was too heavy to be borne now she would have given half her life to have that burden back again if she had killed him that was a familiar grief she had endured it too long to sink under it now but if she had driven him not into the water but into she sat down covering her eyes with both hands and her life had been darkened for his sake because he was dead if she had brought upon him nothing worse than death steadily pitilessly she went back step by step through the hell of his past life it was as vivid to her as though she had seen and felt it all the helpless shivering of the naked soul the mockery that was bitterer than death the horror of loneliness the slow grinding relentless agony it was as vivid as if she had sat beside him in the filthy indian hut as if she had suffered with him in the silver mines the coffee fields the horrible variety show the variety show no she must shut out that image at least it was enough to drive one mad to sit and think of it she opened a little drawer in her writing desk it contained the few personal relics which she could not bring herself to destroy she was not given to the hoarding up of sentimental trifles and the preservation of these keepsakes was a concession to that weaker side of her nature which she kept under with so steady a hand she very seldom allowed herself to look at them now she took them out one after another giovanni's first letter to her and the flowers that had lain in his dead hand a lock of her baby's hair and a withered leaf from her father's grave at the back of the drawer was a miniature portrait of arthur at ten years old the only existing likeness of him she sat down with it in her hands and looked at the beautiful childish head till the face of the real arthur rose up afresh before her how clear it was in every detail the sensitive lines of the mouth the wide earnest eyes the seraphic purity of expression they were graven in upon her memory as though he had died yesterday slowly the blinding tears welled up and hid the portrait oh how could she have thought such a thing it was like sacrilege even to dream of this bright far-off spirit bound to the sordid miseries of life surely the gods had loved him a little and had let him die young better a thousand times that he should pass into utter nothingness than that he should live and be the gadfly the gadfly with his faultless neckties and his doubtful witticisms his bitter tongue and his ballet girl no no it was all a horrible senseless fancy and she had vexed her heart with vain imaginings arthur was dead may i come in asked a soft voice at the door she started so that the portrait fell from her hand and the gadfly limping across the room picked it up and handed it to her how you startled me she said i am so, so sorry perhaps i am disturbing you no i was only turning over some old things she hesitated for a moment then handed him back the miniature what do you think of that head while he looked at it she watched his face 
as though her life depended upon its expression but it was merely negative and critical you have set me a difficult task he said the portrait is faded and a child's face is always hard to read but i should think that child would grow into an unlucky man and the wisest thing he could do would be to abstain from growing into a man at all why look at the line of the underlip the the that is the sort of nature that feels pain as pain and wrong as wrong and the world has no r room for such people it needs people who feel nothing but their work is it at all like any one you know he looked at the portrait more closely yes what a curious thing of course it is very like like whom c -c cardinal montanelli i wonder whether his irreproachable eminence has any nephews by the way who is it if i may ask it is a portrait taken in childhood of the friend i told you about the other day whom you killed she winced in spite of herself how lightly how cruelly he used that dreadful word yes whom i killed if he is really dead if she kept her eyes on his face i have sometimes doubted she said the body was never found he may have run away from home like you and gone to south america let us hope not that would be a bad memory to carry about with you i have d d done some hard fighting in my t time and have sent m m more than one man to hades perhaps but if i had it on my conscience that i had sent any l living thing to south america i should sleep badly then do you believe she interrupted coming nearer to him with clasped hands that if he were not drowned if he had been through your experience instead he would never come back and let the past go do you believe he would never forget remember it has cost me something too look she pushed back the heavy waves of hair from her forehead through the black locks ran a broad white streak there was a long silence i think the gadfly said slowly that the dead are better dead forgetting some things is a difficult matter and if i were in the place of your dead friend i would s s stay dead the revenant is an ugly specter she put the portrait back into its drawer and locked the desk this is hard doctrine she said and now we will talk about something else i came to have a little business talk with you if i may a private one about a plan that i have in my head she drew a chair to the table and sat down what do you think of the projected press law he began without a trace of his usual stammer what i think of it i think it will not be of much value but half a loaf is better than no bread undoubtedly then do you intend to work on one of the new papers these good folk here are preparing to start i thought of doing so there is always a great deal of practical work to be done in starting any paper printing and circulation arrangements and how long are you going to waste your mental gifts in that fashion why waste because it is a waste you know quite well that you have a far better head than most of the men you are working with and you let them make a regular drudge and johannes factotum of you intellectually you are as far ahead of grassini and galley as if they were schoolboys yet you sit correcting their proofs like a printer's devil in the first place i don't spend all my time in correcting proofs and moreover it seems to me that you exaggerate my mental capacities they are by no means so brilliant as you think i don't think them brilliant at all he answered quietly but i do think them sound and solid which is of much more importance at those dreary committee meetings it is always you who put your finger on the weak spot in everybody's logic you are not fair to the others martini for instance has a very logical head and there is no doubt about it the capacities of fabrizi and lega 
then grassini has a sounder knowledge of italian economic statistics than any official in the country perhaps well that's not saying much but let us lay them and their capacities aside the fact remains that you with such gifts as you possess might do more important work and fill a more responsible post than at present i am quite satisfied with my position the work i am doing is not of very much value perhaps but we all do what we can signora bola you and i have gone too far to play at compliments and modest denials now tell me honestly do you recognize that you are using up your brain on work which persons inferior to you could do as well since you press me for an answer yes to some extent then why do you let that go on no answer why do you let it go on because i can't help it why she looked up reproachfully that is unkind it's not fair to press me so but all the same you are going to tell me why if you must have it then because my life has been smashed into pieces and i have not the energy to start anything real now i am about fit to be a revolutionary cab horse and do the party's drudge work at least i do it conscientiously and it must be done by somebody certainly it must be done by somebody but not always by the same person it's about all i'm fit for he looked at her with half-shut eyes inscrutably presently she raised her head we are returning to the old subject and this was to be a business talk it is quite useless i assure you to tell me i might have done all sorts of things i shall never do them now but i may be able to help you in thinking out your plan what is it you begin by telling me that it is useless for me to suggest anything and then ask what i want to suggest my plan requires your help in action not only in thinking out let me hear it and then we will discuss tell me first whether you have heard anything about schemes for a rising in venetia i have heard of nothing but schemes for risings and sanfetist plots ever since the amnesty and i fear i am as skeptical about the one as about the other so am i in most cases but i am speaking of really serious preparations for a rising of the whole province against the austrians a good many young fellows in the papal states particularly in the four legations are secretly preparing to get across there and join as volunteers and i hear from my friends in the romagna tell me she interrupted are you quite sure that these friends of yours can be trusted quite sure i know them personally and have worked with them that is they are members of the sect to which you belong forgive my skepticism but i am always a little doubtful as to the accuracy of information received from secret societies it seems to me that the habit who told you i belong to a sect he interrupted sharply no one i guessed it ah he leaned back in his chair and looked at her frowning do you always guess people's private affairs he said after a moment very often i am rather observant and have a habit of putting things together i tell you that so that you may be careful when you don't want me to know a thing i don't mind your knowing anything so long as it goes no further i suppose this has not she lifted her head with a gesture of half offended surprise surely that is an unnecessary question she said of course i know you would not speak of anything to outsiders but i thought that perhaps to the members of your party the party's business is with facts not with my personal conjectures and fancies of course i have never mentioned the subject to any one thank you do you happen to have guessed which sect i belong to i hope you must not take offence at my frankness it was you who started this talk you know i do hope it is not the knifers why do you hope that because you are fit for better things 
we are all fit for better things than we ever do there is your own answer back again however it is not the knifers that i belong to but the red girdles they are a steadier lot and take their work more seriously do you mean the work of knifing that among other things knives are very useful in their way but only when you have a good organized propaganda behind them that is what i dislike in the other sect they think a knife can settle all the world's difficulties and that's a mistake it can settle a good many but not all do you honestly believe that it settles any he looked at her in surprise of course she went on it eliminates for the moment the practical difficulty caused by the presence of a clever spy or objectionable official but whether it does not create worse difficulties in place of the one removed is another question it seems to me like the parable of the swept and garnished house and the seven devils every assassination only makes the police more vicious and the people more accustomed to violence and brutality and the last state of the community may be worse than the first what do you think will happen when the revolution comes do you suppose the people won't have to get accustomed to violence then war is war yes but open revolution is another matter it is one moment in the people's life and it is the price we have to pay for all our progress no doubt fearful things will happen they must in every revolution but they will be isolated facts exceptional features of an exceptional moment the horrible thing about this promiscuous knifing is that it becomes a habit the people get to look upon it as an everyday occurrence and their sense of the sacredness of human life gets blunted i have not been much in the romagna but what little i have seen of the people has given me the impression that they have got or are getting into a mechanical habit of violence surely even that is better than a mechanical habit of obedience and submission i don't think so all mechanical habits are bad and slavish and this one is ferocious as well of course if you look upon the work of the revolutionist as the mere wrestling of certain definite concessions from the government then the secret sect and the knife must seem to you the best weapons for there is nothing else which all governments so dread but if you think as i do that to force the government's hand is not an end in itself but only a means to an end and that what we really need to reform is the relation between man and man then you must go differently to work accustoming ignorant people to the sight of blood is not the way to raise the value they put on human life and the value they put on religion i don't understand he smiled i think we differ as to where the root of the mischief lies you place it in a lack of appreciation of the value of human life rather of the sacredness of human personality put it as you like to me the great cause of our muddles and mistakes seems to lie in the mental disease called religion do you mean any religion in particular oh no that is a mere question of external symptoms the disease itself is what is called a religious attitude of mind it is the morbid desire to set up a fetish and adore it to fall down and worship something it makes little difference whether the something be jesus or buddha or a tum-tum tree you don't agree with me of course you may be atheist or agnostic or anything you like but i could feel the religious temperament in you at five yards however it is of no use for us to discuss that but you are quite mistaken in thinking that i for one look upon the knifing as merely a means of removing objectionable officials it is above all a means and i think the best means of undermining the prestige of the church and of accustoming people to look upon clerical agents as upon any other vermin and when you have accomplished that when you have roused the wild beast that sleeps in the people and set it on the church then 
then i shall have done the work that makes it worth my while to live is that the work you spoke of the other day yes just that she shivered and turned away you are disappointed in me he said looking up with a smile no not exactly that i am i think a little afraid of you she turned round after a moment and said in her ordinary business voice this is an unprofitable discussion our standpoints are too different for my part i believe in propaganda propaganda and propaganda and when you can get it open insurrection then let us come back to the question of my plan it has something to do with propaganda and more with insurrection yes as i tell you a good many volunteers are going from the romagna to join the venetians we do not know yet how soon the insurrection will break out it may not be till the autumn or winter but the volunteers in the apennines must be armed and ready so that they may be able to start for the plains directly they are sent for i have undertaken to smuggle the firearms and ammunition on to papal territory for them wait a minute how do you come to be working with that set the revolutionists in lombardy and venetia are all in favor of the new pope they are going in for liberal reforms hand in hand with the progressive movement in the church how can a no compromise anti-clerical like you get on with them he shrugged his shoulders what is it to me if they like to amuse themselves with a rag doll so long as they do their work of course they will take the pope for a figurehead what have i to do with that if only the insurrection gets under way somehow any stick will do to beat a dog with i suppose and any cry to set the people on the austrians what is it you want me to do chiefly to help me get the firearms across but how could i do that you are just the person who could do it best i think of buying the arms in england and there is a good deal of difficulty about bringing them over it's impossible to get them through any of the pontifical seaports they must come by tuscany and go across the apennines that makes two frontiers to cross instead of one yes but the other way is hopeless you can't smuggle a big transport in at a harbor where there is no trade and you know the whole shipping of civita vecchia amounts to about three rowboats and a fishing smack if we once get the things across tuscany i can manage the papal frontier my men know every path in the mountains and we have plenty of hiding places the transport must come by sea to leghorn and that is my great difficulty i am not in with the smugglers there and i believe you are give me five minutes to think she leaned forward resting one elbow on her knee and supporting the chin on the raised hand after a few moments silence she looked up it is possible that i might be of some use in that part of the work she said but before we go any further i want to ask you a question can you give me your word that this business is not connected with any stabbing or secret violence of any kind certainly it goes without saying that i should not have asked you to join in a thing of which i know you disapprove when do you want a definite answer from me there is not much time to lose but i can give you a few days to decide in are you free next saturday evening let me see to-day is thursday yes then come here i will think the matter over and give you a final answer on the following sunday gemma sent in to the committee of the florentine branch of the mazzanian party a statement that she wished to undertake a special work of a political nature which would for a few months prevent her from performing the functions for which she had up till now been responsible to the party some surprise was felt at this announcement but the committee raised no objection she had been known in the party for several years as a person whose judgment might be trusted 
and the members agreed that if signora bola took an unexpected step she probably had good reasons for it to martini she said frankly that she had undertaken to help the gadfly with some frontier work she had stipulated for the right to tell her old friend this much in order that there might be no misunderstanding or painful sense of doubt and mystery between them it seemed to her that she owed him this proof of confidence he made no comment when she told him but she saw without knowing why that the news had wounded him deeply they were sitting on the terrace of her lodging looking out over the red roofs to fiesole after a long silence martini rose and began tramping up and down with his hands in his pockets whistling to himself a sure sign with him of mental agitation she sat looking at him for a little while cesare you are worried about this affair she said at last i am very sorry you feel so despondent over it but i could decide only as seemed right to me it is not the affair he answered sullenly i know nothing about it and it probably is all right once you have consented to go into it it's the man i distrust i think you misunderstand him i did till i got to know him better he is far from perfect but there is much more good in him than you think very likely for a moment he tramped to and fro in silence then suddenly stopped beside her Gemma, give it up give it up before it is too late don't let that man drag you into things you will repent afterwards Chesari, she said gently you are not thinking what you are saying no one is dragging me into anything i have made this decision of my own will after thinking the matter well over alone you have a personal dislike to rivera's i know but we are talking of politics now not of persons madonna give it up that man is dangerous he is secret and cruel and unscrupulous and he is in love with you she drew back Chesere, how can you get such fancies into your head he is in love with you martini repeated keep clear of him madonna dear Chesere, i can't keep clear of him and i can't explain to you why we are tied together not by any wish or doing of our own if you are tied there is nothing more to say martini answered wearily he went away saying that he was busy and tramped for hours up and down the muddy streets the world looked very black to him that evening one poor ewe lamb and this slippery creature had stepped in and stolen it away end of chapter nine of the second part Part two, chapter ten of the Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daria Labutina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Part two, chapter ten. Towards the middle of February, the Gadfly went to Leghorn. Gemma had introduced him to a young Englishman there a shipping agent of liberal views whom she and her husband had known in england he had on several occasions performed little services for the florentine radicals had lent money to meet an unforeseen emergency had allowed his business address to be used for the party's letters etc but always through gemma's mediumship and as a private friend of hers she was therefore according to party etiquette free to make use of the connection in any way that might seem good to her whether any use could be got out of it was quite another question to ask a friendly sympathizer to lend his address for letters from Sicily, or to keep a few documents in a corner of his counting-house safe, was one thing. To ask him to smuggle over a transport of firearms for an insurrection was another, and she had very little hope of his consenting. "'You can but try,' she had said to the gadfly, "'but I don't think anything will come of it. If you were to go to him with that recommendation and ask for five hundred scudi, I dare say he'd give them to you at once. He's exceedingly generous.' perhaps at a pinch he would lend you his passport or hide a fugitive in his cellar 
but if you mention such a thing as rifles, he will stare at you and think we're both demented. Perhaps he may give me a few hints, though, or introduce me to a friendly sailor or two. The gadfly had answered, Anyway, it's worth while to try. One day, at the end of the month, he came into her study less carefully dressed than usual, and she saw at once from his face that he had good news to tell. Ah, at last! I was beginning to think something must have happened to you. I thought it safer not to write, and I couldn't get back sooner. You have just arrived? Yes, I am straight from the diligence. I looked in to tell you that the affair is all settled. Do you mean that Bailey has really consented to help? More than to help. He has undertaken the whole thing. Packing, transports, everything. The rifles will be hidden in bales of merchandise and will come straight through from England. His partner, Williams, who is a great friend of his, has consented to see the transport off from Southampton, and Bailey will slip it through the custom house at Leghorn. That is why I have been such a long time. Williams was just starting for Southampton, and I went with him as far as Genoa. To talk over details on the way? Yes, as long as I wasn't too seasick to talk about anything. Are you a bad sailor? She asked quickly, remembering how Arthur had suffered from seasickness one day when her father had taken them both for a pleasure trip. About as bad as is possible, in spite of having been at sea so much. But we had a talk while they were loading at Genoa. You know Williams, I think? He's a thoroughly good fellow, trustworthy and sensible. So is Bailey, for that matter, and they both know how to hold their tongues. It seems to me, though, that Bailey is running a serious risk in doing a thing like this. So I told him, and he only looked sulky and said, What business is that of yours? Just the sort of thing one would expect him to say. If I met Bailey in Timbuktu, I should go up to him and say, Good morning, Englishman. But I can't conceive how you managed to get their consent. Williams, too. The last man I should have thought of. Yes, he objected strongly at first, not on the ground of danger, though, but because the thing is so unbusinesslike. But I managed to win him over after a bit, and now we will go into details. When the gadfly reached his lodgings, the sun had set, and the blossoming pyrus chaponica that hung over the garden wall looked dark in the fading light. He gathered a few sprays and carried them into the house. As he opened the study door, Zita started up from a chair in the corner and ran towards him. "'Oh, Felice, I thought you were never coming.' His first impulse was to ask her sharply what business she had in his study, but remembering that he had not seen her for three weeks, he held out his hand and said, rather frigidly, "'Good evening, Zita. How are you?' She put up her face to be kissed, but he moved past as though he had not seen the gesture, and took up a vase to put the pyrus in. The next instant the door was flung wide open, and the collie, rushing into the room, performed an ecstatic dance around him, barking and whining with delight. He put down the flowers and stooped to pat the dog. "'Well, Shaitan, how are you, old man?' "'Yes, it's really I. Shake hands like a good dog.' The hard, sullen look came into Zita's face. "'Shall we go to dinner?' she asked coldly. I ordered it for you at my place, as you wrote that you were coming this evening. He turned round quickly. I am v v very sorry you should, should not have waited for me. I will just get a bit tidy and come round at once. P perhaps you would not mind putting these into water. When he came into Zita's dining room, she was standing before a mirror, fastening one of the sprays into her dress. She had apparently made up her mind to be good-humored, and came up to him with a little cluster of crimson buds tied together. Here is a buttonhole for you. Let me put it in your coat. All through dinner time he did his best to be amiable, and kept up a flow of small talk to which she responded with radiant smiles. Her evident joy at his return somewhat embarrassed him. He had grown so accustomed to the idea that she led her own life apart from his, among such friends and companions as were congenial to her, that it had never occurred to him to imagine her as missing him. And yet she must have felt dull to be so much excited now. Let us have coffee up on the terrace she said. It is quite warm this evening. Very well. Shall I take your guitar? Perhaps you will sing. She flushed with delight. He was critical about music and did not often ask her to sing. On the terrace was a broad wooden bench running round the walls. The gadfly chose a corner with a good view of the hills, and Zita, seating herself on the low wall with her feet on the bench, leaned back against a pillar of the roof. She did not care much for scenery. She preferred to look at the gadfly. "'Give me a cigarette,' she said. "'I don't believe I have smoked once since you went away. "'Happy thought. It's just s s smoke I want to complete my bliss.' "'She leaned forward and looked at him earnestly. "'Are you really happy?' "'The gadfly's mobile brows went up. "'Yes, why not? I've had a good dinner. "'I'm looking at one of the m most beautiful views in Europe, "'and now I'm going to have coffee and hear a Hungarian folk song. 
There is nothing the matter with either my conscience or my digestion. What more can man desire? I know another thing you desire. What? That. She tossed a little cardboard box into his hand. B burnt almonds? Why did, didn't you tell me before I began to s smoke? He cried reproachfully. Why, you baby, you can eat them when you have done smoking. There comes the coffee. The gadfly sipped his coffee and ate his burnt almonds with the grave and concentrated enjoyment of a cat drinking cream. How nice it is to come back to d decent coffee after the s stuff one gets at Leghorn, he said in his purring drawl. A very good reason for stopping at home now you are here. Not much stopping for me. I'm off again tomorrow. The smile died on her face. Tomorrow? What for? Where are you going to? Oh, two or three p p places on business. It had been decided between him and Gemma that he must go in person into the Apennines to make arrangements with the smugglers of the frontier region about the transporting of the firearms. To cross the papal frontier was for him a matter of serious danger, but it had to be done if the work was to succeed. Always business. Zita sighed under her breath and then asked aloud, "'Shall you be gone long?' "'No, only a fortnight or three weeks, p -p probably.' "'I suppose that it's some of that business,' she asked abruptly. "'That business?' "'The business you're always trying to get your neck broken over. The everlasting politics.' "'It has something to do with p -p politics.' Zita threw away her cigarette. "'You are fooling me,' she said. "'You are going into some danger or other.' I am going s straight into the infernal regions, he answered languidly. D do you happen to have any friends there you want to send that ivy to? You n need to pull it all down, though. She had fiercely torn off a handful of the climber from the pillar, and now flung it down with vehement anger. You are going into danger, she repeated, and you won't even say so, honestly. Do you think I am fit for nothing but to be fooled and joked with? You will get yourself hanged one of these days, and never so much as say goodbye. It's always politics and politics. I'm sick of politics. So am I, said the gadfly, yawning lazily. And therefore we'll talk about something else, unless you will sing. Well, give me the guitar, then. What shall I sing? The Ballad of the Lost Horse. It suits your voice so well. She began to sing the old Hungarian ballad of the man who loses first his horse, then his home, and then his sweetheart, and consoles himself with the reflection that more was lost at Mohatch Field. The song was one of the gadfly's especial favorites. Its fierce and tragic melody, and the bitter stoicism of the refrain, appealed to him as no softer music ever did. Zita was an excellent voice. The notes came from her lips strong and clear, full of the vehement desire of life. She would have sung Italian or Slavonic music badly, and German still worse, but she sang the Magyar folk songs splendidly. The gadfly listened with wide-open eyes and parted lips. He had never heard her sing like this before. As she came to the last line, her voice began suddenly to shake. Ah, no matter, more was lost. She broke down with a sob and hid her face among the ivy leaves. Zita! The gadfly rose and took the guitar from her. What is it? She only sobbed convulsively, hiding her face in both hands. He touched her on the arm. Tell me what is the matter, he said caressingly. Let me alone, she sobbed, shrinking away. Let me alone. He went quietly back to his seat and waited till the sobs died away. Suddenly he felt her arms about his neck. She was kneeling on the floor beside him. Felice, don't go. Don't go away. We will talk about that afterwards, he said, gently extricating himself from the clinging arms. Tell me first what has upset you so. Has anything been frightening you? She silently shook her head. Have I done anything to hurt you? No. She put a hand up against his throat. What then? You will get killed, she whispered at last. I heard one of those men that come here say the other day that you will get into trouble, and when I ask you about it, you laugh at me. My dear child, the gadfly said after a little pause of astonishment, you've got some exaggerated notion into your head. Very likely I shall get killed some day. That is the natural consequence of being a revolutionist. But there is no reason to suppose I am going to get killed just now. I am running no more risk than other people. Other people? What are other people to me? If you loved me, you wouldn't go off this way and leave me to lie awake at night, wondering whether you're arrested or dream you are dead whenever I go to sleep. You don't care as much for me as for that dog there. The gadfly rose and walked slowly to the other end of the terrace. 
He was quite unprepared for such a scene as this, and at a loss how to answer her. Yes, Gemma was right. He had got his life into a tangle that he would have hard work to undo. "'Sit down and let us talk about it quietly,' he said, coming back after a moment. "'I think we have misunderstood each other. Of course, I should not have laughed if I had thought you were serious. Try to tell me plainly what is troubling you, and then, if there is any misunderstanding, we may be able to clear it up.' "'There is nothing to clear up. I can see you don't care a brass farthing for me. My dear child, we'd better be quite frank with each other. I've always tried to be honest about our relationship, and I think I've never deceived you as to—' "'Oh, no, you have been honest enough. You have never even pretended to think of me as anything else but a prostitute, a trumpery bit of second-hand finery that plenty of other men have had before you. Hush, Sita, I have never thought that way about any living thing. "'You have never loved me,' she insisted sullenly. "'No, I have never loved you. Listen to me and try to think as little harm of me as you can. Who said I thought any harm of you? I—' "'Wait a minute. This is what I want to say.' I have no belief whatever in conventional moral codes, and no respect for them. To me, the relations between men and women are simply questions of personal likes and dislikes, and of money, she interrupted with a harsh little laugh. He winced and hesitated a moment. That, of course, is the ugly part of the matter, but believe me, if I had thought that you disliked me or felt any repulsion to the thing, I would never have suggested it, or taken advantage of your position to persuade you to it. I have never done that to any woman in my life, and I have never told a woman a lie about my feeling for her. You may trust me that I am speaking the truth. He paused a moment, but she did not answer. I thought, he went on, that if a man is alone in the world and feels the need of, of a woman's presence about him, and if he can find a woman who is attractive to him and to whom he is not repulsive, he has a right to accept in a grateful and friendly spirit such pleasure as that woman is willing to give him, without entering into any closer bond. I saw no harm in the thing, provided only there is no unfairness or insult or deceit on either side. As for your having been in that relation with other men before I met you, I did not think about that. I merely thought that the connection would be a pleasant and harmless one for both of us, and that either was free to break it as soon as it became irksome. If I was mistaken, if you have grown to look upon it differently, then... He paused again. Then, she whispered without looking up, then I have done you a wrong, and I am very sorry, but I did not mean to do it. You did not mean, and you thought. Felice, are you made of cast iron? Have you never been in love with a woman in your life that you can't see I love you? A sudden thrill went through him. It was so long since anyone had said to him, I love you. Instantly she started up and flung her arms around him. Felice, come away with me. Come away from this dreadful country and all these people and their politics. What have we got to do with them? Come away, and we'll be happy together. Let us go to South America, where you used to live. The physical horror of association startled him back into self-control. He unclasped her hands from his neck and held them in a steady grasp. Zita, try to understand what I am saying to you. I do not love you, and if I did, I would not come away with you. I have my work in Italy, and my comrades, and someone else that you love better than me, she cried out fiercely. Oh, I could kill you. It is not your comrades you care about. It's... I know who it is. Hush, he said quietly. You are excited and imagining things that are not true. You suppose I am thinking of Signor Bola? I am not so easily duped. You only talk politics with her. You care no more for her than you do for me. It's that cardinal. The gadfly started as if he had been shot. Cardinal, he repeated mechanically. Cardinal Montanelli, that came here preaching in the autumn. Do you think I didn't see your face when his carriage passed? You were as white as my pocket handkerchief. Why, you're shaking like a leaf now, because I mentioned his name. He stood up. You don't know what you are talking about, he said very slowly and softly. I hate the cardinal. He's the worst enemy I have. Enemy or no, you love him better than you love anyone else in the world. Look me in the face and say that is not true if you can. He turned away and looked out into the garden. She watched him furtively, half scared at what she had done. There was something terrifying in his silence. At last she stole up to him, like a frightened child, and timidly pulled his sleeve. He turned round. It is true, he said. End of chapter 10 of the second part. Recording by Daria Labutina. Part 2, Chapter 11 of The Gadfly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daria Labutina. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich. Part 2, Chapter 11. But c c can't I meet him somewhere in the hills? Brizigea is a risky place for me. Every inch of ground in the Romagna is risky for you. But just at this moment, Brizigea is safer for you than any other place. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. Don't let that man with the blue jacket see your face. He's dangerous. Yes, it was a terrible storm. I don't remember to have seen the vines so bad for a long time. The gadfly spread his arms on the table and laid his face upon them like a man overcome with fatigue or wine, and the dangerous newcomer in the blue jacket, glancing swiftly round, saw only two farmers discussing their crops over a flask of wine and a sleepy mountaineer with his head on the table. It was the usual sort of thing to see in little places like Maradi, and the owner of the blue jacket apparently made up his mind that nothing could be gained by listening, for he drank his wine at a gulp and sauntered into the outer room. There he stood, leaning on the counter and gossiping lazily with the landlord, glancing every now and then out of the corner of one eye through the open door, beyond which sat the three figures at the table. The two farmers went on sipping their wine and discussing the weather in the local dialect, and the gadfly snored like a man whose conscience is sound. At last the spy seemed to make up his mind that there was nothing in the wine shop worth further waste of his time. He paid his reckoning, and, lounging out of the house, sauntered away down the narrow street. The gadfly, yawning and stretching, lifted himself up and sleepily rubbed the sleeve of his linen blouse across his eye. "'Pretty sharp practice, that,' he said, pulling a clasp knife out of his pocket and cutting off a chunk from the rye loaf on the table. "'Have they been worrying you much lately, Michelle?' "'They've been worse than mosquitoes in August. There's no getting a minute's peace. Wherever one goes, there's always a spy hanging about. Even right up in the hills, where they used to be so shy about venturing, they have taken to coming in bands of three or four, haven't they, Gino? That's why we arranged for you to meet Dominichino in the town. Yes, but why Brizigella? A frontier town is always full of spies. Brizigella, just now, is a capital place. It's swarming with pilgrims from all parts of the country. But it's not on the way to anywhere. It's not far out of the way to Rome, and many of the Easter pilgrims are going round to hear mass there. I did, 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 didn't know there was anything special in Brizigella. There's the cardinal. Don't you remember his going to Florence to preach last December? It's that same Cardinal Montanelli. They say he made a great sensation. I dare say. I don't go to hear sermons. Well, he has the reputation of being a saint, you see. How does he manage that? I don't know. I suppose it's because he gives away all his income and lives like a parish priest with four or five scudi a year. Ah, interposed the man called Gino. But it's more than that. He doesn't only give away money. He spends his whole life in looking after the poor, and seeing the sick are properly treated, and hearing complaints and grievances from morning till night. I'm no fonder of priests than you are, Michelle, but Monsignor Montanelli is not like other cardinals. Oh, I dare say he's more fool than knave, said Michelle. Anyhow, the people are mad after him, and the last new freak is for the pilgrims to go round that way to ask his blessing. Dominichino thought of going as a peddler, with a basket of cheap crosses and rosaries. The people like to buy those things and ask the cardinal to touch them. Then they put them round their babies' necks to keep off the evil eye. Wait a minute. How am I to go as a pilgrim? His makeup suits me pr pretty well, I think, but it w won't do for me to show myself in Brizigella in the same character that I had here. It would be ever the dense against you if I get taken. You won't get taken. We have a splendid disguise for you with a passport and all complete. What is it? An old Spanish pilgrim, a repentant brigand from the Sierras. He fell ill in Ancona last year, and one of our friends took him on board a trading vessel out of charity, and set him down in Venice where he had friends, and he left his papers with us to show his gratitude. They will just do for you. A repentant b b brigand But w what about the police? Oh, that's all right. He finished his term with the galleys some years ago, and has been going about to Jerusalem and all sorts of places, saving his soul ever since. He killed his son by mistake for somebody else, and gave himself up to the police in a fit of remorse. Was he quite old? Yes, but a white beard and wig will set that right, and the description suits you to perfection in every other respect. He was an old soldier with a lame foot and a saber cut across the face like yours, and then his being a Spaniard, too. You see, if you meet any Spaniard pilgrims, you can talk to them all right. Where am I to meet Dominichino? You joined the pilgrims at the crossroad that we will show you on the map, saying you had lost your way in the hills. 
Then when you reach the town, you go with the rest of them into the marketplace in front of the cardinal's palace. Oh, he manages to live in a pe palace, then, in spite of being a saint. He lives in one wing of it and has turned the rest into a hospital. Well, you all wait there for him to come out and give him his benediction, and Dominikino will come up with his basket and say, Are you one of the pilgrims, father? And you answer, I am a miserable sinner. Then he puts down his basket and wipes his face with a sleeve, and you offer him six soldi for a rosary. Then, of course, he arranges where we can talk. Yes, he will have plenty of time to give you the address of the meeting place while the people are gaping at Montanelli. That was our plan, but if you don't like it, we can let Dominikino know and arrange something else. No, it will do. Only see that the beard and wig look natural. Are you one of the pilgrims, father? The gadfly, sitting on the steps of the Episcopal Palace, looked up from under his ragged white locks and gave the password in a husky, trembling voice, with a strong foreign accent. Dominichino slipped the leather strap from his shoulder and set down his basket of pious gewgaws on the step. The crowd of peasants and pilgrims sitting on the steps and lounging about the marketplace was taking no notice of them, but for precaution's sake they kept up a desultory conversation, Dominichino speaking in the local dialect, and the gadfly in broken Italian intermixed with Spanish words. His eminence! His eminence is coming out! shouted the people by the door. Stand aside! His eminence is coming! They both stood up. Here, father, said Dominichino, putting into the gadfly's hand a little image wrapped in paper. Take this, too, and pray for me when you get to Rome. The gadfly thrust it into his breast and turned to look at the figure in the violet lantern robe and scarlet cap that was standing on the upper step and blessing the people with outstretched arms. Montanelli came slowly down the steps, the people crowding about him to kiss his hands. Many knelt down and put the hem of his cassock to their lips as he passed. Peace be with you, my children. At the sound of the clear, silvery voice, the gadfly bent his head so that the white hair fell across his face, and Dominichino, seeing the quivering of the pilgrim's staff in his hand, said to himself with admiration, What an actor! A woman standing near to them stooped down and lifted her child from the step. Come, Chico, she said. His eminence will bless you as the dear Lord blessed the children. The gadfly moved a step forward and stopped. Oh, it was hard. All these outsiders, these pilgrims and mountaineers, could go up and speak to him, and he would lay his hand on their children's hair. Perhaps he would say carino to that peasant boy, as he used to say. The gadfly sank down again on the step, turning away that he might not see. If only he could shrink into some corner and stop his ears to shut out the sound. Indeed, it was more than any man should have to bear, to be so close, so close that he could have put out his arm and touched the dear hand. "'Will you not come under shelter, my friend?' the soft voice said. "'I am afraid you are chilled.' The gadfly's heart stood still. For a moment he was conscious of nothing but the sickening pressure of the blood that seemed as if it would tear his breast asunder. Then it rushed back, tingling and burning through all his body, and he looked up. The grave, deep eyes above him grew suddenly tender with divine compassion at the sight of his face. "'Stand back a little, friends,' Montanelli said, turning to the crowd. "'I want to speak to him.' The people fell slowly back, whispering to each other, and the gadfly, sitting motionless, teeth clenched and eyes on the ground, felt the gentle touch of Montanelli's hand upon his shoulder. "'You have had some great trouble. Can I do anything to help you?' The gadfly shook his head in silence. "'Are you a pilgrim?' I am a miserable sinner. The accidental similarity of Montanelli's question to the password came like a chance straw that the gadfly, in his desperation, caught at, answering automatically. He had begun to tremble under the soft pressure of the hand that seemed to burn upon his shoulder. The cardinal bent down closer to him. Perhaps you would care to speak to me alone, if I can be any help to you. For the first time, the gadfly looked straight and steadily into Montanelli's eyes. He was already recovering his self-command. It would be no use, he said. The thing is hopeless. A police official stepped forward out of the crowd. Forget my intruding, your eminence. I think the old man is not quite sound in his mind. He is perfectly harmless, and his papers are in order, so we don't interfere with him. He has been in penal servitude for a great crime, and is now doing penance. A great crime, the gadfly repeated, shaking his head slowly. Thank you, Captain. Stand aside a little, please. My friend, nothing is hopeless if a man has sincerely repented. Will you not come to me this evening? Would your eminence receive a man who is guilty of the death of his own son? The question had almost the tone of a challenge, and Montanelli shrank and shivered under it as under a cold wind. 
God forbid that I should condemn you, whatever you have done, he said solemnly. In his sight, we are all guilty alike, and our righteousness is as filthy rags. If you will come to me, I will receive you, as I pray that he may one day receive me. The gadfly stretched out his hands with a sudden gesture of passion. Listen, he said, and listen, all of you Christians. If a man has killed his only son, his son who loved and trusted him, who was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, if he has led his son into a death trap with lies and deceit, is there hope for that man in earth or heaven? I have confessed my sin before God and man, and I have suffered the punishment that men have laid on me, and they have let me go. But when will God say, It is enough? What benediction will take away his curse from my soul? What absolution will undo this thing that I have done? In the dead silence that followed, the people looked at Montanelli and saw the heaving of the cross upon his breast. He raised his eyes at last and gave the benediction with a hand that was not quite steady. God is merciful, he said. Lay your burden before his throne, for it is written, A broken and contrite heart shalt thou not despise. He turned away and walked through the marketplace, stopping everywhere to speak to the people and to take their children in his arms. In the evening, the gadfly, following the directions written on the wrapping of the image, made his way to the appointed meeting place. It was the house of a local doctor, who was an active member of the sect. Most of the conspirators were already assembled, and their delight at the gadfly's arrival gave him a new proof, if he had needed one, of his popularity as a leader. "'We're glad enough to see you again,' said the doctor." but we shall be gladder still to see you go. It's a fearfully risky business, and I, for one, was against the plan. Are you quite sure none of those police rats noticed you in the marketplace this morning? Oh, they didn't notice me enough, but they did didn't recognize me. Domenichino managed the thing capitally. But where is he? I don't see him. He has not come yet, so you got on all smoothly. Did the cardinal give you his blessing? His blessing? Oh, that's nothing, said Domenichino, coming in at the door. Favares, you are as full of surprises as a Christmas cake. How many more talents are you going to astonish us with? What is it now? asked the gadfly languidly. He was leaning back on a sofa, smoking a cigar. He still wore his pilgrim's dress, but the white beard and wig lay beside him. I had no idea you were such an actor. I never saw a thing done so magnificently in all my life. You nearly moved his eminence to tears. How was that? Let us hear, Favares. The gadfly shrugged his shoulders. He was in a taciturn and laconic mood, and the others, seeing that nothing was to be got out of him, appealed to Domenichino to explain. When the scene in the marketplace had been related, one young workman, who had not joined in the laughter of the rest, remarked abruptly, It was very clever, of course, but I don't see what good all this play-acting business has done to anybody. Just this much, the gadfly put in, that I can go where I like and do what I like anywhere in this district, and not a single man, woman, or child will ever think of suspecting me. The story will be all over the place by tomorrow, and when I meet a spy, he will think, It's mad Diego that confessed his sins in the marketplace. That is an advantage gained, surely. Yes, I see. Still, I wish the thing could have been done without fooling the cardinal. He's too good to have that sort of trick played on him. I thought myself he seemed fairly decent, the gadfly lazily assented. Nonsense, Sandro. We don't want cardinals here, said the Domenichino and if Monsignor Montanelli had taken that post in Rome when he had the chance of getting it, Rivares couldn't have fooled him. He wouldn't take it because he didn't want to leave his work here. More likely because he didn't want to get poisoned off by Lambruschini's agents. They've got something against him, you may depend upon it. When a cardinal, especially such a popular one, prefers to stay in a godforsaken little hole like this, we all know what that means, don't we, Rivares? The gadfly was making smoke rings, Perhaps it is a c c case of a b b broken and contrite heart, he remarked, leaning his foot back to watch them float away. And now, ma'am, let us get to business. They began to discuss in detail the various plans which had been formed for the smuggling and concealment of weapons. The gadfly listened with keen attention, interrupting every now and then to correct sharply some inaccurate statement or imprudent proposal. When everyone had finished speaking, he made a few practical suggestions, most of which were adopted without discussion. The meeting then broke up. It had been resolved that at least until he was safely back in Tuscany, very late meetings, which might attract the notice of the police, should be avoided. By a little after ten o'clock, all had dispersed except the doctor, the gadfly, and Domenichino, who remained as a subcommittee for the discussion of special points. After a long and hot dispute, Domenichino looked up at the clock. 
Half past eleven. We mustn't stop any longer, or the night watchman may see us. When does he pass? asked the gadfly. About twelve o'clock, and I want to be home before he comes. Good night, Giordani. Bravare, shall we walk together? No. I think we are safer apart. Then I shall see you again. Yes, at Castel Bolognese. I don't know yet what disguise I shall be in, but you have the password. You leave here tomorrow, I think? The gadfly was carefully putting on his beard and wig before the looking glass. Tomorrow morning, with the pilgrims. On the next day, I fall ill and stop behind in a shepherd's hut, and then take a shortcut across the hills. I shall be down there before you will. Good night. Twelve o'clock was striking from the cathedral bell tower as the gadfly looked in at the door of the great empty barn, which had been thrown open as a lodging for the pilgrims. The floor was covered with clumsy figures, most of which were snoring lustily, and the air was insufferably close and foul. He drew back with a little shudder of repugnance. It would be useless to attempt to sleep in there. He would take a walk, and then find some shed or haystack which would at least be clean and quiet. It was a glorious night, with a great full moon gleaming in a purple sky. He began to wander through the streets in an aimless way, brooding miserably over the scene of the morning, and wishing that he had been consented to Dominichino's plan. It was a glorious night, with a great full moon gleaming in a purple sky. He began to wander through the streets in an aimless way, brooding miserably over the scene of the morning, and wishing that he had never consented to Dominichino's plan of holding a meeting at Brizigela. If at the beginning he had declared the project too dangerous, some other place would have been chosen, and both he and Montanelli would have been spared this ghastly, ridiculous farce. How changed the Padre was! And yet his voice was not changed at all. It was just the same as in the old days, when he used to say, Garino. The lantern of the night watchman appeared at the other end of the street, and the gadfly turned down a narrow, crooked alley. After walking a few yards, he found himself in the cathedral square, close to the left wing of the Episcopal Palace. The square was flooded with moonlight, and there was no one in sight, but he noticed that a side door of the cathedral was ajar. The sacristan must have forgotten to shut it. Surely nothing could be going on there so late at night. He might as well go in and sleep on one of the benches instead of in the stifling barn. He could slip out in the morning before the sacristan came, and even if anyone did find him, the natural supposition would be that Mad Diego had been saying his prayers in some corner and had got shut in. He listened a moment at the door, and then entered with the noiseless step that he had retained notwithstanding his lameness. The moonlight streamed through the windows, and lay in broad bands on the marble floor. In the chancel, especially, everything was as clearly visible as by daylight. At the foot of the altar steps, Cardinal Montanelli knelt alone, bareheaded, with clasped hands. The gadfly drew back into the shadow. Should he slip away before Montanelli saw him? That, no doubt, would be the wisest thing to do, perhaps the most merciful. And yet, what harm could it do for him to go just a little nearer? to look at the Padre's face once more, now that the crowd was gone, and there was no need to keep up the hideous comedy of the morning. Perhaps it would be his last chance, and the Padre need not see him. He would steal up softly and look just this once. Then he would go back to his work. Keeping in the shadow of the pillars, he crept softly up to the chancel rails, and paused at the side entrance close to the altar. The shadow of the Episcopal throne was broad enough to cover him, and he crouched down in the darkness, holding his breath. My poor boy. Oh, God, my poor boy. The broken whisper was full of such endless despair that the gadfly shuddered in spite of himself. Then came deep, heavy, tearless sobs, and he saw Montanelli wring his hands together like a man in bodily pain. He had not thought it would be so bad as this. How often had he said to himself with bitter assurance, I need not trouble about it, that wound was healed long ago. Now, after all these years, it was laid bare before him, and he saw it bleeding still. And how easy it would be to heal it now at last! He need only lift his hand, only step forward and say, Padre, it is I. There was Gemma, too, with that white streak across her hair. Oh, if he could but forgive! If he could but cut out from his memory the past that was burned in it so deep, the Lasker, and the sugar plantation, and the variety show. Surely there was no other misery like this to be willing to forgive, to long to forgive, and to know that it was hopeless, that he could not, dared not forgive. Montanelli rose at last, made the sign of the cross, and turned away from the altar. The gadfly shrank further back into the shadow, trembling with fear lest he should be seen, lest the very beating of his heart should betray him. Then he drew a long breath of relief. 
Montanelli had passed him, so close that the violet robe had brushed against his cheek, had passed and had not seen him. Had not seen him. Oh, what had he done? This had been his last chance, this one precious moment, and he had let it slip away. He started up and stepped into the light. Padre! The sound of his own voice, ringing up and dying away along the arches of the roof, filled him with fantastic terror. He shrank back again as the shadow. Montanelli stood beside the pillar, motionless, listening with wide open eyes, full of the horror of death. How long the silence lasted the gadfly could not tell, might have been an instant or an eternity. He came to his senses with a sudden shock. Montanelli was beginning to sway as though he would fall and his lips moved, at first silently. Arthur! The low whisper came at last. Yes, the water is deep. The gadfly came forward. Forgive me, Your Eminence. I thought it was one of the priests. Ah, it is the pilgrim. Montanelli had at once recovered his self-control, though the gadfly could see from the restless glitter of the sapphire in his hand that he was still trembling. Are you in need of anything, my friend? It is late, and the cathedral is closed at night. I beg pardon, Your Eminence, if I have done wrong. I saw the door open and came in to pray, and when I saw a priest, as I thought, in meditation, I waited to ask a blessing on this. He held up the little tin cross that he had bought from Domenichino. Montanelli took it from his hand, and, re-entering the chancel, laid it for a moment on the altar. "'Take it, my son,' he said, "'and be at rest, for the Lord is tender and pitiful. Go to Rome, and ask the blessing of his minister, the Holy Father. Peace be with you.' The Gadfly bent his head to receive the benediction, and turned slowly away. "'Stop,' said Montanelli. He was standing with one hand on the chancel rail. "'When you receive the Holy Eucharist in Rome,' he said, "'pray for one in deep affliction, for one on whose soul the hand of the Lord is heavy.' There were almost tears in his voice, and the gadfly's resolution wavered. Another instant and he would have betrayed himself. Then the thought of the variety show came up again, and he remembered, like Jonah, that he did well to be angry. "'Who am I that he should hear my prayers?' a leper and an outcast, if I could bring to his throne, as your eminence can, the offering of a holy life, of a soul without spot or secret shame. Montanelli turned abruptly away. I have only one offering to give, he said, a broken heart. A few days later, the gadfly returned to Florence, in the diligence from the Pistoia. He went straight to Gemma's lodgings, but she was out. Leaving a message that he would return in the morning, he went home sincerely hoping that he should not again find his study invaded by Zita. Her jealous reproaches would act on his nerves, if he were to hear much of them tonight, like the rasping of a dentist's file. "'Good evening, Bianca,' he said when the maidservant opened the door. "'Has Madame Rainy been here today?' She stared at him blankly. "'Madame Rainy? Has she come back then, sir?' "'What do you mean?' he asked with a frown, stopping short on the mat. "'She went away quite suddenly, just after you did,' and left all her things behind her. She never so much as said she was going. Just after I did? What, a f fortnight ago? Yes, sir, the same day, and her things are lying about higgledy-piggledy. All the neighbors are talking about it. He turned away from the doorstep without speaking, and went hastily down the lane to the house where Zita had been lodging. In her rooms nothing had been touched. All the presents that he had given her were in their usual places. There was no letter or scrap of writing anywhere. "'If you please, sir,' said Bianca, putting her head in at the door. "'There's an old woman.' He turned round fiercely. "'What do you want here, following me about?' "'An old woman wishes to see you.' "'What does she want? Tell her I can't see her. I'm busy.' "'She has been coming nearly every evening since you went away, sir, always asking when you would come back.' "'Ask her what her business is. No, never mind. I suppose I must go myself.' The old woman was waiting at his hall door. She was very poorly dressed, with a face as brown and wrinkled as a meddler, and a bright-colored scarf twisted round her head. As he came in, she rose and looked at him with keen black eyes. "'You are the lame gentleman,' she said, inspecting him critically from head to foot. "'I have brought you a message from Zita Reni. He opened the study door and held it for her to pass in, then followed her and shut the door, that Bianca might not hear. "'Sit down, please. N now tell me who you are.' It's no business of yours who I am. I have come to tell you that Zita Reni has gone away with my son. With your son? Yes, sir. If you don't know how to keep your mistress, when you've got her, 
You can't complain if other men take her. My son has blood in his veins, not milk and water. He comes of the Romany folk. Ah, you are a gypsy. Zita has gone back to her own people, then. She looked at him in amazed contempt. Apparently these Christians had not even manhood enough to be angry when they were insulted. What sort of stuff are you made of that she should stay with you? Our women may lend themselves to you a bit for a girl's fancy, or if you pay them well, but the Romany blood comes back to the Romany folk. The gadfly's face remained as cold and steady as before. Has she gone away with a gypsy camp, or merely to live with your son? The woman burst out laughing. Do you think of following her and trying to win her back? It's too late, sir. You should have thought of that before. No, I only want to know the truth, if you will tell it to me. She shrugged her shoulders. It was hardly worth while to abuse a person who took it so meekly. The truth, then, is that she met my son in the road the day you left her, and spoke to him in the Romany tongue, and when he saw she was one of our folk in spite of her fine clothes, he fell in love with her bonny face as our men fall in love, and took her to our camp. She told us all her trouble, and sat crying and sobbing, poor lassie, till our hearts were sore for her. We comforted her as best we could, and at last she took off her fine clothes and put on the things our lasses wear, and gave herself to my son to be his woman and to have him for her man. He won't say to her, I don't love you, and I've other things to do. When a woman is young, she wants a man. And what sort of man are you, that you can't even kiss a handsome girl when she puts her arms round your neck? You said, he interrupted, that you had brought me a message from her. Yes, I stopped behind the camp one time so as to give it. She told me to say that she had enough of your folk, and their hair-splitting and their sluggish blood, and that she wants to get back to her own people and be free. Tell him, she said, that I am a woman, and that I loved him, and that is why I would not be his harlot any longer. The lassie was right to come away. There's no harm in a girl getting a bit of money out of her good looks if she can. That's what good looks are for. But a Romany lass has nothing to do with loving a man of your race. The gadfly stood up. Is that all the message? he said. Then tell her, please, that I think she has done right, and that I hope she will be happy. That is all I have to say. Good night. He stood perfectly still until the garden gate closed behind her. Then he sat down and covered his face with both hands. Another blow on the cheek. It was no rag of pride to be left him, no shred of self-respect. Surely he had suffered everything a man can endure. His very heart had been dragged in the mud and trampled under the feet of the passers-by. There was no spot in his soul where someone's contempt was not branded in, where someone's mockery had not left its iron trace. And now this gypsy girl, whom he had picked up by the wayside, even she had the whip in her hand. Shaitan whined at the door, and the gadfly rose to let him in. The dog rushed up to his master with his usual frantic manifestations of delight, but soon, understanding that something was wrong, lay down on the rug beside him and thrust a cold nose into the listless hand. An hour later, Gemma came up to the front door. No one appeared in answer to her knock. Bianca, finding that the gadfly did not want any dinner, had slipped out to visit a neighbor's cook. She had left the door open and a light burning in the hall. Gemma, after waiting for some time, decided to enter and try if she could find the gadfly, as she wished to speak to him about an important message which had come from Bailey. She knocked at the study door, and the gadfly's voice answered from within. "'You can go away, Bianca. I don't want anything.' She softly opened the door. The room was quite dark, but the passage lamp threw a long stream of light across it as she entered, and she saw the gadfly sitting alone, his head sunk on his breast, and the dog asleep at his feet. "'It is I,' she said. He started up. Gemma! Gemma! Oh, I have wanted you so! Before she could speak, he was kneeling on the floor at her feet and hiding his face in the folds of her dress. His whole body was shaken with a convulsive tremor that was worse to see than tears. She stood still. There was nothing she could do to help him. Nothing. This was the bitterest thing of all. She must stand by and look on passively. She who would have died to spare him pain. Could she but dare to stoop and clasp her arms about him, to hold him close against her heart and shield him, were it with her own body, from all further harm or wrong, surely then he would be Arthur to her again, surely then the day would break and the shadows flee away. Ah, no, no, how could he ever forget? Was it not she who had cast him into hell, she with her own right hand? She had let the moment slip by. He rose hastily and sat down by the table, covering his eyes with one hand and biting his lip as if he would bite it through. Presently he looked up and said quietly, I am afraid I startled you. 
She held out both her hands to him. Dear, she said, are we not friends enough by now for you to trust me a little bit? What is it? Only a private trouble of my own. I don't see why you should be worried over it. Listen a moment, she went on, taking his hand in both of hers to steady its convulsive trembling. I have not tried to lay hands on a thing that is not mine to touch. But now that you have given me, of your own free will, so much of your confidence, will you not give me a little more, as you would do if I were your sister? Keep the mask on your face, if it is any consolation to you, but don't wear a mask on your soul for your own sake. He bent his head lower. You must be patient with me, he said. I am an unsatisfactory sort of brother to have, I'm afraid. But if you only knew... I have been nearly mad this last week. It has been like South America again, and somehow the devil gets into me and... He broke off. May I not have my share in your trouble, she whispered at last. His head sank down on her arm. The hand of the Lord is heavy. End of chapter 11 of the second part. Recording by Daria Labutina.